the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Health Sciences, we like to focus on potential. The potential of our students to make a positive difference to the world around them. The potential to produce research that shifts boundaries. The potential to heal, to relieve, to recover and restore. Discover your potential and join the movement. Follow the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Health Sciences on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn to be a life changer. Good morning and welcome to the Faculty of Health Sciences Research Day. My name is Emmanuel Matzebatela and I'm not alone in this ship. I am with my co-host here. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to all. My name is Mausoline Duplessis. I'm from the University of Pretoria, specifically in the Nursing Science Department, and I wish to welcome you all to this prestigious event. Over to you, Emmanuel. Now, the theme for this year's Research Day is reimagining research in health sciences. I'm honestly looking forward to the day. Uh, we have a lineup of a research showcases from each of the schools and panel discussions. Now, without much ado, let's knock the ball forward with the opening address from the Dean of the Faculty, Professor Tian Dijakar. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to Faculty Day 2021. Reimagining research in health sciences. It's the right time for us during this virtual event to rethink um, how we're going to approach research going forward in our faculty. Now, to know where we would like to go and to reimagine, we also need to understand where we currently are. So, allow me to give you some information. And let's see how we can move the faculty forward from this point. As you know, the Faculty of Health Sciences has a long and proud tradition of excellence in education of healthcare professionals. Driven by cutting edge research in the creation of teaching and learning in line with the fourth industrial revolution in order to graduate a new generation of healthcare professionals. Students who join the faculty receive a rich and varied hands-on clinical experience in a range of hospital, clinic and community settings, thus becoming a productive part of society and communities with long-term positive impact. The faculty is host to 14 research entities both internal and externally funded. If we look at the rankings, which is important to us, we rank within the top 1% internationally in clinical medicine, immunology and microbiology. And this is in the QS rankings. We need to up our game in the times higher education using slightly different criteria and where impact of research accounts for a high percentage and therefore we need to move from numbers to quality. The QS 2020 rankings, we rank within the range 301 to 350 and we are the only South African university that rank in the top 100 and the highest in South Africa for SDG 3 in the Times Higher Education rankings. Now, the Sustainable Development Goals we know are important, and I think some of our entities that significantly contributed to this category with an impact on health and well-being is maternal and infant health care strategies, the One Health, Sustainable Malaria, and we need to make sure that we see and measure our impact on society. In terms of our programs, we've got a large number of programs and look at the number of 
uh, postgraduate offerings in the faculty. Now, we need to grow our postgraduate numbers with about 3.3% uh, per year. So we need to build capacity in terms of supervisor capacity, in terms of opportunities to accommodate more students within uh, our postgraduate offerings. Um, in terms of enrollment figures, you can see a large number of masters, and we're not currently meeting our target, but we're doing well in terms of our PhDs, and we need to grow uh, our PhD numbers as well going forward. In terms of staff profile, we currently in the faculty have about 57% of our staff with PhDs. This is below the faculty um, average, uh, the university average, and we need to grow that. The number of uh, NIF-rated researchers, we mainly in the C category. We need to assist and grow our C-rated scientists to become B and A-rated scientists. And then we've got a strong alumni base from which we should um, learn, collaborate, and uh, tap onto to grow our opportunities for research. In terms of third stream income, we did very well in 2020. And we exceeded our target quite significantly. Um, the number of um, research grant income, as you can see, 270 million is important, but we need to make sure that we sustain that and grow that going forward. Because if we plan to grow our student numbers, we need to make sure that we do have research grants to fund our projects uh, going forward, to be able to accommodate more researchers and to increase the impact of our research and also the impact on society. Talking about society, the community outreach programs, extremely important, and therefore the COPC in the Department of Family Medicine doing exceptional work. They work um, in the communities on primary healthcare level is exceptional. And the number of um, additional staff members they employ through third stream income is really commendable. Then the maternal and infant health care strategies doing excellent work um, throughout Africa and saving lives through their research. Informal settlement, health research, multiple and multidisciplinary health teams offering service with on-site support of community health workers covering four informal settlements in and around Pretoria. And we're talking about healthy cities. We at the University of Pretoria, and specifically the Faculty of Health Sciences, has got the opportunity to get involved in the Twani and um, change our city and make it one of the healthy cities in the world. Um, in addition to this, the funding uh, obtained by the community outreach practice and community impact is significant. The Anglo project to the value of about 55 million and others. So these are opportunities creating platforms for other researchers to get involved in a transdisciplinary way to make an impact on society, creating a classroom within the community from where we can operate. One Health has always been high on the agenda. And I'm proud to say that in the faculty, our Center for um, Zoonotic Diseases and Arboviruses are doing exceptionally well. Digital transformation um, of healthcare training 
telemedicine. We also received um, the first robot, ICU COVID robot, Stevie, which is at uh, Steve Biko Academic Hospital, doing, um, uh, contributing to the fight against this pandemic, but also creating opportunities in terms of research and um, where we can use big data towards uh, getting uh, closer to some answers and making progress in terms of impact uh, of specific diseases. Building management and leadership capacity. This is a big focus area going forward. Uh, we need to create opportunities for our young researchers. When we reimagine, it is about not leaving anybody behind. And we need to build capacity. And I think FARC, um, the Forensic Anthropology Research Center, is doing exceptionally well with the um, big international grants in building capacity. But now we need to also build leadership capacity. And I think these opportunities, we at the University of Pretoria Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control are working with GIPS and also the Albert Latuli Leadership Institute to build capacity for um, leadership and management for malaria in Africa. And I think it is important going forward that we make sure that we create opportunities and build um, not only capacity, but management and leadership skills. Colleagues, <clears throat> in terms of research evidence, we need to move away from our silo approach into a transdisciplinary approach. Research productivity is important. How we position ourselves globally. And I've borrowed this slide from our executive where we're currently working on the five-year strategy, strategic plan for the institution. And there will be opportunity to give inputs into this going forward where we reimagine and redefine our strategy and our focus for research um, at the University of Pretoria and in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, expanded access and enhanced student support, which is very important, and it leads to sustainable outcomes and impact for the public good. Demonstrated quality and excellence it is about the impact. It is about citations. That is what is going to take our faculty and the university to the next level. Capacity building, as I've mentioned earlier, very important. We need to make sure that we grow our timber, build our young people to become active in the research arena. Enable policy frameworks, uh, societal development, where nobody is left behind. I think it's one of the strengths of our faculty, is our impact on society. And we need to make sure that we use this and make an impact going forward, not only locally, but in the wider arena within Africa. Um, if we look then at the strategic focus areas, um, partnering and international outlook, very important. I think we've been very inward looking. We've been building research platforms, which is very good. But I think from here on, we now need to move to the next level and make sure that we link up with some of the best in the world, create these partnerships and collaborations. Then the transdisciplinary approach, um, it is important. That is where we become more competitive, where we obtain bigger grants, where we publish in journals of higher impact to have a specific impact 
on society. We need to use technology and infrastructure to our advantage. We talk about the fourth industrial re revolution. We talk about artificial intelligence. And we've been leading in some areas in regard to telemedicine. And we need to make sure that we use that to our advantage going forward. Now, going forward in terms of the next five-year plan for the University of Pretoria, there's specific focus areas that's been proposed, and there will be opportunity to give impact, uh, input into these. So where we in the past um, had the environment, animal and human life more speaking to the one health concept, we now see that it's plant, animal and human life and well-being, then natural resources and environment. Because the environment is becoming such a critical part, uh, climate, climate change, global warming, the things that we see on a daily basis that might impact directly or indirectly on health. There's also other areas, science, uh, technology and infrastructure, and then also um, fair and sustainable e economies. So there will be able opportunity for, for input into these. But I think what is important is that you, in terms of your research approach, make sure that you link up with one of the recognized themes within the faculty and the university, that you create partnerships and collaborations going forward, and that we, in a transdisciplinary approach, address some of the wicked challenges in society and make an impact in the communities where we work. And therefore, I think it time is right to work harder and closer in terms of the transdisciplinary approach. So, first of all, intradisciplinary is the collaborations within our faculty. Those are extremely important. We often don't know what our neighbor is doing. It's worth asking the question. We need to get back into those laboratories, have those discussions in terms of the research questions, the problems out there, and see how we can collaborate. Then the inter- and multidisciplinary approach across faculties. We've got strengths in other faculties like our engineering faculty, veterinary sciences, even the humanities. And we need to tap onto those expertise to help us to address some of these research challenges that we're dealing with. And then the ultimate, the transdisciplinary approach beyond academia with multiple academic and non-academic voices around the table, crossing multiple boundaries that deals with increasing complexity and seeks a holistic approach. Colleagues, that is where the impact is uh, eventually. Now, we are still challenged in terms of the sustainable development goals. For us as health sciences, obviously uh, SDG 3, good health and well-being is important. But we know that we cannot address it in isolation. We need to consider, for instance, climate. We need to look at poverty to make an impact. Quality education, clean water, food, nutrition. We cannot address health issues in isolation. And therefore, it is important to create these partnerships for the goals that we address. It speaks to transdisciplinary approach towards our research problem. And we need to make sure that we focus in terms of the SDGs, in terms of our impact on society. And just to use an example, something that's familiar to me and the reason I'm using it, because as you know, I'm also the director of the University of Pretoria Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control. 
And way back in 2012, we published this paper on the transdisciplinary approach, including a biochemist. This year, uh, Lynn Marie Burkholz published a paper in Nature on drug discovery, uh, transmission blocking of the parasite uh, for malaria control, groundbreaking work. The chemical engineers are involved in innovation, new materials, polyethylene uh, and nanoparticles, making an impact on society and also creating opportunities for um, commercial use. The entomologists discovered new species, making an impact in terms of future strategies for malaria control. Therefore, the message is, going forward, we've seen, after 10 years of existence of the University of Pretoria Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control, that a holistic approach is the only approach that's going to work to get us from malaria control to malaria elimination. Ladies and gentlemen, realizing UP's research intensive ambitions. These 10 points, and these were highlighted by our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Joanna Coupe. First, publish high quality research with international partners. It is important for us to reach out. And I think during this time of the pandemic and the lockdown, it's actually easier to create partnerships, to go online and to network. And we've seen that it is becoming the norm. So let's establish those links with highly successful international researchers in our field. Let's create partnerships uh, that can take us in terms of the quality of our research to the next level. Push the transdisciplinary research for greater and wider impact. I've experienced it, it in malaria. We've seen it in many other areas. That is what's taking research to the next level. That is what is making an impact on society when we address some of the problems, not only in terms of health, but maybe food security, clean water, uh, address some of the issues related to poverty, things that we need to do in any case, and that will assist us in addressing some of the health challenges in those communities and societies. Increase the number of postgraduate students. Now, as I've said, we need to grow that. But first of all, we need to be successful in obtaining research funding to support those students going forward. Creating opportunities, building a research group, a research network with other faculties, other institutions, and creating a platform from where we can operate and increase our impact. Create a critical mass of well-funded and sustainable research entities. We have seen the successes from the Saatchi chairs in the faculty and within the university. We need to link up with industry and create more of these dedicated research entities to to increase our impact uh, in terms of the work that we're doing. Improve grant success rates. I think that is the first step. We need to spend time in identifying our focus for these grants in terms of our um, partners going forward, addressing uh, the needs of uh, the funder, and then, um, obviously, get some good quality students involved, grow our young researchers, and reimagine, um, going forward, the impact on society. Create the 
increase the number of A and B rated uh, researchers, also the P rated researchers. It is important. We've got a high number of C rated researchers and we need to uh, have a plan to move these into the B rankings, into the A rankings, into becoming world leaders in their field. We've got the opportunities, we need to use them and we need to have a plan. Increase the number of externally funded postdocs. We know that postdocs can make the world's difference. They become your hands, they very productive in terms of outputs, and we need to, to, to increase our postdoc numbers through external funding sources. Strong human capital development pipeline, our honours to doctoral pipeline, but also our early to mid-career academics. We should not leave our young early career researchers behind. We need to grow them. We need to create opportunities for them. Mentorship in terms of learning how to, how to apply for grants, how to supervise students successfully. And we need to make sure that we create an environment that is inducive for building on our strengths. Then strategic international partnerships across the globe, it's in many people, many institutions, highly ranked institutions that would love to work with the University of Pretoria. And we need to grow those partnerships. I'm sure we've got much to offer. Um, they would love to get involved and get involved in our research problems, our research material, our patients, our participants in our studies. They've got maybe the funding, the technologies, and by partnering, we can really make an impact going forward. We need to build on our laboratory uh, spaces. And I'm happy to say that we got support from UP Executive to build spaces for PACRI, the Pan-African Cancer Research Institute, and also for One Health, which will include zoonosis and malaria. We need to make sure that our equipment, our facilities is well maintained and that it address the needs going forward. So, ladies and gentlemen, we need to reimagine research in health sciences. I think COVID created the opportunity for us to think how we can do things different. This is the first virtual faculty day, and I would like to congratulate Professor Tavani Mashamba Thompson and her team for putting this program together, for giving us the platform and the opportunity to think how we can transform research in the faculty, how we can reimagine research going forward in health sciences. I think some things are clear. We need to strengthen our transdisciplinary approach. We need to build research leadership and management capacity. We need to look and increase our strengths and impact on society and the community. Colleagues, thank you for this opportunity. I trust that you will enjoy today's um, program. Please take part. Please become part of the group of the faculty that is reimagining and transforming research going forward. Follow us on social media. You've got our links. Become a life changer and enjoy the day. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Prof. Dijaha. I think you'll agree with me that that has been an enriching 
uh, message uh, from our dean of faculty. Um, I think from what he said, it's imperative that because we have such a high QS ranking, we have to partner with the best universities in the world. And with that, we have to also optimize uh, the resources that we have by partnering with our own um, faculties, partnering within our own faculties, partnering with uh, other uh, faculties and departments and uh, outside academia as well so that we can have greater impact and really solve the society's problems. Because that's the point of research, to have impact and solve the problems that the society faces. Thank you very much, Professor Dijaka, for that message. I think now we will move over to our next, who is our main speaker for the day, our guest speaker, Professor Mutopeni Jackson Maragalala. Now, Professor Mutopeni Jackson Maragalala was born in a village of Musesejani in Limpopo province. He completed his undergraduate dis, dis, uh, studies at the University of the North, which is now called Limpopo, followed by a PhD at the University of Cape Town. He did a total of eight years postdoctoral training, that is four years at UCT and four years at Harvard T. A. Chan School of Public Health. He is currently faculty member at Africa Health Research Institute, or AHRI, and an associate professor at University College London. His laboratory's primary interest is on infectious diseases, particularly immunopathogenesis of tuberculosis, with an aim of developing host directed therapies targeting lung inflammation. His other interests are in understanding strategies utilized by microbacteria to survive various arms of the immune system. Work in his lab is funded by the grants from the South African Medical Research Council, Wellcome Trust, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In addition to his current positions, at UCL and AHRI, Professor Marakalala is also a visiting scientist in the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases at Harvard T. A. Chan School of Public Health. And he maintains an affiliation with UCT as an honorary research associate. He has served as an advisory board member at various organizations, including the Global Philanthropy Alliance, Wellcome Trust Open Research, Europe PubMed Central, and Harvard School of Public Health Dean's Advisory Committee on Diversity and Inclusion. His personal achievements include recognition as a rising star at the 2019 Grand Challenges Meeting NRF Emerging Researcher Excellence Award for 2018, South African Medical Research Council Scientific Merit Award, Silver Medal for 2016, UCT 2016 College of Fellows Young Researcher Award. He was named a fellow of the next Einstein Forum for 2016, which is awarded to young scientists throughout Africa who are using science as a platform to solve global challenges. He was honored as a World Economic Forum Young Scientist at the WEF New Champions Meeting in Dalian, China in 2015. He was the recipient of the Sidney Brenner Fellowship 2010 to 2012 that is awarded by the Academy of Sciences of South Africa to an outstanding young scientist working in South Africa. He was awarded the Bronze Stewart Research Prize for the most meritorious PhD thesis in the Faculty of Health Sciences, University of Cape Town 
in 2008. Lastly, perhaps I should add that in 2015, Professor Maragalala was especially invited to the 2015 Commonwealth Day reception in London, where he met Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and the Duke of Edinburgh. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Professor Mutopeni Jackson Maragalala. Um, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I'll, I'll load my talk as I'll be doing um, introduction to the actual talk. But it's, it's really a great, um, so my, my, my talk is still loading. Uh, hopefully it's, uh, is it? Can you be able to see it from that side? No, it's just your screen. Okay. Is it working? Nothing yet, Jackson. It's on, sorry. It hasn't come up yet, Jackson. Just your okay. desktop. Okay, on my side, it's, it seems to be um, on. So let's see. Try to st say stop sharing maybe and then share again. Sometimes that does the trick. Okay, let's try. There, is it going now? Yep, it's, yeah, you can go into slideshow now. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be part of this very special day. This amazing university, I was listening to the Dean detailing all the achievements and plans for the university and the great kind introduction by my senior, um, Dr. Matseva Tlela, who I, um, I, I met actually as a very inspiring leader at the University of the North as Mr. Turf in 2007 when I started. And it's great to see that we, we meet again with great prospects of collaborations here. So today, keep into the theme of reimagining research in health sciences. That is the theme of today, faculty day. I want to talk about multiple compartments in TB pathogenesis, particularly focusing on inflammation that accompanies TB infection in the lung and as well as actually trying to see what one can do with clinical samples ranging from blood to lung tissues to try and develop diagnostic and therapeutic tools that we really need in, in order for us to eradicate TB. So, TB doesn't need introduction to many people in this audience, but we know that despite many years, many centuries of research and also availability of treatment, but we're still sitting with a challenge wherein um, about 1.5 million people still die every year. So, so my research basically is more interested in trying to intercept TB transmission ac across TB spectrum. So what we do in general is actually to try and discover disease determinants, more like identifying at molecular level factors that drive TB progression in the lung as well as in blood. And we evaluate also promoters of this pathological damage as, as therapy targets for us to be able to develop new therapies or the so-called host-directed therapies. And at this level, it's more fundamental discovery biology once we have a knowledge that we get at basic science level, we can use this knowledge to advance new tools such as discovery of biomarkers, as well as the therapies that can then enter early phase trials in patients. So this is the theme, but as I mentioned, so the focus today will be more on basic science of TB, but using clinical material, sticking to the theme that it is at the faculty day today. So I'll be talking more about granulomas, which are basically just a brief introduction to granulomas. When one person who has TB disease coughs, they actually, and the other person inhales the, 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 the pathogens. So the pathogen called Mycobacterium tuberculosis are inhaled to the lungs through the airways where they are captured by immune cells called macrophages. And upon that inhalation, there's recruitment of more cells such as like macrophages, dendritic cells, T cells, and B cells 
forming a structure called granuloma. So a granuloma is basically an aggregate of immune cells that cluster together trying to contain bacteria at the center within lungs. So a granuloma cartoon-like would look like this. So a granuloma, which is actually solid like this, is believed to be important for containing bacteria. That there are many people, as you know, that would be infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis who are so-called latently infected. But only five, only only five percent of people who are latently infected will develop into active TB in their lifetime. Meaning that about ninety to ninety-five percent, actually, people who are exposed to TB will actually be protected by the immune system. So it's believed that granulomas could be contributing towards containing bacteria in such people. However, this admirable structure can actually collapse to form calcium, for instance, at the centers, which is likely necrotic damage of these cells like macrophages. And then the bacteria that are contained at the center, when this structure further destruct to form cavities, the bacteria are then leaked out of these granulomas and they are then transmitted to the next person. So our theme of research is to see what's really wrong, what goes wrong from this admirable structure to where now we are transmitting the disease. And we're trying to develop factors that drive this progression at tissue level in the lung. And then try to see whether we can target them and limit that too much inflammation that leads to the damage. And in order to do that, basically research, um, research theme in my lab, basically what we did previously, we isolated lungs, lungs that were, con were, that were um, obtained by surgery from patients who had undergone surgery because of severe lung damage. That surgery is called pneumonectomy, lobectomy, and so on. So we then take solid granulomas, like I told you, those granulomas that are good enough to contain bacteria at the center, and those that are already forming a calcium at the center here with necrotizing material, and those that have already are having cavities. So we're looking at this as a spectrum or a stage of disease pathological damage or disease progression. And we want to identify basically all proteins that are associated with stage or each stage of this pathological damage. So what we did in this work, which we, uh, we, we led previously when I started at Harvard School of Public Health. So we, we used, uh, so we took laser capture microdissection from this different kind of granulomas. And then what we did was to then do proteomics by mass spec to identify all proteins associated with calcium cavities as well as cellular material. And we get a heat map like this that gives us about 3000 proteins that are differentially um, upregulated between different groups of granulomas. So I cannot take you through all of these proteins because of time. But as an example, we actually found one of the exciting molecules or proteins that we're finding to be associated with cavitary and caseous granulomas. As you can see here, it's a heat map that shows a scale where the red is the highest, blue is the lowest. So they see these molecules in a pathway called arachidonic acid, which is known here to be highly inflammatory pathway. So we find that this pathway, arachidonic acid is utilized by lipoxygenases. For instance, there's this protein called lipoxygenase Alox A5, which lead to production of something called leukotriene A4, which is then hydrolyzed by a protein called leukotriene A4 hydrolase to eventually produce a molecule downstream called leukotriene B4, which is known to be inflammatory. So what we found when we looked into our protein uh, prediction pr proteomics from those lungs, we found that these molecules that are utilized this pathway like Alox5 and LTA4H, as you can see here, they were very high in caseous regions compared to where you have healthy lungs. So this tells us this pathway seems to be associated, this inflammatory pathway seems to be associated with caseum. Or in other words, lung damage seems to be enriched largely with inflammatory responses, suggesting that there's too much of inflammation that may needs to be balanced or be controlled. And in order to really validate this prediction that we saw by, 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 um, by proteomics, so what we do now, we go back to the lung samples, like the lungs that have been obtained by surgery from people who had severe lung damage. So we look at multiple granuloma forms. As you can see, this is the lung. We have like a caseous granuloma, which it has already collapsed. And then you have a nascent caseum here. And then here you still have like intact regions and so on. So what we do use antibodies for the protein ALOX5 that I showed you previously in the pathway that utilizes arachidon acid. And we found that when you use an immunoantibody of that calcium, of that ALOX5, 
you see here, for instance, when you stay and you see that it's lighting up in green in the areas that are bordering the casium. And then also when you have a cavitary granuloma, you see when you have a cavitary granuloma and you still have a healthy part here and necrotizing material here that is damaged. You see that is largely lining that region where there's a damage. And you can also see here in nascent granulomas when you zoom that is actually lining up the regions that are bordering the casium. So with this mind, then we, we, we find that these proteins that are predicted to be associated with TB pathology, they seem to be uniquely associated with inflammatory rings that are bordering the casium, which is a mark of, uh, of, of, of pathological damage. So we went on to try and see whether we can actually characterize in detail this spatial segregation of this immune inflammatory mediators in the lung. So again, using the antibody for for ALOX5 that I just showed you now. We actually went to the lung now using what we call immunofluorescence technique, which allows us to image multiple compartments within the lung. So here you have a casium at the center, and then here you have inflammatory layer that is immediately bordering the casium, and this is the cellular layer outside. So in blue, you have healthy cells like DAPI. In green, sorry, in red, then you have the marker of ALOX5. So we see that ALOX5 is highly, again, expressed uniquely so in rings that are bordering the casium, whereas actually in the cellular regions, which are highly healthy, you actually see nothing of it expressed. So this confirming that it's uniquely, these proteins that are inflammatory are uniquely expressed in regions that are highly inflammatory and actually seem to be the hotbed of the damage that might be driving tissue destruction during TB pathogenesis. And this is just COX-1, which is just a control where we don't see it much here in the inflammatory inside layer, but we see it outside. So this suggests that lipoxygenase ALOX, ALOX5 pathway seems to be driving pathological damage at the edge of the casiums. This is just to show you the, the zoomed um, version of that. You see it's highly there and not much at the end of the cellular regions. So with this mind, then when you see these factors associated with the disease at pathological level, we're not sure what's happening at clinical level. So in order to try and address the potential role of these proteins at, in clinical setup, we recruited people who had TB, who were active TB by sputum conversion, and those people who had latent TB and those who had, were just healthy. So we then isolated RNA from blood, the whole blood of this participants. And then we used qPCR, which is quantitative uh, PCR, that tell you the gene expression of your molecule of interest. So looking at ALOX5 expression, we found that the expression of ALOX5, which you remember as associated with the pathological damage in the lung, was also very high in people who were actively, who had active TB compared to latent TB and healthy donors. So this statistical increase of ALOX5 expression in active TB suggest that even in blood, which is a different compartment from granulomas, we also see this molecule seems to be a biomarker of active TB. And um, going back to that pathway, which is arachidonic acid here, which we know that uh, from medical school, many people would remember that arachidonic acid can be utilized by coxes, like COX-1 and COX-2 to lead to prostanoids, such as prostatlandin, prostacycline, and thromboxane. Whereas on the other arm, as I've showed you, lipoxygenase, particularly ALOX5, utilize arachidonic acid to produce downstream things like lipoxins and leukotrienes. And leukotriene B4 is the end product of five logs from the textbook. And this is the pathway where we think this is a pathway that seems to be driving pathological damage and associated with the disease in active TB. So what we're interested next, having seen the association of LOX5 with TB disease, we wanted to see whether the downstream mediators, LTB4 as well as LTA4H, would also be mirroring the expression in diseased setup. So what we did, again, we went back to the pathway and you can see this is what I talked about, LTB4 and LTA4H, which are downstream of this molecule. We found that when you looked at the expression of LTB4 here, which is a lipid that is released by the pathway, we see that it increases, it has a tendency to increase in TB compared to healthy and latent TB. And the gene that leads to its production too, which is LTA4H by PCR, we find that it also increases in TB. 
And here actually it's just another molecule, which is lipoxin, which we're just using as a control. It also shows increase here. So what we find here basically is that the downstream mediators of LOX5 at gene level, as well as at lipid level also associate with the disease. This confirming that the pathway LOX5 and its downstream mediators seem to be associated with active TB. And then, so what we did now, this was just in blood from people at different conditions of the disease. So now we took PBMCs, which are peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which come from healthy participants. So those PBMCs, we infected them with mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the pathogen that causes TB in vitro. So when we did that, we looked at PBMC alone to measure the lipid, which is the end product of ALX5 pathway. And you see, this is the amount produced when the PBMCs are not infected. And when you infect PBMCs with mycobacterium tuberculosis, we see that LTB4 product increases. And then we see that when you have pharmaceutical inhibitors of ALOX5 and its downstream mediators, which is called SC, we actually find that we can actually intercept this pathway to reduce production of LTB4. So this suggests that actually ALOX5 pathway is directly involved in producing LTB4. And that LTB4 production can be intercepted by pharmaceutically down-regulating these proteins. So this creates a direct link between ALOX5 at the top here on this pathway, together with leukotriene B4 at the bottom. So what we did then to try and see in detail what this tells us about LTB4 being associated with ALOX5 and also being a driver of the disease, we're really interested in confirming whether this, because so far we established an association with inflammation in the tissue. So we wanted to establish an inflammation relationship in blood. So what we did, we got plasma from TB people, people who had TB. Plasma is just another component of blood. And then we used something called Bioplex, which measured multiple cytokines, chemokines, and growth factors. So we used like a 27 plex, which measured about different kind of 27 different kind of um, circulatory mediators. So when we looked into our data in detail, we found that actually LTB4 that I showed you associating with the disease was directly correlating with tumor necrosis factor, which is known to be a generali generalized inflammation, meta in inflammation biomarker, which is TNF. And we also found that there's a direct correlation with IL-8, which is a chemokine that's involved in recruitment of neutrophils, which you know that can also contribute to lung inflammation. And finally, another correlation that was positive is a, it's a chemokine called uh, macrophage inflammatory protein 1 beta, which is known to recruit inflammatory macrophages to a region of infection. So with this correlation, this confirms that actually there is a direct correlation even in blood of LTB4 together with inflammatory mediators that are circulatory. And then what's interesting, there was another molecule called detoxin, which actually was inversely correlating with LTB4. And when you looked what detoxin does, it's that it actually recruits type two cells, which are more involved, not infection, but in allergies such as uh, eosinophils as well as basophils. So what this tells us that is actually there's a direct correlation with LTB4 together with inflammatory drivers in blood. So finally, what we wanted to check here is whether actually this relationship uh, between uh, the association between inflammation in this ALOX5 and LTA4H protein. So far it's an association, one can not tell whether this pathways are driving these inflammatory responses or not. So in order to do that, we went back to PBMCs and then we did infections where we intercepted both ALOX5 with, ALOX5 with xylutin as well as LTA4H with the SC. These are pharmaceutical inhibitors. So when you have PBMCs, you have TNF like this. And then when you add mycobacterium tuberculosis, TNF increases. And then when you actually add different concentration of the pharmaceutical inhibitor of LTA4H, you reduce production of TNF. And also with xylutin that targets ALOX5, you also reduce TNF production also in combination. And that was consistent even at day three after infection. So what this tells us is that actually ALOX5 LTA4H pathway is directly producing inflammatory mediators that are damaging during TB progression. And we show this both in the lung compartment and also in blood.
So finally, to try and show the relationship that we saw between TNF and ALOX5, we went back to staining the tissue here. So DAP is just for, 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 for nucleic acids. Here we find, you see that it's in green ALOX5 on the tissue, on different kind of tissues. So when we stained this alongside TNF by its antibody, you see that these seem to be co-localizing on the tissue by staining around the edges again that seem to be bordering the casium here. So take home message so far, what I've shown you is that the inflammatory mediators of TB pathology are spatially segregated within granulomas. And these mediators are also at play in blood that we can actually detect them as potential biomarkers and that they seem to be associated with inflammation and that actually they seem to be driving inflammation directly that they can be targeted by pharmaceutical inhibitors. So these pharmaceutical inhibitors can be explored more in detail as potential host directed therapies that can be utilized to try and limit inflammation that seems to be worsening pathological damage in TB. So this opens an area where we can have first line drugs that are treating TB as a disease and alongside we can have adjunct therapy that's reducing damage in the lung. So this is one theme and then I quickly want to get another to another theme like in the last two, three minutes or so. So what we also do now, so TB is no longer looked at as a binary state where you just have latent TB and active TB. So what we know right now is that when someone is infected with latent in, with mycobacterium tuberculosis, we also know that there's something happening before they get into active TB. So there's a stage called subclinical TB here, which is where there's already some risk factors at play that suggest there are people who are more at risk to developing active TB than others. But we don't know what factors are actually at play to tell us that someone is at risk. So some of the interest that we have in the lab is to identify factors that will tell us that someone is at risk of developing TB. Uh, of developing TB disease from latent TB. So what we do now, we plan to go back to the genes, protein signatures that were identified in different regions of granuloma pathological damage. And then to see whether we can match this at blood level to use these signatures that tell us that someone is about to get pathological damage and use those to identify people at risk and actually give them preventive therapy. So recent work in that, along that line from largely from Sadvis uh, and other groups um, showed that actually, so they did a study where they looked at people who were latently infected. This adolescence cohort who, were, who lived in Worcester, which is a high risk area for TB. So these people were followed for 800 days from the time they, they were recruited with latent TB. So during that period for 800 days, they were actually collecting blood. And after 800 days, they then actually did screening for active TB. And they found there were group, within that group, there were people who converted to active TB and those who didn't convert. So what these researchers did, they went back over time to see amongst those who converted to active TB compared to those who didn't convert to active TB. What are the factors that seem to have been increasing closer to the diagnosis, which is the onset of the disease time zero. So ranging from day minus, day minus 800 going all the way to time zero here, you see that as early as 200 days before the onset of the disease, there's actually inflammation you can see here in green, there's actually an increase of mediators of inflammation before even the disease has arrived, indicating that there are groups of people who can be identified as risky already before they even have the disease by virtue of looking in the blood. So what we find interesting is that actually within our granuloma in the lung damage, the factors that are associated with lung granuloma pathological damage, they actually mirror the same inflammatory mediators that are risk factors as early as, as 200 days before the disease. And people can already start using PET-CT imaging already to look at these factors that seem to be telling someone that this person is going to be at risk of getting TB soon. So what we did in this line, looking back in our data, we went back to our proteomics data and we found molecules such those that are associated, for instance, here you can see NCF1, they're associated with, with pathological damage like cashews and cavities here. Like these are just examples. 
So having seen this eye in the lung, we wanted to see whether we can use this to really detect a risk in people who have TB. So what we did again, we went to PCR, qPCR of blood from people who have TB versus healthy. And we found, as you can see, these molecules here between healthy and TB for different molecules like NCF1 here, like uh, IFIT here, as well as CYBB. We find that consistently, some of the molecules that are mirroring damage in the lung, they are readily circulatory in blood and could be used as tools to identify those people who are having lung damage, and but you can use blood tests for that. So this is one theme that we think will actually help us enable biomarkers that will tell people at risk and will get quicker treatment. So, um, so I'll, uh, uh, from here we think by conclusion that mediators of lung damage or cachiation may be used to determine risk of TB progression to help inform better management or early introduction of TB uh, treatment. I believe that by the time we identify or we diagnose people as having um, as having active TB, it's usually when people are already having lung damage, such that there's cavitary granulomas and people are coughing out bacteria, which in essence is really late, which is why we take too long to treat TB six months, because we're also dealing with bacteria that's really, that's, that's like uh, all over the lung. So if we actually find ways of actually identify early risk and we treat early, perhaps we can shorten therapies, especially with mediators that limit inflammation. So um, yeah, so with this in mind, I'll do the conclusion. So far with the two themes that I showed you, we found that inflammatory protein associated with lung pathological damage and that some of this protein are in circulation in the blood and can be explored as markers of inflammation and disease severity. And by using pharmaceutical interception of these drivers of pathological damage, we can identify host-directed therapies that can help improve current treatment protocols. And work in my lab is done by these members of my lab at Africa Health Research Institute. And I have to note uh, to recognize that we collaborate with Investor of Pretoria with Professor Tere, and we have a joint PhD student to, um, here, um, but, but we're doing like also imaging of this pathological damage in the lung using like the, the probes that are developed in, in, in the Department of Nuclear Medicine at University of Pretoria. But these are members of my lab and also I, I acknowledge collaborations in different institutes. And this, as I recently left University of Cape Town, this is my group at the University of Cape Town that most of which are finishing right now. And I appreciate you for, for, for support. And also this is um, our funders, Welcome Trust, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, South African Medical Research Council, and as well as NRF. And I thank you for, for your attention and the opportunity to talk in this very great faculty day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Maragalala, for that uh, presentation. Um, I, I would really like to congratulate you for all the good work that you are doing uh, in your research, uh, particularly with regard to uh, that research about uh, you know, TB research uh, to try to, to solve the, 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 the real problems, because that's the, uh, um, you, you know, uh, one of the main problems, especially in Africa, that still needs to be addressed. And, um, I would like to also thank you for your kind words at the beginning. Uh, you know, Professor Marakalala and I did uh, study at the uh, university, previous University of the North, which is now University of Limpopo, and he has always been an, a hardworking and inquisitive uh, person. So really congratulations for all the work that you have done. Um, you. I would also like to remind colleagues that there's an icon um, where you can pose your questions. Uh, so if you have questions for Professor Maragalala, please uh, type your questions there and it will be read out to him and uh, he may respond to it. Um, that goes for all the other sessions that follows, that follow afterwards, that if you have a question, you may type in your question there. Um, you also can get CPD points. So there's a form that you can fill in there where you can get some CPD points for, you know, attending this uh, research day and uh, 
listening to the various presentations. Um, so I would like to again thank you. Um, in the absence of uh, any questions, I think we will take a short tea break now and we will resume at 9.45.
anything from McDonald's. Pizza. Bright flies. Sweets. Oh, I love sweets. A burger. Chocolate. Pizza is probably my favorite meal. Um, I visit the kiosk about once in every two days at least, but maybe more. It depends on my money. Most of the time when I'm studying, I need to, I need to snack and if I can't concentrate, I'm going to go get a snack. Oh yes, I get so hungry, I get hangry, I get hungry angry and um, then I can't work at all. I really need my snacks to help me maintain my focus. Sometimes I, I really suffer from headaches, like if I don't have a meal within the next three to four hours. Welcome back. Perhaps just a reminder regarding the CPD points, you will get a code uh, which you need to enter, to enter uh, for accreditation. So the code will pop in, you know, at certain times. So I don't know when, but you need to watch out for that particular code. Um, now, there's a code HS. UP347, which you need to enter as you fill in your CPD points form. Remember, you need to be present throughout the day and ascend through this day for your submission to be valid. Thank you. And another reminder is that when you type in a question, please don't type it in the live chat because it won't count as a question. Um, type it under the ask a question tab, which you will see there as part of the icons. Just remember that. Thank you. We are moving over to our panel discussion, our first theme. Research is the heartbeat of academic institutions, especially research intensive ones like the University of Pretoria. Through research, academics generate knowledge which can be used to solve problems of humanity. The research we conduct must benefit all stakeholders, patients, clinicians, educators, students, managers, policymakers, industry partners, and the community at large. Now, we are going to try to look at this question in this panel discussion. How is the pandemic of COVID-19 affecting all this? The aim of this panel discussion is to explore how the pandemic has affected health sciences research from the perspective of different entities. Now, the panel will be chaired by Professor Joyce Mutabing. Well, the other time, Prof Mutabing pointed to me that actually my surname is Motabing, that is here on top of the mountain. And I suspect some kind of royalty there. So Professor Motabing, I will hand over the reins to you for this panel discussion. Thank you, Program Director. You are spot on. It's royalty. Professor Diyakher, our keynote speaker, fellow researchers and research enthusiasts. Let me start by saying all protocol observed. The program director has already told you my name. I'm the head of the physiotherapy department and chair of the research committee in the School of Healthcare Sciences. I welcome you to this historical event, the first panel session of the first virtual health sciences faculty research day.
COVID has affected our research in a number of ways, and today we are going to be exploring all of that. An article I read recently entitled The Crucible of COVID-19, What the Pandemic is Teaching Us About Health Research System. Authors Tena and El Jadali in 2020 stated that this global health crisis created by COVID-19 is providing valuable insights into the strength of our health research systems and perhaps even more clearly displaying its weaknesses. The COVID pandemic has been with us for more than a year now. Due to this pandemic, the face of health research has undergone some changes, revealing opportunities while exposing some major system flaws in the process. As health researchers, the pandemic forced us to think outside the box as we reimagine health science research all the way from the laboratory through the bedside to the community. Today, we have a six member strong panel of researchers to tackle the topic of our discussion. During these 30 minutes, the panel will explore how the pandemic has affected health science research and changed this phase. For better or for worse, the jury is out. To kickstart our discussion, I will ask our panelists to take a minute to briefly introduce themselves and share their reflections on the impact of the pandemic on health research systems in their respective entities. And we will start with Professor Veronika Ueckermann from the Department of Internal Medicine. Prof, just share with us briefly how this pandemic has affected research in your entity. Thank you. All protocols observed and thank you for the opportunity to be a part of our research day at the faculty. I am a clinician. I'm currently heading the uh, COVID-19 response at Steve Eco Academic Hospital and I'm the acting head of infectious diseases. So my role has been very much as a clinician in this time. The COVID-19 pandemic has really been a double-edged sword. And on the one hand, it's really posed many challenges to us, especially as clinicians, where a lot of our work has been halted and we've had to find new and innovative ways to get around what we were usually doing in our research. But on the other hand, it's certainly uh, given us an opportunity to explore and to be part of global research in COVID-19. So really, it's been this match, uh, this two-sided coin, rather, of opportunity as well as challenge. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Prof. Our next panelist is Professor Teresa Rousseau from Medical Immunology. Prof. Rousseau, please just tell us briefly about yourself and your research and how COVID has affected you. Good morning, Professor Motabeng and all other colleagues. It's a wonderful opportunity to speak to you today and explore how we can do things better and how we can learn from what we've been through. Um, I think for us, it has really been difficult two years, time of adjustment, time of great uncertainty. Um, which has really revealed to me the two important aspects um, that I take from this um, COVID pandemic. And the one is the need for collaboration, um, not just between laboratories and clinicians, but also between uh, national partners and also international partners. Um, and certainly I think we've done some of our best research to date because we have partnered and we've been really fortunate um, in the partners that we have um, been able to work with in the last few months. Um, the second aspect, I think, is about communication. Um, and maybe that is something that we can talk a little bit later about, because COVID has changed the way that we communicate with potential research participants, how we can recruit them, how we communicate with their family members, and also how, many, how we communicate with the community and society as, at large. Um, and I think this is critical for us to maintain trust in our research and what we do, um, and also to embrace the diversity of people um, that need to be able to give an input to the research that we do. Thank you very much, Prof. Our next panelist is Professor Wanda Makota, Director of the Center Morning, of Bio um, 
zoonosis. Introduce yourself, Prof. So, so you just introduced me, so thank you. So I'm from the Center of Viral Zoonosis, the director, but also a future Africa research chair. And I think there's been a lot of challenges. I mean, it's difficult to get into the labs. Things are more expensive. It takes forever to get supplies. You know, we in zoonosis need to do field work that was severely impacted. But it's also, like Teresa said, a year of a lot of opportunities. And actually, the past two years have been some of our best years because of the global community opening up. But also really looking at how we do things. You know, society really became important in how we plan and what we do. We need to do research that's going to make a difference, not research that's going to get me necessarily just a nature paper. And, and our whole look at how we do things has changed and putting the right teams together to really answer the questions that's going to make a difference in communities and society. Thank you very much. Next is Dr. Nicola Suri. Nicola? Morning, everybody. Thank you very much for this opportunity to be a part of the panel. I'm from the Sport, Exercise, Medicine and Lifestyle Institute, and I'm a researcher there. And I think for us, it's been quite different to the other panelists because our domain is predominantly athletes and doing research on the physically active populations. And so with the COVID pandemic, you know, everything kind of came to a halt with athletes and physically active populations. And international collaborations as well as local collaborators but even more so collaborating with IT partners really has become incredibly um, influential and vital and creating these safe protocols with athletes, especially the high performance athletes. And I think that's an incredibly important part of our new dimension in the COVID world. Thank you, Nicola. We also have Dr. Tsakani Songwani. Over to you, Tsakani. Um, thank you, Prof. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the panel. I am an obstetrician and gynecologist and an aspiring clinician scientist. So I work in the space of obstetrics and gynae. And throughout the pandemic, we've seen lots of challenges with how we offer antenatal care. We say we offer antenatal care for a good and a positive pregnancy experience and outcome. And we see that with the challenge and the crisis of COVID, how do we navigate um, offering care to our pregnant women? And how do we navigate doing research specifically um, in the obstetric space um, that is impactful um, while through the challenge of COVID. So I'm happy to share views on our space and how we have been impacted and how we have been challenged um, to evolve and to reshape how we do work in our space. Thank you. And last but not least, Dr. Marinda Motlock. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this panel. I'm a postdoctoral um, researcher um, in viral zoonosis as part of Prof. Otis Research Group. And I think one of the main challenges that we observed during the past two years was the um, travel restrictions due to the um, global pandemic, uh, which restricted us from performing some of our field research, which is quite vital um, for what we do. And now we've got gaps in our longitudinal data, and that actually sets us a bit back. But I think it's given us the opportunity to um, redirect some of our research aims and our research focus as to not be in a standstill with the research and still being able to um, commit to our obligations to funding bodies. But I think what is also necessary to point out is the struggles that we observed um, with students, especially being involved with student supervision, is how they struggled through this last two years, especially with the lack of some of the practical training. And it's, it's been hard. Um, in terms of that. Um, yes, that's from my side. Okay, um, I am going to go to our panelists and ask direct questions. But before that, maybe we asked Dr. Valerie Vanneval to also just introduce herself. Uh, thank you very much, Prof, and thank you, um, colleagues. Thank you for having me on this panel. Um, my name is Valerie Van Evel. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist as well, and I work for the um, SAMRC and University of Pretoria Research Center for Maternal, Fetal, Newborn, and Child Healthcare Strategies. Um, I won't introduce for too long. I resonate with everything my colleagues have mentioned, but just 
one line if this COVID pandemic has taught us anything is that we can actually do much more than we actually thought we were capable of. In a short space of time, we have done um, a lot, but Prof, I will, I will go back to you um, to start the discussions. Thank you. Thank you. To kickstart this discussion, I'm going to ask Professor Uckerman, what aspects of research has been affected by this pandemic in your specific entity? And to what extent or how have these been affected? Can you share with us a few of those and what you think can be done to address those challenges? I certainly can. Uh, there's no doubt that the pandemic has had a really dramatic effect and an almost immediate effect on most of us in terms of our research. And I think we will still be seeing the effect of uh, the pandemic on our research programs and progress for many years to come. I think clinical trials certainly were paused and we've had to relook how we communicate. Uh, Teresa touched on that, how we uh, have communicate with our participants. We've had to relook the platforms uh, where we communicate with our participants. We've really had industry constraints, getting the consumables that we need, getting the, our labs open, physically getting to the areas and the spaces where we need to do our research. But as a clinician, a lot of what I've experienced is my time being shunted completely towards clinical work. The face of the pandemic really has called that all clinicians be on board, on deck, so that we can deal with the clinical load and um, all the challenges clinically and the increased numbers of patients we were seeing. So for me, that was really how COVID affected my own research. On the other hand, you know, we've had to learn how to deal with new with these issues in the current context. Take, for example, getting consent from a patient. It's quite different getting consent from a patient in a nice clinical research unit um, when you compare that to being in full PPE, there's a mask and a visor between you, the patients on high flow oxygen, and you're trying to explain the intricacies of the immunological research you wanna do. That really has been quite a challenge for us. We've had to be innovative. Um, we've had to look at using new platforms, virtual platforms, and we've had to be innovative in reaching those participants who aren't necessarily um, in a position to have access to all of the virtual platforms that we have. So we've learned to collaborate quite widely with our community healthcare uh, workers. And I think what you'll see throughout this discussion is how the lab links with a tertiary hospital um, ward, which links with the community. And that really is such so exciting because it speaks to translational research. And I've mentioned how we've had unique research opportunities in the context of COVID-19. It has leveled the playing field in a way because worldwide, this is a new disease. And uh, we all started from scratch. International collaboration during this time has been phenomenal. Information sharing has been phenomenal. And we also uniquely positioned in South Africa to address some of the issues which the world were asking about. Things like HIV and COVID, TB and COVID, malaria and COVID. So really, again, um, just to, it speaks about opportunity and challenge. And uh, we've had to navigate and be innovative in this time and really collaborating within the institution and between institutions has allowed us, us as clinicians to still be a part of the bigger research picture. Okay. Thank you very much. You've touched on some of the questions that I was hoping that the other panelists would address. But if I can just ask uh, Dr. Motlock, what are the specific innovations or opportunities that you experience emerging out of this COVID pandemic? At least one that you can share with us? Um, yes, from, um, from my side, um, as, a, as a molecular researcher, I have to say, the advancements that we're seeing coming out at the moment, like um, for example, there's been a, a new assay that was developed by the University of Brigham um, that is more sensitive and cost effective um, than a PCR in identifying COVID. And I think if we use um, these new innovations that we see out there and then apply that to our research, I think um, that can be um, positively used in the current situation. I mean, it's always important for us um, performing things like biosurveillance, especially in wildlife pathogens, for, uh, wildlife for zoonotic pathogens, to implement these advancements and update our current assays um, and use these approaches um, for what we currently do. So I think in terms of um, innovations, what I've seen in the last while, I think that is, that is a good one. 
Thank you very much. We also have uh, Dr. Juanita Mellet online. Juanita, can you briefly just tell us about yourself before I ask you a short question? Hey, sorry, thank you so much. And um, it's an honor to be part of this panel discussion. Um, so I'm a postdoc at the Institute for Cellular and Molecular Medicine. And um, so we've had several challenges um, like everybody else. Uh, with such as sample collections, um, patients that are, are positive for COVID that we are not able to, to collect from, and also um, getting hold of laboratory reagents, um, the cost of reagents, and, and all of those things. But I think um, this pandemic has really given us um, new opportunities um, to deal with, um, with research and also to think outside of the box and really think about how we do things. So that's just from my side. Thank you very much. Coming to Dr. Songwane, in your view, what have been the major barriers and facilitators that influence how you do research in your entity? Please share just one with us. Um, thanks for the question, Prof. I think um, I'll start with the, the facilitators. I think what's happened with the COVID pandemic and with the rapid changing of research and how research is done, we see one of the facilitators that I've personally picked up currently is how um, the virtual space has emerged. And with that, now we have um, virtual conferences and with virtual conferences, now we find that um, the cost is drastically removed and some conferences are made free so it's more inclusive and we are able to share our research or hear other emerging research work that has been done across the country and this also goes beyond borders so we're able to connect um beyond our beyond our borders we are able to connect across disciplines um so this has sort of strengthened local and global collaborations so that we are able to work and learn together and reshape what we are doing um as a as a team um one of the barriers um, i think a big barrier in in our space is in-person sessions uh, because a lot of the work that we do you have to have uh, patient contact so that, that has created a big barrier as some of the panelists have also mentioned it's difficult to get consent and to really build rapport with a patient when they can't necessarily um, identify you and see you as you are um, covered in ppe so that has caused a lot of barriers um, and a, a big challenge to um, conducting research in that space. Thank you very much. Nic Dr. Nicola, some of the panelists have mentioned how the use of the virtual space has helped advance research. In your experience uh, in physical rehabilitation and lifestyle research, what innovative strategies have you found that you could put in place and how have you experienced those? So I can talk to that, but I'll first put a disclaimer that I'm a non-patient facing biokineticist currently, mm. but we do have multiple physiotherapists and medical doctors currently in the practice. And the physiotherapists were very quick to adapt to the online space and to providing sessions um, by telehealth, which has been incredible. And we give a lot of kudos to the members of staff here at Semley and how quickly they did adapt to it. And it has been amazing. The doctors, um, they did do some telehealth initially. However, we did then move back to face-to-face -face sessions um, and in-person treatment um, just with the regular COVID um, protocols observed and it has been effective since then. We have however done much um, COVID research on actual patients, athletes with COVID-19 and their re rehabilitation from that. Um, but with that, having said that, we use a lot of technology in terms of monitoring systems. So we've got apps and um, various surveys that get sent out and we do a lot of monitoring via that to just keep a check on our athletes and how they're recovering from COVID, monitoring them that way. And it does, it makes a huge difference. It gives them the personalized interface that they need. 
um, but whilst being COVID safe, if we can put it that way. Thank you very much. Uh, coming back to Prof Makota, in his opening, the Dean talked about uh, transdisciplinary research. What's your take on transdisciplinary research during the COVID pandemic and how do you see it advancing health research? I think um, the Dean also explained the definitions in his talk, but um, it opened up the conversations and who's around the table during COVID. It, it wasn't just the academics. We were talking to government. We were talking to industry. We were talking to NGOs, to community leaders. And it, it really brought that team together that you need for true, true transdisciplinarity. And, and that opened up a completely different way of doing research because we really now starting to understand what's the real problems on the ground if we put the right people around the table to really look at a holistic approach. So I think the way forward is transdisciplinarity, we can call it different words, but, but it's really about bringing all these stakeholders around the table, including society, and listening and planning how we're going to go forward and looking at solutions all over that whole spectrum. So, so I think it's really the way that we all need to think going forward and trying to implement um, some of our research strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Juanita, there's a question from the audience. What do you think we can do differently to prepare for the next pandemic as academics and clinicians? Sorry. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I I think my connection was bad. Or um, so, could you just repeat the question, please? The question is: What do you think we can do differently to prepare for the next pandemic as academics and clinicians? So, I I think um, we can definitely. Uh, I mean, like. Like everybody said, I think we've already changed um, a lot of things in terms of uh, collaborations with um, a bit between different departments, both local as well as international. I think that will definitely help because we need experts on, um, on, on various levels, which is really important and will definitely um, be important for, for the next pandemic. Um, so, I never thought in a million years that I would live through a pandemic. And I really hope that we're not shocked or surprised um, at what is coming next. Um, I think this has really taught us that that we can we should be prepared for anything. We should be adaptable and uh, we should use the instruments of science and technology to have a better sense of what to expect and to prepare ourselves for the future. So thank you. Thank you very much to all my panelists. I think what has come out of this discussion is that numerous lessons have been learned during this pandemic, lessons that we can take forward to improve not only health research, but you improve the health research that we conduct in order to promote better health for our communities and society at large. Thank you, panelists, for taking time to share your thoughts on research in the pandemic and, most importantly, what lessons we've learned. The importance of transdisciplinary research, as Prof. Diacher has emphasized, and the use of technology, as some of our panelists have highlighted. We need to push the agenda to deal effectively with the pandemic and its impact on society. This short panel discussion was obviously a brain teaser. Let the engagements and collaborations continue. I thank the panel, program directors, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Mutabing, for that insightful um, discussion with your panel. And thank you to our panelists as well. It is clear from the discussion that COVID 19 has forced us to reimagine our research. Um, and as you can see, uh, some of the things had to be done to adjust so that supervisors 
and researchers can actually produce research and present on this research day. I mean, people could easy, easily throw their arms or their hands in the air and say, COVID has hit us, some of us are sick, so we cannot produce research. But they found alternative ways to produce research and be innovative. And some positive people would say, don't let a good pandemic go to waste. And our researchers have certainly not let a good pandemic go to waste and have uh, certainly adjusted and will be better prepared even for the next time when we are hit by a similar event. Thank you very much, Professor Mutabing and your panelists. We will now move over to research showcase in the School of Healthcare Sciences. But before we do that, we will run a promotional video for the School of Healthcare Sciences. It takes teamwork to treat a patient. And the University of Pretoria School of Healthcare Sciences provides the knowledge and skills that enable you to be part of the treatment and care process, even for a potentially life-altering condition. Nurses take care of patients from the moment they're admitted, as in the case of an incomplete spinal cord injury, where special care is required. From positioning the patient for X-ray imaging to reduce the risk of complications due to immobility, this daily regime continues all the way through to rehabilitation. The radiographer uses ionizing radiation for imaging of internal structures as a key diagnostic tool in different medical disciplines. They may also provide support during surgery. The images produced assist in proper diagnosis and the treatment plan required. Dietetics focuses on preventative, promotive, curative, and rehabilitative aspects of human nutrition. In hospitals, dietitians design a specific diet to facilitate the process of treatment and recovery. The patient's nutritional status is assessed, monitored, and optimized through special feeds. Physiotherapy focuses on physical rehabilitation to optimize the functional ability of the patient by means of joint mobilization and improving muscle strength and functioning. The rehabilitation program enables the patient to move independently. In this case, through strength conditioning, patients gain mobilization from their wheelchairs and ultimately are able to walk again. Occupational therapy aims to assist people with loss of function due to disability to optimize independent and optimal functioning in occupations across their lifespan. Occupational therapists enable individuals to perform activities of daily living and provide adaptations, assistive technologies and home modifications. If you have a passion for healthcare and want to change lives, the School of Healthcare Sciences in UP's Faculty of Health Sciences can prepare you in your journey. Our academic programs are embedded in research that matters. Become a life changer and put your commitment into practice. Thank you. We are moving on to the next session, which is a research showcase in the School of Healthcare Sciences. And it will be led by Mr. Carl Felyun. Mr. Carl Felyun is the lecturer in the Department of Physiotherapy and head of physiotherapy at SEMLI, that is exercise medicine. He's a PhD candidate at Freie University in Amsterdam and the University of Pretoria. The School of Healthcare Sciences session will showcase work of our newly fledged PhD researchers and other collaborative projects within the sphere of health care sciences. There will be nine presentations covering topics of human nutrition, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, nursing sciences, and radiography. An eight minute time slot will be given for discussion um, at the end of this session. I will now hand over the reins to Mr. Carl Feliun. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manuel. And uh, to be excited to host the first online session for the School of Healthcare Sciences. Um, as you stated, I'll be your moderator, and we have a packed program. So without wasting 
uh, further time, uh, let's use this precious time for our presentations. So I'm going to introduce our first uh, presenter. That will be uh, Dr. Rubina Brandon. And she's going to present her title is Upper Limb Muscle Strength and Exercise Endurance as Predictors of Successful Extubation in Mechanically Ventilated Patients, a Predictive Correlation Study. We look forward to your presentation. Mechanical ventilation temporarily replaces or supports breathing in the critical ill patient. Since the inception of mechanical ventilators, successful weaning and extubation failure has always been a challenge that the physician, nursing staff and physiotherapist grapple with. Early liberation from the ventilator is beneficial to patients, yet premature discontinuation can compromise gas exchange and lead to re-intubation. Failed extubation is associated with an increase in the mortality rate of 20 to 50 percent, an increase in the ICU length of stay, the hospital length of stay, the financial costs, and it decreases the patient's functional ability, muscle strength, and health-related quality of life. Several studies have been performed to evaluate successful extubation predictors but none of them can be used with absolute certainty or in isolation. Predictors evaluated reflect the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, and the musculoskeletal system. None of these factors included exercise endurance. A study conducted by the Jung and Associated indicated that respiratory muscle weakness is associated with peripheral muscle weakness. On the other hand, Duzadai and colleagues concluded that upper extremity strength is associated with pulmonary function and exercise endurance tested with a six-minute walking test. A lack of oxygen transport, ventilation limitation, fatigue and a lack of peripheral muscle strength relate to a decrease in endurance. A pilot study conducted by De Beer and Associates demonstrated that muscle strength of deltoid, sternocleidomastoid, and trapezius may possibly be associated with, this, with successful extubation. In the same study, they found that the exercise endurance tested with the psychoegometer might also show a trend of possible association with successful extubation. The implication of this information is that the respiratory muscle strength indicates extubation outcome and is associated with peripheral muscle strength. So therefore, the peripheral muscle strength might indicate extubation outcome. Integration of the respiratory and the musculoskeletal systems indicate exercise endurance and therefore exercise endurance might determine extubation outcome. With all these information, the researchers start asking the research question. Can upper limb muscle strength and exercise endurance be used as predictors of successful extubation in mechanically ventilated patients? The aim of the study was to determine whether successful extubation in mechanically ventilated patients can be predicted by using upper limb muscle strength and exercise endurance. A predictive correlational study was performed in the Steve Beaker Academic Hospital from February 2018 until September 2019. Participants were recruited from the trauma ICU and the medical ICU who were ventilated for three and more days, 18 years and older, and who was hemodynamic stable. Participants could not perform manual muscle testing techniques due to spinal cord injuries, bilateral amputations, or burn injuries limiting the testing of the muscle strength were excluded. During the study, the muscle strength was evaluated with the Oxford grading scale and the MR ski score. The hand grip strength was measured with a handheld anemometer. Exercise endurance was tested with a psychoegometer and the MIP was evaluated with the manometer in a semi fileless position. All testing was stopped immediately if a participant developed any sign of hemodynamic instability. A 
total of 463 participants were recruited, but only 57 was included in the data analysis. The reason for participants being excluded from data analysis is mainly due to participants being ventilated for less than three days. The results demonstrated that successfully extubated patients had marginally significant greater proportions of grade 3 muscle strength of the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles. A one-point increase in the MOC score was associated with a 7% reduction in the risk of failing extubation. Other results showed that the successfully, successfully extubated patients rode the cycle ego meter significantly longer by themselves than the failed extubated patients. For every 15 seconds the patient rode actively, the relative risk to fail extubation decreased with 5%. Every day a patient was ventilated, the higher the relative risk was to fail extubation. Univariable analysis was performed to identify the factors significantly associated with successful extubation, as well as the factors that were marginal significantly associated. After univariable analysis, all these factors were included in a multivariable logistic regression analysis to determine which factors can be included in the final prediction equation. Due to multicollinearity between the factors, the final prediction equation only consists of exercise endurance, in other words, the time the patient rode actively, and the number of days ventilated. When we use the final prediction equation and the value is less than minus 2.82, the model has a sensitivity of 81.8% and a specificity of 77.1%, to predict successful extubation. In conclusion, using the newly developed prediction equation consisting of exercise endurance and number of days ventilation, this tool can add to the array of available methods to assist the multidisciplinary team including the physicians, nurses and physiotherapists to determine readiness for extubation. The risk to fail extubation will decrease when the number of days ventilated decrease and the exercise endurance can increase. Shorter ventilated patients will have a reduced risk for developing peripheral muscle weakness, respiratory muscle weakness and a decrease in exercise endurance. This equation can also then theoretically assist the physiotherapist to prepare an early patient-centered rehabilitation program that may assist the physiotherapist to optimally strengthen the patient and that can increase the exercise endurance to prepare the patient successfully for extubation. Clinically, if a patient is successfully extubated, it may reduce the ICU length of stay, the hospital length of stay, the mortality rate, and the total financial expenditures. Successful extubation will also increase the patient's functional level and exercise endurance. One of the limitations of the study is that this is a single center study. We recommend further studies to cross-validate the prediction equation in different ISU settings locally, nationally and internationally. Thank you. Thank you, Rubina, for this uh, very important uh, presentation and topic that you have uh, investigated. Um, just a reminder for the audience, if you want to post a question, post it in the, in, the, in the question box and at the end of the session we'll get back to it um, and this surely spark uh, some questions after this presentation. Our next uh, presentation will be from Lizette Keen. She is from the Department of Human Nutrition and her title is Fish Supplementation and Cognition in Resource Limited Elderly People, a Randomized Control Trial. We look forward to your presentation. One, I'm Lizette Keen and I look forward to sharing my study, Fish Supplementation and Cognition in Resource Limited Elderly People, a Randomized Controlled Trial, with you all. Dementia numbers increase yearly and to date no cure exists. Management through medication is possible to a certain extent, but emphasis is rather on preventative approaches such as lifestyle and diet. And this is particularly the case 
for the neurodegenerative type of dementia called Alzheimer's disease. So globally, 50 million people are living with dementia and estimations project that this number will increase to 152 million by 2050, especially in the lower middle income countries where two thirds of those people reside. Dementia has a huge impact on the individual and its surroundings, but also on the global economy. The Lancet Expert Committee of 2020 estimated that the effect of dementia on both the individual and the global economy is one trillion US dollars per year. Unfortunately, most of the studies based on prevention of dementia is done in high income countries and not in low to middle income countries. Unfortunately, feasible and affordable lifestyle changes in high income countries might differ from those in low income countries. The objective of this study was to determine the effect of supplementing diets of independently living resource limited elderly people for 12 weeks with fish versus non-fish foods on cognition. The study had many ethical considerations and the necessary ethical approval was obtained from all the necessary parties. The setting of the study, it was a retirement village in the Gauteng province where all the residents above the age of 59 years were included, all races. Um, the study population then consisted out of 124 independently living residents who cared for themselves and really dined at the dining hall. They also had a personal income of less than 3,500 rand per month. For ethical reasons, the exclusion criteria were only applied before the data analysis. The only criterion applied before the onset of the intervention phase was when people were not willing to or either allergic to eating the test foods. The study design is best explained by the following slide. So in the top left hand corner, there's baseline one, which stands for your baseline one assessment, where the cognition and diet of everyone who entered into the study were assessed. This was then followed by a 12 week no intervention phase. And we specifically included this phase to see whether there would be any change in cognition if there was no intervention whatsoever. This was then followed by baseline 2 assessment, but just before baseline 2 assessment, randomization took place. So the sample then was randomized into an intervention and a control group. They then entered baseline 2 assessment. Once again, cognition and diet were assessed. And then for those who consented, specific biomarkers were also tested. Baseline 2 was then followed by the second 12-week period, which was the intervention phase. So everyone in the study, both the control and the intervention group, received certain study foods. The intervention group received an enhanced diet, which then refers to a modified mind diet, plus certain test foods, which was then fish and fish-based while the control group also received the enhanced diet or the modified mind diet plus certain control foods, which in this case was meatballs and texturized soya protein. And then after the 12 week period, all of them once again entered into the post intervention assessment where they again did the cognitive and dietary assessment and um, some of them did the biomarker assessment as well. If we have a closer look at the assessments that have been done, um, the cognition, which was the primary outcome, was measured through the Cognitive Ability Screening Instrument, or CASI. It's an instrument that was specifically developed for epidemiological research purposes. The CASI was then administered by a psychometrist, which was trained by a psychiatrist, and the CASI scores out of 100. A study-specific food frequency questionnaire was developed, and this was used to score the modified mind diet and also to calculate omega-3 PUFA intake. This was administered by a dietitian and the mind diet scores out of 15. And then laboratory testing of red blood cell fatty acid content, including your total omega-3 PUFA, your acosapentaenoic acid or EPA, docosapentaenoic acid or DPA, and docosahexaenoic acid or DHA was used to determine adherence to the dietary intervention. If we just quickly look at the statistical analysis, thought of 15 was used for analysis. Certain descriptives were done, which I'm not going to describe now. Um, the inferential stats that we did was um, through non-parametric analysis of covariance or ANCOVA, and this was then done with and without imputation.
If we move on to results, let's first have a look at cognition. Now this graph presents Kazi's score at the different assessments during the course of the study. So at the baseline one and the baseline two assessment, there was no significant difference between the two groups in Kazi's score. There was a similar trend, a steep upwards curve for both groups between baseline one and baseline two. And then there was a more gradual increase for both groups. Post-intervention, there was a significant difference of 2.3 points between the control and the intervention group, where the intervention group then scored higher. Also with the omega-3 puffer intake, intake was very similar at baseline 2 for the total puffer intake and then also for all the long chain fatty acids. Um, this graph presents the EPI intake, which also showed a very similar intake at baseline 2, but then a significant difference in intake for the two groups at post-intervention. The red blood cell fatty acid content was very interesting. There was also no significant difference in red blood cell fatty acid content at baseline 2, and then there was a significant difference in the fatty acid content in terms of the EPI and the DPI, not the total omega-3 PUFA. And this makes sense as the fish that we supplied the intervention group with was high in EPI and DPI. Okay, so then just to quickly recap. In terms of cognition, there was a higher than expected score for both groups at baseline 1 and baseline 2, which left less room for improvement. Um, the increase between baseline 1 and baseline 2 was possibly due to the attention that they received by forming part of the study. Between baseline 2 and post-intervention, there was a smaller but still statistically significant change in total causes score for both groups, which was of course expected due to the enhancement of both diets. There then also was a statistically significant difference of 2.3 points at post-intervention assessment between the two groups, suggesting that the omega-3 PUFA in the fish received by the intervention group may have exerted a statistically protective effect on cognition. In the initial protocol, a 2.5 point difference was assumed to be clinically relevant, but as the baseline scores were higher is as expected, um, this assumption may need some adjustment. And then also the study had many strengths and limitations, but due to time constraints, we couldn't include it in the presentation. Just as conclusion, there was a slight but significant change in those who consumed fish, and then also fish added for 12 weeks to an enhanced diet might contribute to preventing cognitive decline in elderly people. Thank you for sharing this presentation with me. You are very welcome to contact me via email should you have any questions. And then I would also just like to thank um, the retirement village where I did this study, Ampath Laboratories, Prof. Smiths and the Center of Excellence for Nutrition, Lucky Star, ShopRite Trekkers and Southern Oil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lizette, for the presentation. Uh, following your presentation, I'm heading over to the local fish and chip store uh, for my lunch, definitely. Um, uh, next up, we're going to have Sanya Nell. She's from the Department of Human Nutrition as well. And her title is going to be the predictive validity of digitized screening algorithms to detect weight for age, growth faltering, in under five children as a risk factor for, secure, for severe acute malnutrition. Uh, we look forward to your presentation, Sanya. Good morning, I'm Sanya Nell from the Department of Human Nutrition and I'm presenting my research on digitized screening algorithms to detect growth faltering as a risk factor for severe acute malnutrition. The key problem we aim to address in the research was the high prevalence of preventable SAM. When we looked at the rotile booklet of children admitted with SAM, we often see a clear pattern of growth faltering, but it's either not identified or not addressed during routine growth monitoring. So when a proposal was made to develop a digitized version of the Road to Health booklet, we asked ourselves, could we use this technology to improve the detection of children with growth faltering at risk of SAM? Before we continue, let's clarify a few key concepts. The first is SAM, or Severe Acute Malnutrition for which we use the WHO diagnostic criteria of a weight for height length Z score less than minus three, mid upper arm circumference less than 150 millimeters or bilateral fatigue edema. 
The second key concept is growth, which in this study was defined as a change in weight or weight for age sets course over time. Growth faltering then is growth that falls short of what would be expected in a healthy child. Returning to the problem at hand, it's common to see SAM patients with growth charts like this one, where intervention only took place once the weight for age fell below minus 3, but the growth faltering was evident much earlier. We believe that intervening at those earlier stages could prevent progression to SAM. As mentioned earlier, the future digitization of the road to health booklet is a possibility. This would allow for automated assessment of growth curves, improving the identification of growth faltering and prompting earlier intervention. However, it's challenging to define growth faltering in a computer-friendly way since there's no accepted quantitative definition. Rather, growth is assessed by visual inspection of the growth curve that's informed by the individual clinician's training and experience. Furthermore, whilst healthy growth follows a consistent weight for HZ score, some up and down variation is normal, and it's not clear at what point it becomes a cause for concern. So after consulting an expert, we decided to use a type of artificial intelligence software known as a neural network. A neural net uses machine learning for automated pattern recognition and classification. What makes a neural net particularly suitable for growth monitoring is that it doesn't require predefined rules, but learns to recognize patterns from examples of input data and their associated outputs, much like how we train clinicians to interpret growth curves. So we collected the training data for our neural net by surveying 30 South African child growth experts who are asked to rate 100 weight for age growth charts as representing low, medium or high risk of SAM. This provided the input and output data for the neural net to develop its own mathematical model of weight for age growth. The figure shows the structure of our neural net. The input is a series of weight for age set scores derived from the child's growth curve. The neural net then uses the mathematical model it developed during training to classify the growth pattern and provides a SAM risk rating as an output. After training the neural net, it was then necessary to validate its performance in a real-life sample, which is the focus of the rest of this presentation. So the main aim of the validation study was to determine the ability of the neural net to predict SAM risk in children under 5 from their weight for age growth. And additionally, we compared the neural net to simpler SAM risk indicators based on changes in weight or weight for age set score between two time points. We used diagnostic accuracy testing focused on sensitivity and specificity calculations. The exposure variable was a SAM risk classification based on weight for age growth, and the outcome of interest was a SAM diagnosis by WHO criteria. The validation sample consisted of term-born children under the age of five, recruited using a case control sampling design with two controls per case. The cases consisted of children with SAM admitted to two hospitals in Shwane, and the controls consisted of children without SAM recruited at three clinics in the same sub-district. All weight measurements that were recorded in the Road to Health booklet were used to then assess weight for age growth, and weight, length or height, and mid upper arm circumference were measured at enrollment or hospital admission to confirm the presence or absence of SAM. So this growth chart shows how our data were divided. The last point on the growth curve was used as the outcome. For cases, that was the weight at which SAM was first identified. For controls, it was the weight taken on the day of enrollment. The weight for age growth for the exposure variable was then assessed using all the weights preceding that one. And we assessed weight for age growth in two different ways. Firstly, the weight for age set scores were entered into the neural net to obtain a risk classification. And if it was a medium or high risk classification, it was considered at risk of SAM. Secondly, the last two weights on the exposure part of the curve were compared, and at risk of SAM was defined using different cutoffs, which were weight loss, lack of weight gain, or a decrease in the weight for AFZ score of more than 0 0.33, 0 0.5, or 0.67 of a Z score. And this table shows the calculated sensitivity specificity and the area under the receiver operating characteristic or rock curve for each of these exposures. The highest sensitivity was attained by any decrease in weight for AFZ score, but also the lowest specificity, suggesting that small decreases in Z score are common in cases and controls alike. And this agrees well with what we know about normal growth. The highest specificity was attained by weight loss, 
but the sensitivity was poor, meaning it still failed to identify many of the Atlas children. The neural net had the highest area under the rock curve, which indicates it has a good combination of high sensitivity and specificity. So in context, it means that if the, the neural net had been applied to our study sample during routine growth monitoring, 46 of those 63 SAM cases would have been identified before the onset of SAM, which allows earlier intervention to prevent SAM. And 17 of the controls would also have been wrongly identified as at risk and would have received unnecessary intervention, which is not harmful, but carries the time and resource cost. In light of these results, a few things must be considered. First and foremost, that weight for age growth and diagnostic criteria for SAM are conceptually incongruent. So weight for age growth will never be a perfect predictor of SAM, but it is routinely done and this research highlights that it could be much better utilized. Further work could be done to improve the neural net itself, including expanding the training data set and incorporating some additional risk factors in the assessment. On a practical level, it's necessary to identify appropriate interventions to prevent SAM in adverse children, and this should include a careful consideration of costs and benefits, especially in areas with a low SAM prevalence. And finally, the neural net should be validated in preterm born children since they are a high risk group for SAM. In conclusion, the neural net demonstrated a good ability to identify children at risk of SAM that are currently missed during routine growth monitoring. Thus, implementing it as part of routine growth monitoring could help decrease SAM incidence through the earlier detection of growth altering. I thank you, and if you have any questions, you are welcome to contact me on my email address, sanya.nal at tux.co.za. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, I already see this from the audience. It sparked some interest. Uh, so I hope you will be available at the end of the session to answer some questions as well. Uh, but we're looking forward to get to that session as well. Um, next up, we're going to have uh, Puveshni Naidu. She's from the Department of Physiotherapy. And her title is the Balance and Proprioception in Healthy Individuals Between the Ages of 18 to 30 Years. Thank you, Puveshni. Good day. My name is Puveshni Naidu and I am going to be presenting a study that was done with some students called Balance and Proprioception in Healthy Individuals Between the Ages of 18 to 30 Years Old. Balance is the ability to maintain an upright position, whether moving or staying stable, whilst proprioception is the ability to know where's one's body even when not looking at it. Literature has shown us that there are various systems involved in balance and proprioception, namely the musculoskeletal, central nervous system, vestibular and visual systems. We found many studies where balance and proprioception are affected due to conditions or injuries. There was little information on healthy subjects, making it difficult for members of the rehabilitation team to assist patients to fully recover from balance and proprioception deficits. Therefore, the aim of the study was to determine balance and proprioception of healthy individuals 18 to 30 years old. A descriptive cross-sectional design on 61 participants was done. Balance tests using the force plate and the star excursion balance test were done. For the proprioception, the Romberg test and the sharpened Romberg test were done. According to literature, good balance and proprioception are noted by little or no postural sway or compensations. In this study, 47.5% and 23% showed to have good balance using the balance test. Single leg stance and dynamic balance were challenging, while anterolateral on the left and posterolateral stance on the right were most difficult. With regards to proprioception, 96.7% and 29.1% were shown to have good proprioception. The eyes closed seemed to affect proprioception. Other findings of the study were shown when balance and proprioception were compared to gender, site dominance, physical activity, type of work, and postural deviations.
the discussion. Good balance and proprioception were noted in literature in healthy participants. However, these participants were all involved in sport. Age seemed to have been found to be a factor as younger participants were, were known to have better balance and proprioception, as shown in this study. Side dominance seemed to have no effect on balance and proprioception in this study. However, according to a study in 2011, participants seemed to show better balance and proprioception on the dominant side. This study was limited due to COVID regulations and all participants being part of the healthcare faculty. These are the references used for some of the images. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Puveshni. Uh, even though it's challenging to, to conduct these studies in the, in the current COVID environment, uh, it, it surely fills an important gap uh, in literature for us. Uh, thank you for that. Our next presenter will be Adeline Pretorius. She's from the Department of Human Nutrition. And her uh, title is The Variability of Resting Energy Expenditure and its components of early, middle, and late achievers in steady state, a study of six to nine-year-old Southern African children. Thank you, uh, Adeline. Hey, my name is Adeline Pretorius. I'm from the department Human Nutrition. I will be presenting some of the results that was part of my PhD research, assessing the variability of resting energy expenditure and its components of early, middle, and late achievers of steady state a study of six to nine-year-old Southern African children. Overnutrition is a rising epidemic and children are increasingly affected. Overnutrition develops when energy intake exceeds expenditure, causing an increase in body weight or vice versa. Consequently, dietary energy requirements for weight maintenance is based on accurately determining energy required from food intake that corresponds with total energy expenditure to achieve an energy balance. Dietitians could, in principle, use reported dietary intake to predict energy requirements, but energy intake determined by dietary assessments often underestimates usual intake, so alternatively measurements of energy expenditure are recommended to determine energy requirements. Energy expenditure involves heat production. Therefore, the amount of heat generated by the body can be measured to determine the amount of energy expended. This is generally expressed as kilojoules or kilocalories. However, the direct measurement of heat production is technically challenging and costly. So alternatively, since a direct relationship exists between oxygen consumption and the amount of heat produced by the body, indirect open circuit calorimetry is generally used to measure oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange to calculate resting energy expenditure or REE. An indirect calorimetry metabolic card measuring REE is illustrated in this picture. REE refers to the energy expended when an individual is at complete rest and it is the dominant source of daily energy expenditure. In clinical practice, measurement or prediction of REE is generally used as the baseline to determine energy requirements and an activity factor is added to allow for the additional energy expended during daily activities. Although non-invasive, relatively low in cost and easy to operate, metabolic cards are large, which limits movement and restricts study duration. Consequently, these devices can only be used to measure energy expenditure over a short period of time which is then extrapolated to represent the 24-hour REE, and this may introduce significant error. To improve the degree to which the shorter measurement accurately represents REE, the concept of steady state was introduced. Steady state represents a state of complete rest when there is a minimum variation, generally less than 5 to 10 percent, in gas exchange variables from one minute to the next. Percentage variation in gas exchange variables is referred to as the percentage coefficient of variation and can be calculated as illustrated in this box. To improve validity and reduce error during REE measurements, evidence-based measurement protocols 
are advised to ensure the individual has reached a resting state. When measuring REE in adults, the following measurement protocol is suggested. However, this measurement protocol is not always feasible for children because many children cannot rest quietly for this long. Some evidence exists that an extended steady state interval along with a prolonged measurement period may unnecessarily prolong the duration of the test without improving the accuracy. Shorter REE protocols appear to be more suitable and accurate for children due to a reduction in boredom and the consequent fidgeting. However, research on the best procedure to achieve steady state in children is very limited and consensus on a standardized protocol has not yet been reached. So this study aimed to determine in six to nine year old children the variability of REE associated measurements after achieving steady state. A cross sectional design was followed. The REE of 120 healthy children with a mean age of 7.9 years of which 58% were girls was measured by indirect calorimetry by using the Quark metabolic card from COSMED with a ventilated canopy hood. Participants were requested not to exercise before the measurement, to sleep for at least seven hours the night before, to fast since 9 p.m. the previous night, and to arrive early in the morning for their appointment. They were then familiarized with the test procedure upon arrival. No rest period was given before the measurement. During the measurement, participants remained in a supine position while an audible short story was played to help them relax. They were constantly observed in a thermoneutral, relaxed and quiet environment. Measurements continued for 20 minutes or until the participants became restless. All measurements, including the rest period, continued for 15 to 20 minutes. Participants were categorized according to the time when machine indicated steady state was achieved as either early, middle or late achievers. Readings before achieving the machine indicated steady state were eliminated. The intra-individual percentage coefficient of variation of the mean value for each of the gas exchange variables was determined for each category for the remaining period of the assessment. This slide illustrates how data were explained in Excel with a summary of the participant details, the ambient temperature and duration of the measurement, the time at which steady state was achieved and the data that was discarded prior to the achievement of steady state. 19 participants did not achieve steady state. For 13, data were either insufficient or implausible. The mean time to reach steady state was 5.7 minutes. Of the remaining 88 participants, 47 or 53% were early achievers of steady state, 29 were middle, and 12 were late achievers of steady state. This table summarizes the mean intra-individual percentage coefficient of variation of all REE-related measurements, with all values at 3% or lower. This study indicated that among children achieving steady state, most achieved this within the first five minutes of the measurement. Once steady state was achieved, the variability of all REE components remained below 3% for all subsequent measurements. Since this is well below the recommendations of 5 to 10% for adults, a shortened indirect calorimetry protocol can be considered for six to nine year old children. Thank you very much for listening and please do not hesitate to contact me should you require any further information about this research. My contact details are indicated on this slide. Thank you Adeline and I, I can just imagine the challenges of helping these children to reach a steady state. So well done for, for conducting that, that type of methodology. Um, our next presenter will be Mr. Julius Tambara from the Department of uh, Radiography and his title is the Proposition Towards Developing an Adult Chest Imaging Protocol for Lodox System at Trauma Units. We look forward to your presentation, uh, Julius. Julius will be joining us um, in a 
live session. Uh, Julius, are you there? Hello. Yes, I'm there. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, I'll just check you from my director. My slide now. All right. Um, I'm presenting on this topic, which is uh, the baseline uh, of my uh, PhD that is due um, in a few months. And I'm Jay Tambora. Uh, to just mention on the background of this study, uh, the LODOC system was developed by DBR Diamond Company, and its intended purpose was to, uh, to scan the workers that were working in the mining industry uh, to detect the smuggled uh, diamonds. So its intention was not uh, by use, uh, for use by the hospitals for scanning the patient. And this particular imaging tool has been used in the trauma unit. And the first place it was adopted was uh, at the Hreti Skiro Hospital in Cape Town. And uh, subsequently, it was uh, adopted for use by FDA and the European Union in 2002 and 2004 as adjunct screening tool at trauma unit. Its uh, advantage was uh, interest of uh, minimization of radiation on the patient, which we know has got carcinogenic effect. And its ability to scan from hand to toe in a very short time, that gave it a very good niche in the trauma unit. Uh, so currently we have 121 LODOX X-rays installations globally. 71 have been installed in North America, 46 in Africa, and 14 in the rest of the world. Of 121, we have 28 in South Africa. And of 26 in Africa, we have 28 in South Africa. So South Africa is the leading in terms of the number of these installations. Uh, the intended, the, the, um, the benefit of using the LODOX is uh, saving time. It was seen that uh, through research that it can scan patient within very short time from hand to toe and therefore there was no need of taking sectional or regional images. Also, it emits 10, 10 times less radiation. And also, of the same radiation that's used to produce the image of a particular region, a third of that radiation was the only amount of radiation required to be used by LODOX to produce the same quality of the image. And therefore, specifications that are required by radiation directorates are not uh, necessary. So, therefore, uh, we can use this machine for the use in trauma unit. Um, of the research that was done, uh, comparable to other modalities, uh, we were able to identify, it, it was identified by Dale and Bofant that chest, pelvis, and cervical spine could show uh, gross pathologies. And therefore, this machine was adopted as adjunct scanner. In 2008, it has shown that that percent of the patient what is scanned uh, on the same regional images, that uh, overturns the intended purpose of reducing amount of radiation for the, from this machine. So when the patient is refined for secondary images, um, that defeated the intended purpose of lowering the amount of radiation of the patient. So um, this is what actually led to me uh, coming up with the uh, the rationale, and I ended up doing a survey across all the South African hospitals, uh, of which the first question was to try and identify if they end their protocol or a guideline on what to refer and what not to refer uh, for secondary images. And we found out that 90% of the hospitals were referring patients for secondary images, which is defeating the purpose of this particular tool. And then there was no imaging protocol that was established in place in all the hospitals. 55% didn't have and 45 had the protocol in place. And then we wanted to know uh, which 
which of those regions are most commonly refined? We found out chest was among the region that was refined and it earned the biggest percent, which was 36%. And spine was the least with 8%. So therefore, the chest was the one that was acquiring additional radiation dose unnecessarily. Also, we wanted to know if they don't use it, if when they don't use it for uh, scanning a trauma unit, what else do they use it for? We found out there are various kind of uh, procedures that can be successfully done by the LODOC system. And this is also give me an impetus to think that you can use it for uh, scanning and you are successfully to identify some of the pathologies, but we needed to substantiate this by doing a much, much bigger study. We found out also from the question that in terms of the quality of the images from a radiographer's point of view, who is the technician that approves the images, which image was of higher quality? Was it LODOX or was it a conventional X-ray system? We found out that there was similarities in terms of the quality of the image, where for the 6% of the participants indicated that the chest dedicated images were similar to that of LODOX system. And we found out that the dedicated also was similar to conventional system by that 8% that of the participants. And that 8.5 said that full LODOX system was better than conventional X-ray system. So this is what led me to find out, uh, to do a much more advanced study in my PhD. And in conclusion, we found out that there's no uh, protocol or there's no guideline for using most of the trauma unit. Also, there is no referral pathway. And therefore, there was a need for development of this protocol that I'm doing now in my PhD. Thank you. Thank you, Julius, for your interesting uh, presentation. And um, uh, we look forward to some questions later as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce the next speaker uh, from the Department of Human Nutrition. It's LaSalle Kemp, and uh, she will be presenting on food insecurity intervention uh, preferences of undergraduate students at the University of Pretoria. Thank you, LaSalle. Good day. I am LaSalle Kemp, and on behalf of the team, I would like to thank you for listening to our presentation today. Our study focused on food insecurity intervention preferences of undergraduate students of the University of Pretoria. Food insecurity is a skeleton in the university closet. This is true internationally, nationally and at UP, particularly within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, which probably exasperated the problem. UP student preferences regarding food insecurity interventions were unknown. The aim of our study was therefore to determine the current food security status since the start of COVID-19, as well as the intervention preferences of undergraduate UP students. The methods employed used a quantitative descriptive design. Food security status was determined using the same instruments as previously used in South African and UP studies. The preferences were determined in a hypothetical case scenario based manner using a five point preference scale and ranking of the eight food insecurity interventions. Students could access an online survey by the using the Qualtrics software. This aligned to healthy living the UP way. All undergraduate students as enrolled at UP in April 2021 were invited to participate in compliance with the Protection of Personal Information Act. The results were as follows. Food insecurity according to the single item measure affected 40% of respondents. Using the multi item measure, we saw that 13% of students experienced food insecurity with hunger and 35% of students experienced food insecurity without hunger. For all respondents, we saw that the most preferred intervention was subsidized meals, whereas the least preferred was an outside food program. When separating these preferences by food security status, we saw that food insecure students most preferred university food gardens, followed by on-campus events and nutrition empowerment. Food secure students, on the other hand, preferred nutrition empowerment, followed by food waste awareness and then a university food garden. To conclude, food insecurity is prevalent at UP. Intervention preferences differed between food secure and food insecure students, yet the top three of both of these groups were found in the upper half of the preferences. 
Food insecure students preferred food gardens, whereas food secure students preferred nutrition empowerment. There is, however, agreement regarding the least preferred intervention, mainly outside food programs. The recommendation is to do a statistical follow-up with consideration during the current interventions to align with the Sustainable Development Goal number 2, namely zero hunger. And then lastly, it is important to listen to the voice of those who should benefit from an intervention. We would also like to thank all the UP institutions who supported our study, in particular Karlene Nau from the Department of Institutional Planning for her help. Thank you. Thank you, LaSalle, for highlighting this important topic also here locally at the University of Pretoria. Uh, we're going to move on to our next presenter, which is Karen van Nikkerk from the Department of Occupational Therapy. And her topic will be exploring the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the wellness of South African occupational therapists. We look forward, Karen. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Karen van Ikerk, and I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues from the Department of Occupational Therapy. The title of our presentation is Exploring the Impact of the COVID-19 Pandemic on the Wellness of South African Occupational Therapists. This presentation reports on part of a project undertaken by lecturers in the department, funded by the University of Leeds. The COVID-19 pandemic and resulting measures aimed at reducing infections have impacted the wellness of health professionals around the world. The WHO explains that wellness should be viewed holistically and that it is not only the absence of illness, but also a state of well-being. The well-being of professionals is an important factor influencing patient safety and occupational health. Wellness is viewed as an umbrella term that encapsulates all the dimensions of a person's life. We relied on the holistic wellness dimensions as identified by Miller and Foster as our theoretical framework. This framework describes 10 aspects of wellness. These include physical, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, occupational, environmental, economic, cultural, and climate wellness. The aim of our study was to explore the impact of the pandemic on the holistic wellness of South African occupational therapists. We conducted two asynchronous online focus groups to collect the data. Each focus group had eight qualified OTs as participants. The groups were held in the discussion tool of ClickUp. Each focus group spanned over six consecutive days with six questions asked during this time. Participants could answer or comment at any time that was convenient to them. The majority of the participants were female and provided services in Gauteng. Participants worked in the fields of physical rehabilitation, mental health services, vocational rehab and pediatrics. Occupational therapists working in private practice, as well as those employed by the Department of Health or Education, were recruited. The data were analysed using deductive thematic analysis, as described by Braun and Clark. This was done utilizing the dimensions of wellness as themes for the analysis. Analysis indicated that eight of the 10 dimensions of wellness were represented in the data. Wellness in terms of culture and climate were not referred to by the participants. I will now briefly mention all the themes and provide examples from the data. Emotional wellness focuses primarily around attitudes and beliefs about self and life. One participant mentioned that the pandemic had a negative impact on the emotional well-being of therapists, while another added that she experienced it as a roller coaster that often left her feeling anxious. However, in spite of the negative impact, several participants commented that they were hopeful that they would overcome this challenging time. According to Muller and Foster, environmental wellness refers to an individual's relationship with nature and community resources. It includes the importance of, for example, infectious diseases and secondhand tobacco smoke. Participants mentioned their concern of contracting the virus and being responsible for passing it on to service users at the workplace, 
or to family at home. Although participants described the challenges experienced at home due to, for example, additional childcare responsibilities that came about due to the closure of schools, they also described the additional time they had available due to the COVID restrictions as valuable. Intellectual wellness refers to the perception of and motivation for an individual's optimal level of stimulating intellectual activity. Although participants mentioned that opportunities for traditional skill and knowledge acquisition were minimized, many refer to how the pandemic provided ample opportunity for growth. These included, for example, having to learn the skills required to adapt to telehealth. Participants described utilizing their knowledge of occupational therapy theory to understand the behavior of service users and described implementing in their own lives the strategies that they would typically teach service users. Occupational wellness refers to the level of satisfaction and enrichment gained from one's work, as well as the extent to which one's occupation allows for the expression of one's values. Participants mentioned the challenges they experienced as their role as occupational therapists did not seem fully supported and recognized in the system. They found it challenging to maintain the level of care and expressed the, their uncertainty of best practice under the conditions. One participant did, however, mention that this time has made her more compassionate and committed. Physical wellness is particularly relevant where cardiovascular fitness, flexibility and strength are concerned. Several participants indicated the negative impact of the pandemic on their physical wellness. These included not sleeping well and becoming exhausted. However, participants described how they addressed this by paying better attention to their routines, sleeping enough, eating well and exercising. Economic wellness is briefly defined as having present and future financial security. Participants noted that it was costing them more money to offer therapy due to all the costs associated with PPE and infection protection protocols, while they were able to reach less service users. Many also noted that they were seeing a reduced number of service users, which resulted in a reduction in income. Miller and Foster describe social wellness as including the interaction of individuals with others, the community and nature. Participants commented that they struggled with isolation and that they found it difficult to interact while wearing masks. The limitations of the virtual environment were also highlighted. However, several participants mentioned the value of online support from colleagues and professional organizations. Miller and Foster describe spiritual wellness as referring to an inner resource that may give an individual a feeling of strength and that may become a guide to finding significance in life. Several participants experienced a loss of purpose in life but attempted to remedy this by adopting practices as, such as journaling, meditation and mindfulness. Again, the application of occupational therapy theory appeared to facilitate spiritual wellness. In conclusion, we can note that the pandemic has had both a positive and negative impact on the well-being of occupational therapists. Similar findings have been reported elsewhere, with the majority of international literature reporting on the impact of the pandemic on the emotional wellness of healthcare workers. This study highlights the broader impact on, for example, the intellectual and occupational wellness of OTs. Although the pandemic has had a considerable impact on the wellness of OTs, the study illustrates that OTs were able to show resilience. OTs applied their knowledge of OT theory and training to assist them in adapting to the challenges brought about by the pandemic in both their professional and personal lives. Here are our references. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Karen, for this insightful study. Um, we really appreciate you presenting here as well. We're running a little bit tight on the, on the schedule, so we're going to allow for two questions here from the audience. And we see our first question will go for Rubine. 
the question is, do you plan to make your study clinically usable or create a scoring system for ventilated patients? And have you already applied your results, um, your findings in the ICU? Good morning, Mr. Fulian. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, yes, definitely. That is why we also um, try to and recommend for future research also to go nationally because the study was only conducted in the Steve Big Academic Hospital in the medical and the trauma ICU. Then definitely to test the equation in other settings in the um, nationally as well as internationally. Um, to definitely then see if this can work for future uh, to contribute to the clinical setting and to assist with successful extubation. Um, currently, I am in consultation with the therapist in Steve Beaker to try and incorporate this in the clinical setting in the trauma unit. Thank you. This is great. Thank you, Rubina. And then our last question from the audience, we're going to ask for Puveshni. And the question is, do you think that, balance, uh, that the balance plate could be used in interventions with children with cerebral palsy who generally have extra cognitive and visual input? Thank you, Mr. Falloon. Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, I definitely think, and there have been some studies where the um, force plate has been used on uh, CP children, you know, in various studies on different participants all over the place. Um, so yes, it, it will definitely be beneficial. Um, of course, the cogn cognitive component, yes, does play a role as you do have to uh, instruct the participant to stand very still, um, you know, to not have a, 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 a too much of movement and to stand for a few seconds. Um, so there are different components that sometimes can affect the readings. Um, but yes, there has, of, of course, been many studies already, and um, we can definitely use it for a various range of, you know, children, adults, um, various neurological conditions. But other than that, you know, any other conditions as well, it's been used quite extensively with sport um, and other um, different uh, participants as well. So I think it's quite versatile. Thank you very much, Mr. Fulluan. Thank you very much for joining our session and I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Emmanuel again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carol Feliun uh, and your presenters for those enriching presentations. Um, I must add, you know, among uh, all those uh, presentations, I would just like to point out importantly that uh, uh, one about, uh, you know, food insecurity. Um, you know, I find it re relating very well because I know our uh, deanery, particularly our deputy dean for teaching and learning, and is uh, uh, responsible for driving the the food, um, uh, you know, drive and, and parcels for our undergraduate students, which has proven to be very, very useful. Because often we think that you know our students uh, have got all the resources that they want, but then. Once you conduct these studies, you then realize the depth of the problem, and that leads to the interventions that have been put in place. Um, and also, you know, we think of therapists uh, as people we should run to that don't have problems. When you have problems with COVID, we run to therapists. We, we uh, less think of them as human beings that have problems themselves, and they are also affected by COVID-19. And the study about the occupational therapists, uh, the, the, the impact that COVID-19 has had on them lays bare the challenges that they, they go through. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Carol Felyun, and your uh, presenters for, for those uh, uh, presentations. We will now take a short break before we continue with our program.
I'm the only child. Um, it's just me and my mom. We live together and we are close, we are best buds. My family and I are pretty close. Um, obviously we've had our ups and downs, you know, we go through a lot of things. Um, I think I have a really close relationship with my mother and my father. I wish we were closer to my mother stays in Limpopo, in a, uh, a rural village, and I haven't seen her in like seven months. They're the people that like get me through everything that I go through. You can't replace those people, the impact they have in your life. Guys are making me emotional here. <laughs>
Professor Sumaya Adam, which is the head of the clinical unit of obstetrics and gynecology. Dr. Rahaba Marima, which is the program manager of the Pan-African Cancer Research Institute of Pakri, and Dr. Melvin Ambale from the Institute of Cellular and Molecular Medicine. Thank you. Um, we can start with the questions. Uh, what impact has the lockdown had on the incidence, incidence and prevalence of cancer, such as new diagnosis and stage of diagnosis? Diabetes, cardiovascular disease, oral health, mental health, and burnout in, in, in healthcare providers. Well, maybe I can start. I'll talk a little bit about diabetes. I don't know much about the other conditions, if that is okay. Go ahead. Right, so, you know, I am not aware um, of publications actually recently looking at an increase or decrease in the incidence and prevalence of diabetes. I mean, what we do know is that if you look at the admissions due to COVID, hospitalizations, admissions, and deaths due to COVID, we do know that disproportionately patients with diabetes and obesity have been affected far worse than any other subpopulation or subgroup in our population. So um, we have also seen across the globe that uh, there are a number of new cases uh, are sort of um, uh, precipitated by COVID, if you want. So COVID precipitates new diabetes the exact mechanism is not unclear, and it's not known whether these cases might have presented, you know, in another way uh, with any other condition. But we do know that we have seen a number of new cases, uh, you know, who come in as COVID and then they're sort of found to be diabetic at the same time. Um, so I'm not sure that we've actually seen an increase in the incidence or the prevalence. It does, however, mean as the uh, initial chairperson uh, spoke that because due to screening and lack of facilities being available, et cetera, of course, it could also mean that the incidence and the prevalence would be actually less than anticipated in this time period because less people present themselves to the healthcare centers. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, what I think, I, you know, what a few, few uh, cents worth I have about diabetes in this time regarding incidence and prevalence. I don't know if anybody else can add to this. Thank you, Professor. Uh Prof. Kamisa, it's uh, Sumaya. Um, to add to that, um, I would agree with Prof. Rieta, what we're seeing on the pregnancy side is we're not necessarily seeing uh, an increase in the incidence or prevalence of diabetes or, or um, non-communicable diseases, but what we are seeing is that patients tend to present later uh, and there's also later referrals. So if it comes to hypertension and preeclampsia, we are tending to see more complicated patients. But COVID also makes it a bit more difficult because uh, some of the presentations of COVID may overlap with severe hypertension and HELP syndrome. And sometimes it's actually difficult for us to actually differentiate um, about what disease it really is. But also with these sick patients, management has post challenges. Um, Professor Paula Wood, do you have anything to add to this? Dr. Ambele? Um, hello, um, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this panel. So if I have to build on what uh, Professor Reda have said regarding the increase in uh, new cases for diabetes, I think the lockdown has a significant effect in terms of uh, mobility, so lifestyle changes. So that may be some of the uh, risk associated with the increase in the diabetes cases, like you get a lot of people now becoming overweight and obese, and uh, that may also, so I think the incidence for those cases might have increased, but in terms of the prevalence, I think the prevalence might have uh, reduced because the screening for those uh, non-communicable diseases have significantly reduced because uh, services or healthcare system has been reprioritized and redirected towards uh, attending to the pandemic with less attention being uh, paid to non-communicable disease. Thank you. And um, anything about cancers, uh, the diagnosis of the new cancers, the staging of the cancers that we see at this time related to the pandemic? And uh, uh, mental health in our uh, people that are staying in, um, 
in lockdown, as well as burnout in healthcare providers? Can anybody add something there? Yes. Okay. Do you want um, to go ahead? Uh, yes, please, Doc. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Prof, and good day to everyone. Um, I'd like to resonate with Dr. Mbele here that, um, yes, there might be evident de de declines in terms of prevalence, uh, prevalence in, 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 in cancer. Um, 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 however, in terms of incidence rates, both Global Can as well as the Institute, uh, International um, Agency for um, Research on Cancer, has shown both the increase in incidences of all cancers globally. And what saddens the most is that, you know, um, low to middle income countries are the most hardest hit with with, 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 the, with the cancer pandemic, with almost 30% increases in the incidence rates. However, with regards to the prevalence, uh, um, 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 because of, you know, um, 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 limit, limitations with, re with regards to access um, to healthcare um, facilities, those might actually not be showing the correct prevalence rates. Thank you. Feel about the uh, diagnosis, the stage of diagnosis and new cancers. Like when they come in, uh, is the stage much more advanced? Well, so if I can maybe come in there again, as you know, I work in the Department of Internal Medicine, and yes, we definitely do see these people presenting much later. We don't really have, you know, the statistics or the hard evidence, but anecdotally in our, in our admission wards, these patients are actually presenting much, much later for care, whether it's cancer or diabetes. So they are present, presenting at a much later stage when, uh, when curative treatment is no longer possible. Um, similarly, you know, we are losing patients uh, with cardiovascular disease and diabetes who are afraid to come to the hospital. So their clinical condition deteriorates at home. They're afraid that they will contract COVID when they come to the waiting rooms or to the hospital. So they stay at home um, and so I think we have an increased death as well, just because patients do not access the care. So for I think all across the board, all of these, I would imagine, uh, I can't really speak for the mental health people, but I can imagine that the same with people with psychiatric diagnosis or mental health problems also would be hesitant to access the system. Um, so I think across the board, diagnosis is delayed, care is delayed, and people present in a far more advanced stage. Thank you, Prof. Rieder. Uh, what about the impact the lockdown has had on the management of cancers, diabetes mellitus, uh, cardiovascular diseases, mental health and surgical procedures as well? Because now lots of procedures have been delayed owing to um, them being elective and not emergent, emergency procedures. And some cancers are actually, it's, um, they actually delay some surgical procedures in cancer patients. So uh, what has this impact had on the management of these cases? I think with pregnancy, uh, from my perspective, what we've been lucky with uh, is antenatal services have continued. Uh, so we've still managed to see our patients and those who do present uh, are getting adequate care. But uh, one of the bad sides of this, so to put it, to tie up with what you asked previously, is we've had to extend services. So we continued with normal services, plus we've had to uh, now cover COVID. So we're essentially running a dual service. And with uh, the problems at Charlotte, we've had to absorb high-risk patients. So on the obstetric side, it has put a strain on us, especially with sicker patients with being a tertiary institution. Uh, in terms of gynae surgery, uh, yes, there's definitely been an impact with seeing patients and uh, from the Ghani um, cancer perspective with seeing patients, but also with treatment and with surgical uh, management uh, because of lockdown and because of reducing surgical and elective services. So on our department, we've got the dual side of it with the Ghani side, we kind of struggling or having the challenge of keeping up or seeing patients adequately, but a dual service on the obstetric side. Prof. Rieda, would, like, would you like to add anything further relating to diabetes of cardiovascular disease as well? Yeah, I think, I think the challenge is, is that if you think how people come to surgery, people come to surgery because they have a clear direct surgical problem and they present to the Department of Surgery. 
But I would say that at least half of the cases presenting to surgery, whether it's cardiothoracics, orthopedics, urology, or whichever surgical discipline, they come, for example, via internal medicine where they need some definitive form of therapy. For example, a diabetic might have a diabetic foot uh, with a foot that needs debridement or a toe that needs to be amputated, etc. Or a patient has got a vascular problem and needs a vascular procedure. So that's all been severely limited and hampered by the downscaling of theater services, which was critical to do. I mean, we had no choice but to downscale the theater services in our hospital. But that, unfortunately, like I say, is not only detrimental to patients waiting for elective procedures, but it has also been detrimental to the care of people being admitted due to either cardiovascular disease, cancer, or diabetes. So it has definitely had an impact. Um, but I mean, I must also just take my hat off to our surgical colleagues who have still managed to prioritize and manage patients as needed, but definitely a, a huge challenge during this time. And to add a further note to this, what, um, what impact has this had on your personally uh, as far as burnout is concerned? Do you all actually feel like the burnout symptoms or any mental effects on your health with those working in the front line? Prof. Adam, Prof. Rieda, Prof. Paula Wood? I think if I could just come in here, um, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. I speak with a very different hat on my head today because I'm not a frontline worker. So I can sit in my office and, and do my work and I see my bio patients. I, I come with a hat with, of physical activity and exercise has been an important component in the management of non-communicable diseases. And what the lockdown has done is that it has reduced physical activity amongst the general population. We've definitely seen around about a 30% decrease in physical activity in the general population that's been reported due to the COVID pandemic. And this can be obviously because people have been forced by law, they've been uh, restricted to their homes, but also because closures of, of gyms and exercise facilities, swimming pools, restrictions to outside areas has been uh, limited. And that has all led to this decrease in physical activity. And I really worry about the future effect of this physical, the reduction in physical activity. I mean, we know just by reducing our physical activity, just to, you know, a few weeks, we have differences and changes um, physically and psychologically. And um, what is this 18 months restriction going to have in the future incidence and prevalence of um, non-communicable non diseases? I mean, that is something that we need to prepare for. I think um, not just, I agree with all the, 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 the speakers that the management is going to be affected, but I think we need to prepare ourselves for a, a, almost an increase in resurgence that's going to happen, um, you know, once COVID hopefully is over or even during COVID when we learn to live with it. Um, there's definitely going to be an increase. Thank you, Prof. Ward. Um... So if there are future lockdowns, what strategies or measures can be implemented to reduce the negative impact of the pandemic? Well, so if I can again say a few words, I think across the globe, uh, including in the US, Europe, and, and uh, the developing world, such as South Africa, what COVID has done it has just highlighted the glaring deficiencies in the current healthcare system. So even without COVID, the healthcare systems were suboptimal. And so when you look at sort of what can we do in terms of strategies and management uh, uh, methods to deal with this going forward, I think when you have a challenged healthcare system as we have on so many levels, then that becomes very, very difficult. So for example, the buzzword is telehealth. So the whole issue about virtual medicine, telehealth has exploded globally. But when you work in a country like ours, where access to data and Wi-Fi and internet, for example, is not that uh, common to the, in the general population, the population that we serve, then that becomes far less of an option. So, but of course, that is definitely something that needs to be explored. Some ways that patients can actually interact with the healthcare facility without physically coming onto the premises. I mean, that definitely, I think, is a plus. Um, in many ways. So I think that is something we definitely need to explore uh, moving forward. Um, 
the issue of, of, of sort of having uh, COVID-free areas or areas where people who are less likely to have COVID can go, for example, for consultational methods is a huge challenge because, of course, no one knows whether they have COVID. So you can walk around, uh, you know, as you know, for a number of days asymptomatically. So that, that is, I think, the huge challenge is where do you actually get help? But I do think the telemedicine virtual route is something that definitely would need to be explored and provides us with a number of opportunities also for research going forward. Thank you, Prof. Riyad. I think you've touched on one of the most important aspects. Uh, what about COVID-free areas in hospitals? I know that's also difficult because patients don't always know their status, uh, whether they're positive or negative. But that was one of the suggestions put forward, as well as uh, redirection of patients with non-communicable diseases to alternate healthcare facilities. Anybody can put anything further there? Um, I think if we look at the impact that the pandemic has, has had on uh, lives, it's been uh, very significant. And uh, we tend to realize that uh, uh, non-communicable disease actually plays an important role in terms of severity of uh, COVID-19 outcomes. So neglecting non-communicable disease actually worsened the management of, uh, the, of the pandemic. So we think uh, if we could better build a health system that actually integrates some of the non-communicable uh, services to provide a better way going forward on how to manage the, the pandemic. So if you have to create a, a COVID-free area, I think this also plays an important role in terms of uh, managing these non-communicable diseases and it, how it's going to impact on the uh, future pandemics or contracting COVID-19 and the outcome. Uh, professor spoke about the telemedicine, which is uh, very important. And I think that uh, needs uh, uh, an economic approach where people from low income settings might not be able to afford some of this technology. So I think uh, in urban settings, telemedicine can prove to be very beneficial. But if you look at other rural settings, I think providing COVID free areas might be very important in managing non-communicable diseases in times of pandemic. I think if I could just mention, um, I agree uh, with, uh, with the discussion that, you know, the access to data, et cetera, is a challenge. But I definitely um, would like to suggest that we get the buy-in from cellular companies. Uh, we got it when with students with zero-rated, um, you know, platforms for a while. Would it not be a strong enough drive um, with, with government and, and these cellular companies to ask for zero rated interactive health platforms or health apps, which are then accessible um, for a more in effective intervention to take place virtually? That might be something to investigate and see. Um, okay. yes, Go ahead, sorry. Sorry, just to, just to add, um, Prof, um, I've recently read an article by Penital 2021, um, 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 they highlighted um, how both um, COVID-19 pandemic as well as the NCDs um, are driven by similar upstream factors and, 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 and how currently these two pandemics share um, common resources. So while COVID-19 is being mitigated at the moment, they, um, they highlighted the long Long, the long-lasting devastating effects of, you know, um, the NCDs uh, being left unattended. So definitely we will need much more innovative methods to, to, to mitigate um, um, the devastating effects of NCDs. Thank I'd you. like to agree with that. And from the pregnancy uh, perspective with antenatal care, uh, there's been international publications looking at a virtual visit uh, outside the sort of core visits, and that's uh, shown to actually improve outcomes uh, and actually maintain that uh, patient, high risk patients are followed up. But I think we'd also have to explore the acceptability uh, of this sort of uh, communication or consultation with our patients. Uh, we have explored it a little bit uh, in some cases where we've got a geneticist who is distant from us, but that sort of consultation just doesn't lend itself. Uh, this is now screening for uh, 
antenatal uh, fetal abnormalities. And that doesn't lend itself to uh, the online consultation with our patients where you need a lot more expl explanation and a much longer consultation. So I think we probably do need to explore this a bit further, but also in terms of what's appropriate and what's acceptable to our patient population. Thank you. Um, one more thing that was mentioned was dispensing approaches for an NCD medicines. You know, these patients actually are on chronic medication, so we should actually make a, have another approach to actually deal, uh, handing out their medication to them. So that's another thing to think about as well. So with telemedicine being one of the things that we spoke about now, um, how, where can funding be sourced to upgrade our facilities and software to allow for non-conventional techniques to be used for diagnosis and management of patients with NCDs? Prof. Rieda, do you have anything to add here? Prof. Adam? Yeah, I think, I think as uh, Professor Wood has already mentioned, I do agree that I do think that we can actually approach, you know, the, the, the network providers, um, uh, you know, for this, uh, to assist in this, I think they would be quite amenable to this. Um, we can also, I mean, there's such an explosion in digital health at the moment. Um, there are some efforts to actually establish a, a chair in digital health at the university. Um, Telcom, of course, is an important role player. Um, so I think there are various sort of companies and, and, and various sources that we can, we can try and access uh, to assist with this. Um, yeah, so I think this would be important uh, because, but it's, I think it's far bigger than that. I think the issue is, is, is not just about the technology, it is about a mindset and, and, uh, uh, and whether this is feasible in our population. Um, it, it relates a lot to sort of, you know, things that we take for granted, many of our patients do not take for granted. I mean, I don't want to digress from the technology, but the tragedy is, for example, that the strong anti-vaccination uh, sentiment uh, also resides disproportionately in the elderly obese diabetic population. So at our diabetic clinic, we have very few elderly diabetic patients who have gone for the vaccination and who want to go for vaccination. So uh, in other words, it's not just about making technology available, but we will, they will have, uh, will have to be a whole re-education and, and we'll have to have psych psych psychological input, education input in actually helping our people make this transition to another mode of thinking and operating. So I think there are two things. It's the hardcore technology and funding thereof, but then also getting people to actually be comfortable with this kind of environment, as, the, as Prof. Adams also alluded to. So I think it's quite a challenge, but I do think it's something that we can address. Maybe this is also an opportunity to, uh, while looking at the digital, uh, well, the technology that's available, but also decentralizing our care of in, uh, uh, NCDs and actually upskilling uh, sort of lower levels or lower rungs on the healthcare system rather than putting the burden of all these diseases on the uh, tertiary level, but rather rethinking this and probably offering a consultatory uh, even in a, uh, in a using telehealth from that way also. So not all patients are referred, not all of them have to queue here. So uh, beyond uh, COVID also trying to relieve the pressure on our overburdened system by spreading it out a bit more and upskilling uh, and decentralizing some of our care. Thank you. Dr. Mbele, do you want to add anything? Prof. Wood, Dr. Marima? Yes, thank you, Prof. Um, I mean, from a scientific point of view, um, artificial intelligence and the implementation of it thereof in, 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 in public healthcare facilities is one of the major emerging global um, topics. So, um, well, sitting here from, you know, a, from a low to middle income um, country point of view, I might still be, you know, um, um, a bit further from us, but that's one, just one of the major innovative um, angles or approaches that we scientifically may be looking at um, in terms of um, future uh, interventions in our healthcare system. Thank you, everybody. I think we've reached our time. And thank you for listening in the session. And uh, thank you, every, the panel, the special experts today to, uh, uh, to chair in and to listen and to give us comments on their, point, on their expert experience. Thank you. Thank you.
neglecting non-communicable diseases worsens the impact of COVID-19 and therefore managing NCDs is important in managing COVID-19. Thank you, Professor uh, Razia Kamisa and your expert panel uh, for, for the insights uh, regarding that uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much. Um, we are now going to move over to the research showcase in the School of Healthcare Sciences. Now, before we move over to the research showcase, we'll first start with the promotional video for the School of Healthcare Sciences. Uh, uh, well, sorry, School of Health Systems and Public Health. Thank you. The School of Health Systems and Public Health at the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Health Sciences gives you the tools for advanced education, research, and consultancy in the many fields of public health. We endeavor to achieve the aims of the Sustainable Development Goals by preventing diseases and promoting and restoring health in Africa and globally. The school provides around 20 courses at diploma, masters, and doctoral levels. Health systems and public health rests upon four pillars. The first pillar focuses on the conditions in which people are born, work, and age, more specifically, dealing with the social determinants of one's health. The following pillar, disease prevention and control, extensively studies how well we can prevent the occurrence of diseases, prolong life, and promote better health for all. The third pillar aims to encourage healthy living and promote well-being in the population by using health promotion programs that are proven to be eco-friendly and sustainable. The final pillar, health policy and management, is a multidisciplinary field that focuses on improving the quality and access to healthcare for society as a whole. Public health is crucial to our future sustainability. With the correct governance, we are closer to eliminating the primary sources of inequality that led to the cycle of poor health. Make a difference and become a life changer. Enroll in a postgraduate program, including the new online postgraduate diploma at the School of Health Systems and Public Health with the University of Pretoria. The School of Health Systems and Public Health prides itself with diverse research on various public health issues, including non-communicable diseases, health systems, occupational and environmental health, and other determinants of health. The school is also home to the Diabetes Research Center and the Malaria Institute. Today, they will share some of their research with us. Now, the moderator for this is Professor Flavia Sinkubuge. Uh, perhaps I should also use the privilege of being the program director to congratulate uh, Professor Flavia Sinkubuge for being appointed the Deputy Dean for Stakeholder Relations in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Professor Flavia Sinkubuge is the chair of the Behavior and Management Sciences as the, at the School of Health Systems and Public Health. Professor Sinkubuge, the platform is yours. Thank you very much, um, uh, Doc, and thank you. It's really a great honor, Dr. Mate Batlela for us as the School of Health Systems and Public Health, on behalf of our chair, Professor Voy, to present to you our research. Our first presenter is going to be Professor Muzimkulu Zungu, and he will be talking about a rapid appraisal of the COVID-19 occupational health services response by four provinces in South Africa, using participatory action research to protect health workers during a pandemic. Over to you, Professor Zungu. Good morning. My name is uh, Muzimkulu Zungu. I'll be presenting on behalf of my 
colleagues. I am a joint appointment between the University of Pretoria School of Health Systems and Public Health and the National Institute for Occupational Health, the Division of the National Health Laboratory Service. I will be presenting to you today on our collaborative projects between the University of Pretoria, NIOH, and the University of British Columbia. Our title is A Rapid Appraisal of the SARS-CoV-2 OHS Response by Four Provincial Departments of Health Using a Participatory Action Research to Protect Health Workers During a Pandemic. The WHO declared the SARS-CoV-2 a global pandemic in March 2020. This as a result of the number of cases which have since grown exponentially to well above 200 million globally and well above 2 million in South Africa. Of importance for this presentation is that health workers are one of the most affected groups in South Africa and uh, they have about 8,500 hospital admissions of health workers and over 12% 12 of those have died. In our paper we decided to focus on health workers because they are at increased risk of the SARS-CoV-2 infection due to the nature of their job, but they also get infected because of community transmission. Essentially, health workers are one of the six building blocks of the health system and are essential for the provision of health services to others. And they are also in limited supply. And there's been international calls by the World Health Organization, the ILO, as well as ICO, for improved OHS for health workers as it is a matter of social justice. And South Africa has been trying to prepare for the OHS system for health workers since February 2020. Our study aims to explore the extent to which South Africa has been abiding by its legal and social responsibility to protect health workers from SARS-CoV-2. We're going to concentrate on two objectives, but overall the project had four objectives. We're going to concentrate on objective one, which is to evaluate the SARS-CoV-2 occupational health services by the provincial departments of health for health workers and to conduct an observational qualitative health risk assessment for SARS-CoV-2 in health facilities. This was a cross-sectional study design applying participatory action research conducted in Gauteng, Limpopo, Bumalanga and Northwest in the public sector. Sampling of the provinces and health facilities was done conveniently and participating health workers were purposefully selected. For data collection, we used interview-driven semi-structured questionnaire for objective one, and for objective four, an adapted WHO ILO HealthWise tool was utilized to conduct a qualitative observational health risk assessment. Double data entry and analysis was done on Microsoft Excel and further analysis done on Stata 16. Um, some of the analysis included logistic regression for modeling the associations. Our study had interventions embedded in it, hence it was a participatory action research to strengthen the occupational health services for health workers using the WHO ILO HealthWise tool and our study was approved by the Provincial Departments of Health and Participating Health Facilities as well as the Faculty of Health Sciences Research Ethics Committee at the University of Pretoria. Our results showed that 
combined the provinces represented 170,686 health workers. When we started with the study, um, 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 the four provinces combined had already 3,675 cases of SARS-CoV-2 among health workers. When we evaluated the provincial readiness for OHS, as we can see, most of the province were not ready for the protection of their health workers. We can see that in that um, while all the provinces had a SARS-CoV-2 plan, it did not have anything related to occupational health. Only two provinces had an IPC policy for SARS-CoV-2 in the health sector. And only one province had a budget and a coordinating team in place for SARS-CoV-2. We can see that most of the provinces did not have the required human resources, such as the doctor, the occupational hygienist, including the nurse. And the, none of the provinces had completed a health risk assessment, which is an indictment on the provinces. We found that 45 health facilities participated in our study, and these were representing 34,192 health workers. The researchers then trained health workers on the health-wise risk assessment using participatory action research and those that were trained included occupational health and safety practitioners, organized labor, health and safety committees, and facility managers. We found that during the risk assessment, none of the 45 health facilities participating received an acceptable health-wise goal. This health-wise tool is essentially like an audit tool but it's a simplified audit tool that allows anybody to be able to utilize it. And we can say that all the 45 health facilities had failed the simplified audit for health workers protection when it comes to SARS-CoV-2 at the time of the study. As an example, this is what we found in the accident and emergency departments of the participating facilities and in the red arrow you can see the percentage of facilities requiring improvement and for ventilation none of the facilities passed and when you look at administrative measures still majority and overwhelming majority of the facilities required improvements um, if you look at uh, PPE it is very disheartening that staff were not aware um, of how to utilize PPE in a health facility. So provincial departments of health with occupational safety and health SARS-CoV-2 policy were found to be significantly associated with having higher PPE utilization and higher ventilation scores when we were compared with the health wise scores. We also found that facilities with higher health wise compliance scores had significantly lower infection rates. So using the participatory action research allowed researchers to work with the health workers irrespective of job category to actively participate and be change agents for health worker OHS but we found that there's a clear discrepancy in resources but consistency in lack of implement implementation of IPC and OHS measures which is not surprising as similar studies have found the same for TB. There was a lack of occupational health and safety primary prevention like the risk assessment so we were not surprised because previous studies 
across the globe have found similar. There was lack of compliance with ventilation, administrative and PPE controls when we did the risk assessment. The study had several limitations which mostly were related to the fact that we used non-parametric sampling methods. And with that I would like to thank everyone and to acknowledge my fellow co-authors. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zungu, for that very interesting and absolutely timely um, presentation. Our next presenter is a student of the School of Health Systems and Public Health, Mr. Arthur Saitambao, and he will be talking about a framework to strengthen disease surveillance and response systems in Kenya towards timely prevention and control of endemic and newly emerging infectious diseases in Africa. Over to you, Arthur. Thank you so much, Prof. Flavia, for the introduction, and good afternoon to you all. The title of my presentation is a framework for strengthening disease surveillance and response systems in Kenya towards timely prevention and control of endemic and newly emerging infectious diseases in Africa, which formed part of the main outcome of my doctoral research. I'll start with a brief introduction, um, describe the framework in brief and end with relevant conclusions. As an introduction, health information systems permit information generation, analysis, and utilization of information that are critical for healthcare planning, agenda setting, and uh, resource mobilization. Even though sufficient progress has been achieved towards improving various surveillance capacities within the African context, there is minimal evaluation on um, the, the performance of surveillance systems focusing on neglected tropical diseases. And in addition, there's limited preparedness for newly emerging diseases such as COVID-19. Therefore, the main aim of the framework was to provide an acceptable logical approach to guide stakeholder actions to improve surveillance and response to preventive chemotherapy, neglected tropical diseases at subnational levels in endemic settings. And in extension, provide implications for adopting the proposed framework for preparedness and improved surveillance for other emerging diseases. The framework development process was in four phases, with the first phase involving a systematic review of relevant literature, focusing on assessment of uh, surveillance studies conducted within the African region, which identified key gaps that were addressed in the second phase, involving an assessment of surveillance core support and attribute functions regarding PCNTDs in endemic settings in Kenya. And in the third phase, using a Delphi modified Delphi, uh, study approach, we assessed the feasibility of implementing recommendations derived from the first and second phases at subnational levels. And finally, in the fourth phase, this involved a review of existing conceptual frameworks for strengthening health information systems and evaluation of public health surveillance system to derive logical components that went into the proposed framework. And focusing on the actual framework, it was linked to two core medical interventions, this being preventive chemotherapy and intensified case finding and disease management. And the framework was in two phases, with the first planned work phase comprising of human technical and organizational input and process components, leading up to the intended results phase, con constituting of distinct outputs, outcomes, and the desired impact. And at the framework validation phase involving various healthcare stakeholders at subnational levels, there was a clear interlinkage between various long-term outcomes and various impact components, this being reduced costs for treatment intervention, halted disease transmission and reduced disease burden, which together contribute towards PCNTD elimination. Therefore, the implications for adopting this proposed framework were one, to achieve integrated NTD control, effective implementation of target, targeted NTD response by focusing on at risk population, generation of useful information for accurate NTD burden estimation, and in achieving key NTD strategic objectives as outlined in various strategic plans. And some of the key opportunities presented by the proposed framework in terms of improving surveillance of other emerging diseases were strengthened case confirmation capacities, increased adoption of digital technologies for immediate reporting, improved surveillance data management, and enhanced human resource capacity for improved active case finding at primary care levels. And some of the key lessons and implications of the proposed framework on COVID-19 surveillance was the need to integrate COVID-19 data within existing health information systems, improved reporting and analysis to track virus circulation and inform targeted response, halted disease transmission through contact tracing cluster investigations, 
and finally monitor disease incidences, morbidities and mortalities over time to ascertain the overall disease burden. Therefore, in conclusion, novel strategies and frameworks which are in line with reimagining health research are crucial to address disease reemergence and initiation of rapid response to endemic and newly emerging threats. Ultimately, this proposed framework signifies proactive surveillance efforts, which are crucial to achieving disease elimination and adequate preparedness for future outbreaks. With that, I wish to acknowledge my supervisors and all study participants whose inputs led into uh, developing this framework. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Arthur Saitambao, um, for this excellent presentation. And colleagues, once again, please write your questions in the chat. And at the end of our research showcase, we will take all the um, questions together and um, direct them to the presenters. Um, the next presentation is by Dr. Elise Webb, Professor Paul Rieda, and Dr. Patrick Ngasa POT, and they will be talking about the great challenges require great innovations, the Twana Insulin Research Project as a force for change. Over to you, colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Flavia, and thank you, colleagues, for um, uh, your attendance. Um, I'm going to start uh, the presentation and then hand over to my colleagues. Um, okay, I'm just struggling now to go on to the next slide. I'm sorry, Flavia, I'm just struggling to um, switch over to the next slide. I'm not sure why. Am I on slide screen mode, Flavia, if you can just direct me? Mm -hmm. Yes, you are. So maybe you can just go into the next slide, slide two, and then put it on, um, yeah. Okay. And then. Is it on slide two now? Because I still see slide one on my screen. It's still on slide one. Oh, yeah. Um, Maybe you can start the screen share again, yeah. And then go into, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, you can use your keyboard, yeah, there we go. Am I on slide two now? You can just press it and then slide share. Uh, rather use your, rather use your um, keyboard, Elise. Okay, great. I've yeah, got it. Go. Okay, so um, I'm going to start off by just explaining uh, transdisciplinary research and the sustainable development goals in terms of diabetes. Um, and the idea is that we build upon disciplinary excellence, where multiple values and ideologies are used in knowledge generation through multi stakeholder debates serving as field validity of our research outcomes. And where we develop the research questions serving a very specific purpose. Um, collaborations should happen across disciplines with stakeholders and it's key to transdisciplinary research, yet very costly. Transdisciplinary research should lead to sustainable science and in-depth understanding of the research problems addressed. 
the specific sustainable development goals addressed by our diabetes team at UP will be number two, number three, and number four. But we would like to focus specifically on number three, the good health and well being. And um, our sustainable development goal number 3.4 specifically states that by 2030, we want to reduce by one third premature mortality from non communicable diseases through the prevention and treatment and promote mental health and well being. So, the challenge with diabetes is that. Um, if you look at the global projections for the diabetes epidemic from 2000 to 2013 in millions, in the world there's a predicted increase of 213%, but in sub-Saharan Africa, specifically where we are, the increase predicted is 261%. So just to focus in South Africa specifically, at the um, in, in the 2017 Stats SA mortality report, diabetes is listed as the second highest cause of, of mortality after TB, which represents 5.7% of all deaths. And very importantly, it's um, the current leading cause of death in adult women in South Africa, representing 7.3% of all deaths. The uh, global estimate for the national prevalence of diabetes in South Africa, um, data 2019, is 12.8% with a, quite a wide confidence interval um, that you can see there. The diabetes research, um, the question is where did it start at UP? And it started actually at um, our hospital uh, 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 care um, colleagues who recognize that there's an overcrowding at the outpatient clinics without them being able to move patients to a lower level. And the question was raised, let's look at what diabetes care looks at the primary health care clinics um, in South, in Swanee district specifically. So we started off with the diabetes bus study from 2012 to 2015. And there we involved uh, the School of Public Health, the Department of Internal Medicine, the, and to a lesser extent, the Department of Family Medicine. And with the funding received from Nova Nordisk, we established baseline data for diabetes care. We then set up the Tswani Insulin Project, which started in 2018. Um, we, we have the School of Health Systems and Public Health, the Departments of Internal Medicine, Family Medicine, Sports Medicine, Human Nutrition, Nursing, and our funder, uh, Lily, for a five-year project, um, specifically focusing on insulin um, and insulin initiation. And that then um, brought about the UP Diabetes Research Center that was established in 2020, which is now across faculties, um, specifically involving our faculty, the Economic and Management Sciences faculty, as well as Humanities, specifically the Ada Department of Psychology. So from the diabetes study, um, we were able to provide baseline data for measuring the quality of care at primary care level, as well as the levels of screening for diabetic related complications. We enrolled in a cluster randomized control trial 600 patients. And basically our key findings was that only 7.9% of patients seen in primary care were correctly managed. At least 82% of them needed a change in their treatment and 10% were actually referred up for hospital care. Screening for complications was very low. Screening for diabetic uh, uh, eye diseases was only done in 8% of patients. Screening for foot complications was only done in 6%. Kidney uh, damage was screened for, but using only dipsticks. And um, blood pressure was recorded for only 67% of diabetic patients and lipograms, the cholesterol, um, uh, profile was only done for 26% of patients. So um, from the bus study, it became very apparent that 70% um, of our diabetic patients seen in primary care had, were completely uncontrolled in terms of glucose, blood pressure, and lipids. I'm now going to hand over to my uh, PhD student, Dr. Patrick ngassa Biotti, that's going to take, tell us about the uh, Twani Insulin Project. Thank you, Dr. Webb, and uh, thank you, Dr. Flavia and the uh, audience. Uh, yeah, indeed, as Dr. Webb had already indicated, the UP-20 project was launched in 2018, 
but the actual activities started in January 2019 after we secured the appointment of uh, colleagues who are act, uh, clinical associates and nurses. And uh, as indicated, it's funded by the company Lilly based in the US through the Lilly Global Health Partnership. Uh, the focus here is the challenges and barriers to insulin initiation and titration in primary care in the 20th district. As indicated by Dr. Webb, from the previous studies, it was found that those patients who are in need of insulin, as we know, type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. The research has found that about 50% of the patient after 10 years will need to be on insulin. So in the primary care system, those patients are the one with the worst glycemic control, and as well as those patients who need to transition from oral drugs to insulin. So it's really a problem that we felt need had to be addressed with this program. It's a five-year multi-phase uh, uh, pro research program. And as indicated by Dr. Webb, these are all the departments involved from School of Health System to Internal Medicine and Human Nutrition. Actually, uh, on the ground, the actual team that is dedicated as a full-time workers is constituted by program managers, nurse coordinators, and about six, six field researchers. The phases that we, we employed to, to implement this program, we had first a planning phase where we reviewed the literature. It was part of my PhD and also the guidelines for diabetes management, asking questions like what are the hurdles in the guidelines that, are, that can be an impediment to initiating insulin in primary care. And one of the guidelines the, the, the guideline challenges or hurdles identified was the fact that only doctors can initiate insulin. Then we went to on the ground and we did some baseline surveys. We spoke to doctors, to nurses, as well as to the people living with diabetes to kind of understand what are the challenges around, around insulin and in going on insulin. One of the findings there is that the big majority of the patients are actually scared of going on insulin because of fear of needles and socioeconomic challenges. And the fact that the government were not providing glucose meters and strips to those patients that need to be initiated on insulin. Then after that, as a team uh, constituted, as mentioned before, by all those people from those departments, we designed the intervention that could address that, those challenges. And we brought in the stakeholders, our local and health, national health authorities, Swanage Street, Houghton Province National Health, as well as people living with diabetes in the conversation to really come up with a solution that can be suitable for the, our context. And yes, indeed, this is a public-private partnership. We have UP on one side, Department of Health uh, on the other side, as well as our funder, Eli Lilly. The next phase was then the implementation. Here we use a sociological theory of implementation called the normalization process theory of MP or NPT that have been used in other similar type of work where the belief is that new practices are normalized as participants work and engage with it and make sense of the, of the work. So then we move on to the evaluation actually of the actual intervention. The evaluation was done in different steps. We first started with a feasibility or pilot trial that we implemented in 2019 going into 2020. After the trial, we had a session of with, among the, the, the work, health, the field workers and the management in terms of a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of the intervention. What can be done? What can be done better to improve the implementation of the, implement, of the intervention? And currently, we are uh, implementing the large scale trial and I will be doing some words on it. Our intervention is embedded within the integrated chronic disease management model. As you can see on these pictures, there is a facility level intervention where we provide uh, uh, management uh, training on management of, of people with diabetes, and we support the nurses and the doctors at the facility. We improve or we, 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 we promote better coordination of care. Then the innovation here is the individual level intervention, where we go into the homes of the patient with the community health worker. We take time to educate and empower this, those patients and really to boost their confidence in terms of managing their own disease and as well as manipulating insulin, having to inject themselves, having to test almost twice a day and stuff like that. 
and also a key feature here is that during those interaction in the home, the family tends to join in. So that improves the family support and that patient is not feeling isolated anymore. Then we have a community level intervention where the community health workers that are trained in better diabetes care can raise awareness and kind of uh, combat at their level despite the challenges, the, 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 the myths and the, 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 the misconceptions around diabetes in the communities. We believe that this is a really a model that has the potential to be implemented everywhere in the country as the integrated chronic disease management model is approved and is adopted by the, the National Department of Health. Next slide, please, Doc. So here, in terms of the preliminary results from the, 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 the feasibility study, we didn't want to bring in the, the, the statistics because of the limited time, but we felt that less the people who have been working and in, engaged in the intervention to talk for themselves. For example, we have this quote from a nurse who says that she likes the way the patient are followed up at home, referring to that individual, first, um, individual level intervention, and patient dosage can be changed whenever necessary. You need to understand that when you put a patient on insulin, that dose needs to be titrated to reach an optimal dose. And in the system at the moment, that titration happens only once a month, if it does happen in the facility. Having the visit at home, we can do it once a week when we're using telehealth. The, the patient has been taking his, his, his values. When the community health worker visits, those values are sent to a mobile app to the doctor and the doctor gives the instruction whether to increase by two units or to decrease by two units. And this has been shown to work. And uh, as you can see, the nurse is happy with that, with that innovation. Then we have people living with diabetes who say that the one says she likes or he likes the fact that he will receive visits at home. As we say, if you put in mind the way the, the, the diabetes care is delivered in the primary care system, there is not really opportunities for one-on-one, -on -one, optimal one-on-one -on -one with the, the healthcare professionals because of limited time and because of our overburdened healthcare system. But having the patient to be at home in the comfort of his house, there is that time to discuss and to really bring that patient knowledge to a, a, a good level. And they really respond positively to that. Another nurse mentioned that the fact that patients receive those trips and meters, as we mentioned, that was a really big challenge in terms of initiating those patients on insulin in primary care. But thanks to the advocacy that the CHIP group has been doing with the Department of Health, we can announce that there's been a great victory whereby starting in September, people with diabetes can access for free glucose meter and strips in the clinics or in the local clinics. And we really believe that this is a game changer and that will really improve the care of those people who are being put on insulin. The last quote that I want to share with you is this patient who testified to say that CHIP assisted her. She can now control her glucose level. She, she received information that were empowering and helped her to control her diet to the knowledge she received. And we really believe that this is also a really key component of this intervention where the patient over time feel empowered and feel really part of their, their own care. What's next for us is to continue with the implementation of the, 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 the CHIP intervention. We've already uh, been working in at 19 primary care facilities in the 20 district, that is about 60 primary care facilities. We have almost 70 patients that are put on insulin and that, is, that was done safely and the care is improving. But also what we realized is that we couldn't focus only on that pool of patients that are in need of insulin. There's a number of patients that are stagnating on oral drugs and that were not doing well for various reasons, including clinical inertia. Having our colleagues going to the facility, we can bring those patients to the attention of the healthcare professionals and they treatment is optimized, meaning either a drug, another oral drug is, is, is added, or we, they are moved to the, to the maximum drug so that we can eventually put them on insulin in the future if the glycemic control is not achieved. The target is to reach the 300 patients, that's for the initiation, but from our experience, before you reach one patient to put on insulin, you're gonna probably affect anything from 10 to 15 patients that may be my, my need optimization of their treatment. 
Lastly, in parallel of this uh, work that we're doing in facilities, we are also providing training in insulin and in diabetes management and hypertension in primary care. And so far in the year, we have managed to reach 152 patients um, despite uh, the, the, the interruption for, from COVID. Indeed, the COVID-19 has been affecting the implementation of the program, but we, we managed to go around it and bringing new innovations. Thank you, and I'll give uh, pass to my prof, Prof Hira. Right, thank you. If I can continue then just to say a last few words, because I know our time is up on the University of Victoria Diabetes Research Center. This center was approved by Senate at the end of last year, and it was actually built on all the existing partnerships that had developed over the last couple of years. We had been working with sports medicine, sports sciences. We had been working with uh, human nutrition. We had been working with the Department of Nursing. And then across, of course, with the School of Public Health and the Department of Internal Medicine. So we have uh, expanded this now and consolidated all of this into a research center with the aim of improving our care of our patients with diabetes. So it's actually about clinical improvement. In other words, preven prevention, detection and treatment so that we could improve the quality of life, decrease morbidity and mortality. So the research center in broad strokes consists of a number of clusters which focus on either the prevention or the management of diabetes, management in primary care, management in hospitals. Then we have a very strong gestational diabetes group um, led by uh, Professor Adam. Um, and then we also have a focus on diabetes in, in children and uh, adolescents uh, run by or, or driven by our pediatricians. And then there's a strong focus also on enhancing diabetes technology in taking care of our patients with a lot of possibilities. So, of course, diabetes per definition, the diabetes management is multidisciplinary. So we will continue to expand uh, collaboration with many other departments and many other faculties. As COVID-19 has highlighted the enormous risk associated with obesity and diabetes, it's also provided us with new challenges to actually explore treatment modalities and detection modalities. So we will continue with our unit to focus, you know, how we can extend across faculties as mentioned, working with, for example, the Department of Marketing, uh, Department of Education, Psychology, et cetera. And of course, we have a huge funder in terms of the Lilly Global Fund that's funding us at the moment, but we will also explore other funding mechanisms to actually make our research possible to increase and improve, uh, to actually improve the uh, quality of life of our patients. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Rieder, Dr. Elise Webb, and Dr. Patrick Ngasa, PRT, for that groundbreaking research that I have no doubt will have great changes um, in our health system. Colleagues, once again, um, you are welcome to post your questions under the banner, which is written on Ask a Question, and we will then um, pick them up and um, uh, ask the, the colleagues to, the presenters to answer them. Our next presenter then, colleagues, is uh, Mr. Adeyemi Adewale, and he will be speaking about primary results for PM 2.5 sampling across some cities of South Africa and also from SADA countries. Over to you, Adeyemi. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, today, I would like to talk about the preliminary results from PM 2.5 sampling across some cities of South African and Saudi countries under the leadership of Professor Janet Wittmann. I've just talked about the overview, why the study is important and all that. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, okay, thank you. 
Um, by way of introduction, we need to look at the magnitude of the problem that we are facing all over the world. It's not only in South Africa. In 2014, the World Health Organization identified that air pollution as identified air pollution as the world's worst environmental health risk. In lieu of that, it was estimated that 7 million people die prematurely every year. That is one in eight deaths globally. And this is more than what is recorded for HIV, TB, malaria combined together. In South Africa, the start essay also reported a 17.3, 10.0, 6.5, and 8.6 of nearly 454,000 deaths that occurred in 2014 were due to cardiovascular, circulatory, uh, cardiovascular and circulatory, respiratory, metabolic disorder, and cancer, respectively. Now, what has this air pollution caused to the world, even to South Africa? This has impacted the economy of the nation, it has affected the quality of life, according to WHO 2016. Then why is this study important? It was also reported that, it was also reported by WHO that there is no air quality program in Africa, but exists in other WHO region in Europe, in America. Now, there is also limited availability of information on exposure to air pollution and its effects on health of the people. So it is very important. Now, we have been hearing about the Sustainable Development Goal of 3.9, that is, we want to reduce the death and illness from hazardous chemical substances, from soil pollution, from here, and this is from the basis of this research. Now, exposure assessment. Uh, we have several locations and sites where sampling are ongoing currently. And if I may say, this study actually started in 2017 when I started my PhD, which I conducted sampling for, for a year. And this study was taken further with the, with the leadership of my supervisor to extend this sampling to some cities in South Africa and also certain countries. So right now in South Africa, sampling is ongoing in Brit, uh, in Northwest, in Cape Town, in Kempton Park, in Kimberley, in Port Elizabeth, and in Pictoria. In Pictoria, the sampling has been ongoing since 2017. It has not stopped up to now. And some of the side countries that we have covered, that is being covered now in Lesotho, Namibia, Swaziland. And sampling, will, we believe that will commence soon in Mozambique. Ethical approval for these studies will obtain from the faculty. Now, this is just some of the pictures of the sampling sites. We have the upper one in Lesotho, and this one is the one here in Victoria at the rooftop of our building. And we have this in Cape Town, and this is what is going on in Namibia. Now, like I said, this is a preliminary study. The result is not yet, uh, it's not fully. So the study, it started around May and is going to continue till around June next year. So this is just some of the little results that we've gathered from the students that are sampling in all the location. Now this is what we what we did here is to compare the concentration of what we got with the WHA, uh, WHO standard and the South African standard. Here in Brit, we can see that well, the we can say the uh, the concentration is a little bit above um, the South African standard around uh, June. Then the other ones, just one point, uh, one of the days were above uh, the WHO standard. So we can see that the here is still a bit, is within the WHO daily limit. Now this is what we have in Cape Town. The concentration are far below the WHO uh, guideline, 
and it was reported that most of some of the days when sampling took place, there were there was rainfall, so that actually limits the concentration of what were recorded. Now to Kempton Park, uh, it's only a day that exceeded the WHO standard. So the other concentration were below the WHO standard. In Kimberley, the concentration is a very, very low, is very low compared to uh, the daily limits for WHO. And in Port Elizabeth, similar experience was recorded. The concentration were also low, but we hope to see the true picture at the end of the study, what happens because this period, uh, the period of the sampling falls within the autumn and um, early winter. Now, this is what we have in Victoria. Most of the concentration were above the WHO standard. Now, the next graph shows what the result obtained during my PhD that was for a whole year. Sampling were taken every third day for a whole year. So we can see that the concentration, we have far exceedances on during the autumn, late autumn and winter. We can see that it was above the South African standard, then above WHO standard. So it's only during um, uh, spring, summer, that we have concentrations that were actually lower than the WHO guideline limit. Now, this is what is going on in Lesotho. Just only a day so far actually exceeded the WHO daily guideline, uh, the WHO daily limit. And this is what we have in Lesotho. This point still need to be investigated because this is far, far, far above what is permitted. Even is far above the, uh, the annual WHO standard. So we need to investigate what actually went because this was a sharp increase and actually went down again. So further investigation on this will be conducted and that will be dealt with. Thank you. These are my references. Then I would like to acknowledge the students that took part, that are taking part uh, in the sampling. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adewale, for those interesting results. Our next presenter is Megan Reading from the University of Pretoria Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control. And Megan will be talking about mosquito bone vector epidemiology and One Health in High Burden Malaria Villages in Vember District. Over to you, Megan. Thank you so much, Prof, and good afternoon to all. Uh, I'm just trying to share my screen, but it's not allowing me because somebody else is sharing. Um, Adewale, can you stop sharing? There you go, Megan. Thank you so much. So good afternoon, all. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Megan Rinn from the University of Pretoria Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control. And today I'm going to be giving a brief overview of recent research we performed based on mosquito-borne vector epidemiology and One Health in High Burden Malaria Villages in Vembe District in Popo Province. Just to start with a brief introduction, malaria in a nutshell, we know it's a deadly and complex disease. It's a major public health concern. It's a disease of poverty, despite it being both preventable and treatable. It's confined mostly to tropical areas, and it forms this integrated intermix of three biological systems, namely the human, the female Nopheles mosquito vector, and the plasmodium parasite. Within this integrated intermix, there's also complex life cycles, habits, environmental preference, and pathogenous profiles. So UP's response to malaria is the University of Pretoria Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control. The UPISMC is a transdisciplinary research entity focused on all aspects pertaining to sustainable malaria control. It provides a holistic approach to looking at malaria. 
and it performs research collaboration across UP faculties and with external partners across three main clusters, mainly the human health, parasite control and vector control, as you can see in the in the left of the, of the screen, and the disciplines that interplay between these. The research performed aligns with the National Department of Health Strategic Malaria Elimination Strategies, as well as the SDGs. And for more information on the Institute, please look at our introductory video on the Faculty Research Day virtual event page. So my work falls within the vector control, and I'm going to give a brief overview of research we conducted last year that was focused on a transdisciplinary collaborative approach towards One Health, and it involved the University of Pretoria multiple faculties, National Institute for Communicable Diseases, and the South African Weather Service services across multiple disciplines. And this was performed because it's been found that surveillance of vector-borne diseases exemplifies a One Health approach because it entails coordinated, collaborative, multidisciplinary, and cross-sectoral approaches. So the aim of our study was to collect essential data on mosquito-borne disease entomology and One Health during the COVID-19 health crisis. And this was aimed to understand mosquito community composition for vector incrimination, to identify climatic and environmental factors, and to understand the effect of pandemic on the malaria burden. We also aim to mentor students to build capacity, as well as to build collaborative transdisciplinary networks to address One Health with regards to mosquito-borne disease. Our site selected what fell within the Limpopo province, one of the three remaining endemic um, malaria endemic provinces within South Africa. And we focused on the Vembe district, which is located on the northeastern border, as this is a high malaria burden region. And we looked at six sites of high malaria incidence to population ratio. The area that was selected has also had previous reports of arboviral occurrence in both humans and animals. Our research methods focused on a field collection event in October 2020, where we did mosquito collection, uh, uh, adult, adult mosquito collection through multiple CO2 beta traps, as you can see occurring on the right, include, uh, including larval collection and breeding site mapping. We then identified all species collected morphologically as well as molecularly, and performed circumsporozoic ELISA detection in female nophilines for falciparin detection, as well as arboviral screening of pooled female culicine species. We also then looked at the climatic environment and environmental and COVID-19 impacts. This was done through the use of historical malaria case incidents provided by the Provincial Malaria Control Program, as well as looked at climate and environmental driver investigation with the inclusion of climate and environment data from SOARS and NASA. And this was all combined to identify contributing factors in isolation and combination in case incidents. Our research outcomes included the collection of over 2,500 mosquitoes, across six genera, and we collected upwards of 40 species. The predominant genera was Anopheles, which is our, our genera of concern with regards to malaria. And we also included a number of individuals within important morphologically indistinct groups, such as Gambi complex, as well as Finestas group. We also collected arboviral uh, genera of importance, in including Culex, Monsonia, and Ides. Interestingly, our research showed that in terms of malaria, there was very low primary vector presence, which is extremely important to understand in terms of why there's persistence and continued tr transmission. However, there was known secondary vector presence, as well as presence of implicated secondary vectors that have been implicated in other African countries, but not yet in South Africa. And fortunately, we could not um, identify any plasmodium for vector incrimination. We also were able to identify a number of known arboviral vectors. You can see them in blue on the bottom right. And we were able to de detect positive arboviral pools, which are still undergoing processing. The research also allowed for the geospatial mapping of breeding sites uh, through the detection of multiple breeding sites across our, our selected study area. And this also included the mapping of sites of known arboviral and malaria vector species. And all entomological data has gone to contribute towards the annual malaria vector surveillance port, report, as well as the SADHIS2 system towards decision making and influencing and informing of policy. In terms of our climatic, environmental, and COVID 19 impact, we found a clear indication of seasonality of our malaria burden. And minimum temperature and maximum temperature lagged at 40 days and 60 days respectively were found to positively correlate with malaria incidence and actually drive malaria occurrence. 
And of course, rainfall anywhere above five millimeters lagged at 90 days appeared to be a trigger for malaria incidence. We also found that summer seasons, which is the rainy season, across multiple high case occurrence years, which were quite a, a number of years from 2011 to 2020, coincided with the occurrence of tropical cyclones over the Mozambican Channel. So these um, incidences of tropical cyclones were drivers for high malaria burden each year. However, we did not find a significant effect of COVID-19 on malaria incidence. We were also able to perform additional activities uh, during the research, and this included community engagement where we worked with local female research assistants. We also held meetings with chiefs and headmans of our chosen communities and village sites. And this was performed to engage, educate, obtain feedback on their current challenges, as well as to discuss the research. We also performed capacity development, and this was done through the mentoring of no less than, po uh, than four postgraduate students in all aspects of the research. And this was done to address the current global medical entomologist deficit that is being um, experienced. So in conclusion, the, the most interesting outcome was the seeming rare, rarity of primary vector species within our, our study area. And this may implicate recognized secondary vectors such as, as venedonai, which was identified and has been implicated in South Africa, or it may implicate, implicate other secondary vectors that have been identified in other African countries, but not yet implicated in South Africa, which is extremely important when it comes to vector control. There was also a clear, clear indication of seasonality in the malaria incidence, and these triggers with regards to rainfall and high malaria burden linked to tropical cyclones. The occurrence, of, the identification of minimum and maximum temperature being lagged as a significant um, determinant of case incidence is not um, surprising as temperature plays an important role on both the vector and parasite cycles. And an example of this is the extrinsic incubation period, which occurs in the mosquito, which we found was likely to reduce at temperatures above 20 degrees in the in Bembe district. However, our lack of parasite detection necessitates further investigation and surveillance in the region. And this is going to be required to determine the role of present vectors and to understand the determinants of malaria incidence so that we can supply targeted, successful, and timely control within the region and the remaining malaria burden areas in South Africa. I'd just like to quickly acknowledge our collaborators, our funders, and our wonderful student and staff team that participated within this research. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Megan, again, for an interesting piece of work, and we look forward to reading the publications. Um, Program Director, uh, Dr. Matsebatlela, I know that we are over time, but I'd like to beg your indulgence. We have one more presentation. Um, and before I call on Ms. Naledi Megwa, I want to say to the audience that, again, just to remind you of the CPD points, that you can get CPD points and you just go on to the accreditation tab and you type in the code HSU, H for home, A, S for sugar, U for umbrella, so HSU472. And now colleagues, our last presentation as a school is from Ms. Naledi Megwa. And Ms. Megwa is from the UP Environmental Chemical Pollution and Health mm -hmm. Research Unit. Over to you, Naledi. Now, lady, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, can you please confirm that you can see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. If you can just go to presentation mode now. Um, it's in presentation mode, but hold on.
Is yes, it in presentation can... mode? Perfect, please go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Naledi Mehwa and I'm from the Environmental Chemical Pollution and Health Research Unit. And I'm going to be talking to you about effect-based monitoring for water safety planning. The water industry faces a lot of challenges to ensure a sustainable and safe supply of drinking water as surface waters can contain a wide range of chemicals referred to as micropollutants. And some of these can be endocrine disruptors, which are defined as compounds that may interfere with the synthesis, secretion, transport, metabolism, receptor binding or elimination of hormones and therefore altering the endocrine and homeostasis system. Some of these chemicals include industrial chemicals such as PCBs, personal care products like phthalates, food contact materials such as BPA, agricultural chemicals such as DDT, pharmaceutical drugs such as estradiol. As mentioned, these endocrine disruptors have the ability to interfere with the action of hormones. They do this by interacting with or activating hormone receptors that be membrane or nuclear receptors, um, such as en on androgen, estrogen, IRA, hydrocarbon, thyroid hormone receptors, etc. The hormones in purple act as ligands for receptors, which can bind directly to DNA or indirectly via transcriptional factors to regulate gene expression. Hormone making chemicals in green can be agonistic leading to the stimulation of transcriptional activity or they can be hormone blockers leading to the inhibition of transcriptional activity. There has been a growing list of emerging chemicals which once released into the environment are subjected to photo chemical and or biotransformation resulting in multiple transformation products, including metabolites and disinfection byproduct. The complex mixtures of these chemicals in water means that the target chemical analysis alone cannot assess the total chemical burden and or detect the very low concentrations or assess the potential long-term effects. To address the limitation of chemical analysis, the new focus in the water sector is applying effect-based monitoring using effect-based methods for water quality assessment. This involves using, making use of in vitro assays, using mammalian cell lines, bacterial strains, or low complexity in vivo bioassays to detect the biological activity of the water sample. The bioassays can account for mixture effects and are risk scaled in that more potent chemicals will have a greater effect in the assay. The following are examples of the different kinds of tests that you would do for the different endpoints. The GWRC report suggests these three essays for xenobiotics, for example. However, some of these essays are costly, but the University of Pretoria and some South African institutes have alternatives that are also acceptable. The University of Pretoria is involved in the GWRC project through the WRC funded project that runs concurrently with the GWRC project that has been adjusted for the South African scenario. The GWRC is an NGO that serves as a center for the global collaboration for research planning and, ex and execution on water and wastewater related issues and the following are the members of the organization. The, D the GWRC initiated this project to demonstrate that EBM tools can be applied in practical settings, and the project aims to develop user guidance documents for operators and local authorities to collect experiences with the use of EBM tools for a selection of case studies, as well as provide documentation on EBM in water safety planning to policymakers. The ultimate goal of the project is to have a more efficient implementation of bioanalytical tools in the water safety plans across the global water sector. There are six work plans for this project. Project one involves setting up the project team. Work plan two is policy framework, which involves distributing service to stakeholders. Work plan three is to 
tools and methods, four is case study experiences, five is water safety plan protocol development, and six is dissemination and education. However, for this project, I will only be focusing on work plan two and four. For work plan two, a list of reliefs and the project aims to develop user guidance documents for authorities and local authorities to collect experiences with the use of EBM tools for a selection of case studies as well as provide documentation on For Work Plan 2, a list of relevant stakeholders were identified. The GWRC had initially compiled a questionnaire on risk-based and effect-based monitoring. This questionnaire was slightly changed for for the South African stakeholders, which included uh, water utilities, policymakers, public institutes, and commercial labs. The GWRC questionnaire was distributed to more than 300 stakeholders in 35 countries and received 63 responses. The South African questionnaire was sent out to 100 with the 15 responses. As indicated, majority of the stakeholders uh, that responded are involved in public institutions and universities and are most likely more receptive to EBM. The survey consisted of 30 questions and in the interest of time, I have included ones that I think are important. When asked if they are satisfied with the current water quality monitoring and risk management approaches, 14% uh, of South African stakeholders didn't have an opinion and 36 compared to the 59% of the global stakeholders answered rather no or not at all when asked if they think that MBM can support water planning. 85% of South African stakeholders answered yes and 82 of the global stakeholders answered yes. When asked why they would implement EBM for water quality monitoring, majority of the global stakeholders selected as a measure of treatment performance in South African Stakeholders selected as a routine water quality monitoring to identify water quality changes. Various experience in implementing EBM, the general consensus was because of cost. One of the aims of what Plan 4 is implementing case study experiences and demonstrating sites. My master's project will act as one of the case studies. The title of the project is Screening for Pharmaceuticals, Estrogenic Activity, and Oxidative Stress in Source Water from the Three Areas in South Africa. The aims of the project is to do chemical screening of water samples against a library of pharmaceuticals, as well as assess water samples from the selected area for estrogenic activity and induced oxidative stress using the relevant bioassays. The samples will be collected from three provinces, Limpopo, Gauteng, and Pumalanga. The experimental method will involve sample collection, solid phase extraction, and the extract will be reconstituted to do chemical analysis and bioassays for estrogenic activity and oxidative stress. How these bioassays work is that the cells are transfected with the respective element, either estrogen responsive or antioxidant element coupled with the luciferase reporter gene construct. In principle, when the compounds enter the cells, in the case of the T47DK block cells, estrogen receptor ligands will bind to the receptors activating the luciferase reporter gene. The presence of the luciferase enzyme can be assayed by measuring light produced using a luminometer, and this light is then related to the degree of estrogenic activity of the test chemical. Effect-based monitoring may, be, may support the water safety in the following ways. Effect -based, for effect-based quality targets, assessment of treatment performance, additional measure of water quality, or as a routine monitoring to detect quality changes. It is also consistent with risk management strategies strategies such as the World Health Organization water safety plans that has been applied worldwide. Work Plan 4 survey will be sent out again to stakeholders and Work Plan 5, which involves water safety plan pro plans, protocols and user guides will be compiled. 
and education material for operators will be compiled as well as workshops with stakeholders. I would like to thank our sponsors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naledi, and thank you to all the presenters um, for showcasing the research at the School of Health Systems and Public Health. And thank you so much again for the audience. All the questions that were asked, we will forward them to the presenters. Back to you, Dr. Matsebatlele. Thank you very much, Professor Flavia Sinkuge. Um, you went over time, but you are forgiven. Um, the, the presentations have been quite uh, helpful and enriching, particularly as they deal with uh, matters that are current and uh, continue to be challenging in South Africa, you know, management of diabetes um, uh, by the U UP Diabetes Research Center, uh, malaria research, uh, water quality and, uh, you know, um, uh, management and safety, uh, pollution. These are serious issues that need attention. Thank you very much uh, to Dr. Flavia and uh, your team of researchers. Thank you. Um, I think we will now break for lunch. Uh, and after that, we'll continue with part three and four, where my colleague, Dr. Mosellin Duplessis, will take you through. Thank you.
malaria is a killer. The complex disease life cycle in combination with other challenges mean that classic control and prevention methods alone will not achieve malaria elimination. At the University of Pretoria, our holistic approach looks at all components of the disease life cycle, namely the malaria parasite, the mosquito vector, and the human host. Each component forms a collaborative cluster with researchers from different disciplines and departments across the university working on malaria. The Human Health Cluster focuses on the impact of malaria control intervention strategies and tools, such as insecticides, on human and environmental health policy. Innovative intervention methods are used to educate endemic communities about malaria and promote health and well-being. Using an integrated vector management approach, the Vector Control Cluster uses mosquito biology and habits to develop innovative, safer and sustainable mosquito vector surveillance and control methods or strategies. Finally, the Parasite Control Cluster looks at parasite genetics and biology to identify biochemical distinctions between parasite and human for novel anti-malarial and transmission-blocking drug discovery. Various compounds, including plant extracts, are also screened for anti-malarial properties. Through our transdisciplinary approach, we build future capacity in the malaria space through mentoring young scientists while offering leadership and management training for stakeholders. The University of Pretoria Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control. Research, innovation and education towards malaria elimination. Good afternoon and welcome back. For those of you who didn't catch me this morning, I am Mauseline Duplessis and I'm the co-host. So you are stuck with me for the rest of this afternoon and I will chair the sessions onward. Never did, never did I imagine that one day a virus would return us to the reimagination, the birthplace of vision and change. The COVID pandemic allows for, as we listened this early in this morning, for C, collaboration, communication between international and national stakeholders and creative thinking. O, this crisis forced us to take it as an opportunity for reflection which led to the reimagined university as a more inclusive and just and equitable institution. The V exposed us to the virtual space that has evolved so rapidly across borders and disciplines. The I has improved information sharing, innovation, people become, became IT savvy in terms of apps, monitoring, evaluation, systems to the COVID, to be COVID safe. And you can tell me about that. We went through that. D, deliberation. It affords us with the opportunity for transdisciplinary, relevant stakeholders to sit around one table and decide on the way forward. And last but not least, you could see that it declined in sick leave application. So in, in, in order to implement priority initiatives aligned to the UP 2025 goals, there is a dire need to transform and redesign the approach to research in the faculty. It demands a transdisciplinary approach from working in silos to foster an inclusive culture in which innovation and collaboration play an important role. Similarly, we need to look at the transformation in our enabling space, digital transformation, while setting a clear path for diversity transformation. We look forward to this panel discussion, led by Prof. Flavia Senkubunge, who is uh, the incoming Deputy Dean, Health Stakeholders and Chairperson of the Behaviour and Management Sciences at SHSPH. Thank you. 
Duplessis, and it's a real great honor to welcome a distinguished panel who will be talking about research innovation. And in the interest of time, I'll go straight into them. Our first panelist is Dr. Modric Chibi, who is the Regional Innovation Advisor at WHO Afro, followed by Professor Funek Asogudela, who is the HOD of the Department of Psychiatry and also the Chair of the Transformation Committee at the faculty. Then Professor Erika Noel Lebe is a professor in biological anthropology, and she's the director of the Forensic Anthropology Research Center, abbreviated as FARC. Then Professor Diaha, who needs no introduction, who is our Dean at the Faculty of Health Sciences. He's also the Chair of the Committee of Deans. He's the Director of the University of Pretoria Institute for Sustainable Malaria Control, and also a Professor of Environmental Health, School of Health Systems and Public Health. Professor Michael Pepper, who is a Director of the Institute of Cellular and Molecular Medicine, the Director also of the South African Medical Research Council, Extramural Unit for Stem Cell Research and Therapy, as well as the professor at the Department of Immunology in our faculty. And then Adriano Mendes, who is a postdoctoral research fellow in the Zoonotic Arbo and Respiratory Virus Research Program as part of the Center for Viral Zoonosis. And then Professor Yanni Huyucho, who is the former HOD to the Department of Family Medicine, as well as the Director to Community Oriented Primary Health Care uh, Research Unit, and that is the UPCOPC. Uh, Dr. Patrick Ngasa, POT, the Project Manager to the Tswane Insulin Project and based in the Diabetic Research Center. And lastly, Professor Tahir Pile, who is a Professor and Head to the Department of Chemical Pathology at UP. And so, as I said, colleagues, this is a really distinguished panel, and it's a great honor for me to be chairing this. We'll start with you, uh, Dr. Chibi, some of your introductory remarks on how we can transform research, particularly from your area of the lens of innovation. Over to you, Dr. Chibi. Yes, uh, th thank you very much, uh, Dr. Flavia. And it's a really uh, a great pleasure to, to join uh, this uh, esteemed panel. Um, and it was encouraging to also listen to the uh, remarks uh, that were, were made earlier. Uh, and to be honest, I should, I should congratulate uh, uh, you and the organizers of this uh, of this research day, I think uh, the theme is, is quite timely uh, given the current context in which we are. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very excited and I can only say thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now coming to the, uh, to the, to the uh, subject of the day, <clears throat> maybe I can just uh, try to, to paint a picture. You know, um, I know you, you've, uh, defined uh, research transformation, I think in your earlier deliberations and all that. Uh, but what I just wanted us to capture is uh, when we're talking of uh, uh, research transformation is basically uh, about uh, the, the, the value creation for sustainable impact. And probably you would agree with me that, uh, you know, uh, when we're just talking about research in its simplistic term, uh, we're looking at generation of new knowledge. Um, so, but with transformative research and also how innovation is coming into play, it, it actually means that you, you are looking beyond generating facts and conclusion and asking yourself a so what question. And uh, in this regard, you're asking yourself, how can I exploit this knowledge to create and generate value? Uh, this is when uh, you can even start thinking about collaborative approaches like uh, what the earlier uh, uh, presenter I mentioned. Uh, this collaborative approaches can be either with companies or people in other disciplines to develop an evidence-driven, you know, innovations to save the community, to save your country. So uh, research transformation will look into uh, integrated innovation, and this is where innovation is actually coming into play, uh, which basically looks beyond 
you producing a product, but looks also at the, how that product can be delivered in the market. What is the social impact? What is the sustainable business model that can address some of the uh, important nuances like access, equity issues? So yeah, I, I can really say innovation is, 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 uh, is the other side of the same coin when you're talking about transforming research. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chibi. Professor Godella, I mean, you are the chair of our transformation committee, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts around also some of these pivot points of research transformation. Over to you, Professor Godella. Um, thank you and good afternoon to the panel and um, everyone listening in. And it is quite an honor to be here too. Um, I think, you know, it's a very broad uh, concept and uh, I like what the previous speaker said and what you also said. So you can look at innovation in terms of research and the things that research produces. Um, from our perspective, and not just the faculty uh, uh, um, transformation committee, but as a university, we know that also UP finds that transformation is one of the critical strategic points. And, and so when you marry um, a transformation to research, you have to ask yourself then, in terms of the UP principles of inclusivity, um, uh, encouragement of diversity, and uh, addressing uh, our community in terms of uh, our developmental state, how have we changed and where are we going? And uh, the, the, the question for us still remains, who is in the room and, um, and whose voices are being heard? And so uh, the, the matter of access uh, obviously is, is, is one that is clearly on the target line. The matter of the kind of research that is done um, at, at UP is also another question, material question. And so we know that if you encourage diversity and you transform the space in terms of the culture, you will also have a knowledge base that is that much more enriched. Usually people think that this will cost us um, uh, opportunities in terms of funding, in terms of grants and so on. And yet it has been shown through research that the more diverse your research base is and the more attractive you are to partners and those who want to be with you. And so if I use um, our panel today and if I go back to my question of who is in the room, um, you can see just from the demography of who we are in this space that we need to create an environment and, and there have been strides to create inclusive environments that are representative, but we obviously need to work harder. And I would say as a transformation committee, institutional transformation committee and the transformation agenda, this is one of the pivotal areas we need to look at and not just in terms of women um, and um, other underrepresented groups, but in terms of um, given uh, South Africa's um, past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kudela. So who is indeed in the room? And um, this then brings me to Professor Erica Noel-Lebe. Um, and uh, Prof, I mean, you know, uh, the Dean talked this morning a lot about this notion of multidiscipline, multidisciplinarity um, in terms of the work that we are doing. Um, and Professor Kudela has talked about this notion of who is in the room. What are some of your thoughts around um, research transformation? Hi, well, being the only anthropologist in the room, I suppose multidisciplinary is quite important. And it adds value to not only the research that you're doing, but the application thereof. For particularly large research grants, particularly Erasmus funding grants, you need to be able to discuss the sustainability of your research and how it will apply to greater societal good. So it is extremely important to have as many skilled people on your team and as many expertise as possible around your particular research topic. Thank you very much, Prof. And um, Professor Diaga, I mean, before you took over as the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, you had had a previous position as the Deputy Dean for Research. From the time that you started that journey as one of the first Deputy uh, Deans in that position to now, has there really been um, a change? Have we made traction? And, um, and what are some of these things that we need to transform? Over to you, Prof. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, most definitely. Um, I think we've done a lot during the past few years, but change is continuous and transformation is an ongoing process. For instance, we created research platforms from where we can operate in a transdisciplinary way, uh, different entities coming together, our impact on society, the creation of new entities, creating opportunities for research. So it is about um, access, throughput, impact and sustainability. I think what we've seen is that during the past couple of years, our research outputs have grown with about 86%. Um, our funding income has uh, grown significantly. We've created support systems. Our NRF rated um, research has grown. I think it's creating an environment that's conducive for change, for transformation, creating opportunities for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Prof. Diaha. Professor Pepper, over to you. Um, you're one of the doyens in this particular faculty in terms of research, and I want to hear some of your thoughts, particularly you work in the area of cellular and molecular medicine, and um, this is an area that um, traditionally has not been known um, uh, a lot, but um, you've made great strides, and I want to know First of all, in terms of transformation, um, what are your thoughts? And secondly, how do we bring um, newer researchers into some of these areas which um, we traditionally would not readily know in the Faculty of Health Sciences? Over to you, Professor Pepper. Thank you very much, Chair. And um, <clears throat> it is indeed a privilege to be able to be um, present on this panel. I'm not going to address the issues of transdisciplinarity or the inclusion of underrepresented groups, which have really been done very well by, by the previous speakers. I'd like to speak to two issues. So the first is a concept that we teach in, in, in bioentrepreneurship, which I'll come to in a minute, which is contrasting market pull against technology push. And what a lot of us tend to do as we go through our research careers is we, we have a favorite topic or technology and, and we tend to push that technology and we push and push and push and we have very little consideration for the market into which that, te that technology is going to enter. On the other hand, there is the concept of market pull. In other words, if you had to look at South Africa, what are our um, major contributors to non-communicable and communicable diseases. And so our approach in the Institute for Cellular and Molecular Medicine has been to identify key areas in both communicable and non-communicable diseases and to apply molecular and cellular technologies to those key areas. So this includes, for example, HIV, it, it includes um, obesity and cancer, and in our presentations uh, towards the end of the afternoon, we will highlight some of these areas. So I think it's very important to be market responsive. In other words, what do we need to address in the country that is key? What are our major contributors to disease burden? And the second issue I'd just like to address relates to the concept of translation. I think it's very, very important that we try as far as is possible to direct our research in a way that will result ultimately in the creation of services and products that will be useful to the people that need them, which is the entire South African population and of course, people on the African continent and beyond. And this is, I think, where we have been, um, I don't know whether we've been successful, but we've been very active um, in the creation of startup companies, which have budded out from the, the work that we've done uh, in the Institute around patents, which have been generated. And, you know, really, it doesn't take a lot of effort uh, to identify things that could be protected in one way or another and could lead on either to the people involved or to other people uh, translating these uh, into something that is useful and not just 
um, ticking the box of having you know 10 or 20 publications a year. Underlying all of this is the issue of equity and access. And this remains key to everything that we do from a translational point of view, because many of the things in the cellular and molecular area are very expensive, uh, but there are ways of uh, reducing the cost and making them available to the general population. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and, and these are really the key points that I'd like to emphasize from the ICMM. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Pepper. Adriana, over to you. You work in the area of uh, zoonotic arbor and respiratory virus uh, research, and I'm interested particularly uh, this whole morning we heard about the concepts of One Health. Uh, firstly, again, I want to hear your thoughts around what are these areas that we need in, to ensure that we transform research and some of the ways that we as a faculty can buy into the One Health concept. Over uh, thank to you very much. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, I think, yeah, from the One Health perspective, it's obviously never become as important to study One Health concepts as it has now uh, during a pandemic that seems to have come from a zoonotic uh, vector. And, and so one way I think of, of transformation and, and trying to uh, encourage transformation in, in our field is, is to try and sort of modernize our research and build capacity and, and, and build systems and infrastructure development. Um, as uh, in, in the global context, I think our virologists, our epidemiologists and our, and our vaccinologists are very well regarded. And, and um, we have you know, a plethora of knowledge and, and so many people who can train um, the, the new generation of scientists. So I suppose what I would like to see is, is transformation from the old guard to the new guard um, and ensuring that um, you know, places like UP and places, universities in South Africa have the right um, systems developed and have the right uh, uh, capacity and, um, you know, just, just overall infrastructure to be able to, um, to develop these skills and to keep developing these skills so that we remain, um, you know, at the forefront of, the, of, these, of these fields. Thank you. Thanks, Adriana. And I mean, you're so correct about the movement of research. Um, and Professor Hugo, I want you to, uh, to bring you in here. Um, as somebody who works very much closely to the community, Adriana talks about the movement from the old guard to the younger um, scientists. And I'm interested in, again, your thoughts around research transformation, but particularly around how we um, go beyond just the scientific community in terms of ensuring that our communities where we actually collect our research also know about um, the research that we're doing. Over to you, Professor Hugo. No, thank you very much, Flavia. And as part of the younger generation, I'll continue uh, to say that um, linking on with what Funeka said at who's round the table, uh, which is important, my point is where is the table? And that also links with what Michael said as to how applicable is what you do and how does it deal with equity. So our approach is to put the table next to the shack, next to the homeless person, next to the mining community and say, all right, now who's around that table and how do we start to address issues of this whole range of, of, of work around that table? which then obviously give access to the person in that community, including the, non, the often forgotten workers in, in clinics and, and households to be there. But also it is very appropriate for interdisciplinary work. And in the One Health, we just recently started an experience of taking the vets into the households and working on the concept of uh, the, the vets supporting the community health workers to address one health issues within that, in that space. And then that could link on also with, with, with other diseases. And what I think is important to, to link up with what Michael said is that um, latest technology science is as applicable in the household as in the laboratory. So let's 
as part of transformation, ask where do we put our research tables? And there we can collaborate very productively. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Hugo and Dr. Beauty. You're one of the emerging researchers uh, in the faculty, and I want to again hear your, your thoughts around how do we transform our research space for younger and emerging researchers? Over to you, Dr. Beauty. Over to you, Patrick. So Maybe yeah, I, I was I was muted. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Flavia, and a great honor to be part of this panel. Yes, as somebody with uh, experience in this topic, I guess I can say that emphasis should be put in giving opportunities to to young and emerging researchers, not in terms of uh, uh, making it easy for them, but rather in terms of skills development. And, uh, and mentoring. I think a program, a mentoring program would, would go a long way. Sometimes it's not easy to, to find, to, to, to understand the, 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 how to write, where to submit an article. So those practicals, those practical skills can, can, it can be done to most of the time coming from a background uh, uh, like ours, you might tend to stay away from academia because uh, of, the, of, of the fact that going into private can, can lead to more uh, financial opportunities. So there is a need for innovation, innovation, innovative means to make academia more attractive for people coming from a disadvantaged background. And yes, obviously we discussed the, the, the importance of it. In our experience, for example, doing research in diabetes in the communities, we believe that it's important that we identify to the people that we are talking to because it obviously uh, it, it involves behavioral change. It can, those conversations can only happen if one can identify with the part, what we used to call part, uh, subject, but, but rather the participants in the research and our people with diabetes in our case. So I believe that is really important. Skill development and mentoring will, will really go a long way. Thank you, Dr. Flavia. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ngasa P.O.T. Professor Tahir Pillay, you're the last one. I wanted to just find out uh, from you, uh, again, your thoughts around what these areas are about research transformation. But I do know that you worked in the space a lot around, um, particularly the issues around research ethics. I'd also like to hear your thoughts around that. And I do know that uh, you know, your department has been exploring um, use of big data as well. Over to you, um, Professor Pillen. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Senkabuge. And good afternoon to everyone uh, watching. Uh, I'm conscious of the times so I'm gonna uh, speak very fast. I think in terms of transformation, for me, there are four areas, you know, what is being worked on has been, has been uh, touched by uh, Professor Pepper in terms of questions that are being asked, who is doing it, where is it appearing, and was it what is its impact? And I think that's a kind of a, a feedback loop uh, because ultimately that will drive the research. But coming to the issue of big data, yeah, certainly um, there are huge opportunities for big data, certainly in, in, in the pathology disciplines that I represent. So we're constantly looking for opportunities to do uh, big data analysis and particularly move into the area of, of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So there's a huge opportunity there to transform. But obviously, a lot of these, um, with more increasing and complex research questions, we start to uh, encroach on areas that open up other ethical boundaries that we have to be very cognizant of. So, when it comes to the use of uh, comes to the use of using data, making sure that uh, we use the data that we have in in the most ethical way. So, the more questions. Uh, the more research questions you try to ask, the more complex the, uh, you will find that the navigation of the, of the ethical boundaries become a little more complex and you have to be uh, conscious of that and you have to make sure that you're training your younger researchers uh, into those, uh, giving them good training as to how they navigate those areas. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Pillay. And so colleagues, it's two o'clock. Um, program Director, Dr. Duplessis, my sense is that we would need to revisit 
this particular panel discussion because I, I, I think by no means have we um, engaged um, you know, deeply in on these issues. And I think research transformation is a key agenda point and maybe we can have it as a webinar at the Faculty of Health Sciences. But in the interest of time, um, I don't want to hold up the program. We will then end here um, because of the time constraints. And uh, just to say thank you so much to our panelists who have been here this afternoon. It's really a great honor and pleasure to always um, be with esteemed colleagues um, on this panel. Again, just to remind you, uh, Dr. Modric Chibi from WHO, our Dean Professor Diaha, Prof. Funega Sogudela, Prof. Erica Neil Lube, Prof. Michael Pepper, Prof. Tahi Pile, Prof. Yanni Hugo, Dr. Ngasa Pioti, and Mr. Adriano Mendes. Thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Dr. Duplessy. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Flavia. And yes, I do agree with Prof that this is not the end of this panel. We really have to arrange another session for this in our Faculty of Health Sciences. And why I'm saying this is that all along I was just heard buzzwords like your inclusivity, your attractiveness, your you know accessibility. And these are key concepts that we have to look at because transformation is a process. It takes time. It's like a camel getting into a tent. So how do we gonna get there? Because the input that what we put in have to transform so that we can get our desired output that is aligned with our strategic goals going forward. On that note, I want to say once again, thank you, Dr. Flavia. And now we, in this session, we're gonna have a, a showcase and research highlight from our School of Dentistry in the Faculty of, High, uh, of the Health Sciences. Thank you. I am a dentist. Each day I treat patients who need me to give them something to smile about. I give my patients and my community a healthy body and lifestyle by restoring their oral health and function, free from pain and with great looks. As a dentist, I am a member of a team whose multidisciplinary approach improves the total health of our patients. The team consists of me and dentists who have chosen one of the six fields of specialization. We all play our part in managing and restoring the oral health of our patients. Each patient that I see is unique. I hear their concerns, examine them with care, diagnose their problem and create an individualized oral health solution to manage their specific oral health needs. As part of UP's Faculty of Health Sciences, the School of Dentistry aims to produce diverse and competent dentists. We improve the quality of life of our patients and of the community by training our graduates in the state-of-the-art facilities in order to thrive in an ever-changing healthcare environment. Apply for the course Dentistry at UP. Become a life changer because great smiles, changed lives and the quality of life go hand in hand. The showcase showcases the highlights from the School of Dentistry and these are five separate presentations from the Department of Radiology, Department of Community Dentistry, Department of Oral Biology, Department of Restorative Dentistry and Department of Oral Pathology. The moderator for this session is no other than Professor, Professor Shangazi. She is the, the head and CEO of the School of Dentistry. Over to you, Professor. Thank you for the introduction, Chairperson. Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to the School of Dentistry session. Apart from the five presentations that we've alluded to for this session, I'd also like to invite you to view the online posters if you haven't already done so. And also please remember to submit your questions electronically under the Ask Your Question tab. To kick start the session this afternoon, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shane Nell, who will be presenting on the topic, the clinical and radiological spectrum of glandular odontogenic cyst, a multi-center study of 92 cases. 
Dr. Shanae Nell is a lecturer in the Department of Oral Pathology and Oral Biology. She has published 10 articles in the field of maxillofacial radiology. Over to you, Dr. Shanae Nell. Thank you, Professor Shangazi, for that introduction. Please allow me to share my screen. Okay, thank you, um, Prof Tiandiar, as well as faculty members for affording me the opportunity to present our research entitled The Clinical and Radiological Spectrum of Glandular Odontogenic Cysts, a multi-center study of 92 cases. So glandular odontogenic cysts, here often referred to as GOCs, are developmental cysts that arises from the remnants of the dental lamina that contain features of glandular differentiation in their lining. It was first reported in 1987 by Parayachi et al. as a Sahara odontogenic cyst, where it was later designated as a GOC by Gardner et al. in 1988. GOCs may pose diagnostic difficulties as they share overlapping histological features with other intraosseous entities, of which essential mucoepidermoid carcinoma is the most significant. Some authors speculate that these two entities may represent a biological spectrum of the same entity. This is supported by the aggressive radiological presentation, as well as a high recurrence rate that is often seen in GOCs. In the literature, it's known that location and clinical signs are important distinguishing features between a GOC and a central mucoepidermoid carcinoma. The typical presentation of GOCs include an asymptomatic swelling frequently located in the anterior mandible that represents radiologically as a unilocular or multilocular radiolucency that frequently crosses the midline. Recently, there's been an increased interest in GOCs with atypical presentations in order to categorize their clinical spectrum. To date, approximately 169 documented cases of GOCs have been published in the literature. So the purpose of the current study was to report on the demographic, clinical, and radiological features of GOCs diagnosed over a 20-year period. This represents the largest single study series to date and contributes a significant number of cases to the literature. So for the materials and methods, histologically confirmed cases of GOCs were retrospectively reviewed in a 20 year period. Cases were collected from four oral pathology laboratories located in two countries. In South Africa, from the University of Pretoria, the Department of Oral Pathology and Oral Biology, we had 43 cases. In Brazil, from the University of Rio de Janeiro, 25 cases. The Federal University of Minas Gerais, 15 cases. And then the University of Campinas, 9 cases. So for the results with regards to the demographics, the prevalence of GOCs were calculated from all the institutions as 0.15% of all diagnosed head and neck lesions. The mean age of presentation was 46 years, with a peak incidence in the fourth and fifth decades. With regards to the sex distribution, for the total sample, there was a fairly equal distribution with a 1.2 to 1 male to female ratio. But what was interesting is there was a strong male predominance in the South African sample and a slight female predominance in the Brazilian sample, which was found to be statistically significant. The results with regards to the clinical presentation, the reported mean duration of GOCs was roughly 37 months. GOCs had a tendency to present as a localized swelling, where the majority presented in an asymptomatic fashion with only a few cases were presenting with associated pain. Roughly 18% of, of GOCs presented as an incidental radiological finding, with very few cases presenting with paresthesia and tooth mobility. With regards to the location, GOCs had a predilection for the mandible and specifically the posterior molar regions of the mandible followed by the anterior and premolar regions. Additionally, six cases extended to involve the ramus. 
when the maxilla was affected, GOCs tend to occur in an anterior and premolar region in a so-called globulomaxillary relationship. GOCs frequently crosses the midline, which was seen in 31% of maxillary cases and 48% of mandibular cases. The results with regards to the radiological features, the majority of GOCs had well demarcated borders with only a few cases presenting with a focal loss of demarcation. Approximately 53% of cases had a unilocular appearance with an additional 19% of cases having unilocular with scallop margins. Only 28% of cases presented multilocular. The majority of cases were radiolucent with very little cases exhibiting small specks of internal calcifications. When we looked at the effects of surrounding structures, we noted that root resorption, tooth displacement and tooth impaction was seen in 65, 33 and 23% of cases respectively. Interestingly, 70% uh, of impacted teeth were third molars with two cases associated with supernumerary teeth and one case associated with an odontoma. Cortical expansion was quite common, seen in 62% of cases. With loss of cortical integrity, maxillary sinus or nasal cavity encroachment seen in 70% of cases. With regards to the differential diagnosis, glandular odontogenic cysts had the typical radiological presentation only in 14% of cases, with the majority presenting as odontogenic carotid cysts, radicular cysts, and ameloblastomas, as you can see in this image here. Rarer radiological diagnoses included nasopalatine duct cyst, dentigerous cyst, as well as other intraosseous entities. Due to the retrospective nature of our study, an accurate estimation on recurrence was not possible. But what we did note with recurrent cases is that they presented with increased aggressive features. This was an example of a recurrent case with image A representing um, the case in follow uh, enucleation of a unilocular glandular odontogenic cyst. The lesion recurred of the five years where you can see that there is um, extension of the lesion into the ramus complex with a multilocular appearance, bony expansion, as well as signs of cortical destruction. So in conclusion, GOCs present as asymptomatic swellings that frequently involve the mandible. They present during the fifth and fourth and fifth decades of life, and they present with a wide spectrum of clinical and radiological features, some of which have the typical GOC-like features, with others presenting with more aggressive features. Clinical signs of pain and paresthesia seem to be important distinguishing features between a glandular odontogenic cyst and a central mucoepidermoid carcinoma. The radiological signs seems less reliable as GOCs can have aggressive radiological presentations. The need for advanced imaging in the surgical planning of GOCs is justified based on the high reported recurrence rate in the literature. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Shane, for that very informative presentation. Um, at this point in time, then I'm going to call on Dr. Takisi Baloyi, who will be presenting on the topic, oral health status of illicit drug users in Swane Health District. Dr. Takisi Mukari Baloyi is a senior registrar in the Department of Community Dentistry. Over to you, Takisi. Good afternoon. Thank you, Prof. Shangasi. My topic is oral health status of illicit drug users in Tswane Health District. Illicit drug use is a global health burden. In South Africa, it has been on the rise since the post-apartheid era. Drug addiction has many health complications 
the treatment of which requires a multidisciplinary approach. Drug use in itself predisposes users to oral health complications, hence oral health should be incorporated into drug rehabilitation programs. Some of the general oral health complications observed include xerostomia, caries, periodontal disease, tooth wear, tooth loss, oral lesions, and mucosal dysplasia. These may be directly linked to the type of drug used, the route of use, if not both. It also has psychological effects that affect hygiene practices, which may affect oral hygiene. With poor oral hygiene practices, an individual is predisposed to caries, periodontal diseases, and tooth loss. With all this information, there's still no known oral health education, prevention, and promotion programs being conducted in treatment centers in the Twana Health District. The objective of the study was to determine the oral health status knowledge, perceptions, and practices of illicit drug users at specialist treatment centers in Twana Health District. Ethical clearance was obtained for the study prior to commencement. The design was a cross-sectional study. The population consisted of patients from Sanka Pretoria, Sanka Soshanguve, Sanka Hamanskral, and Stabilis Treatment Center. The sample size was 198. The data collection tools used was a self-administered validated questionnaire an oral examination conducted by the researcher, which included indices such as the DMFT to measure caries experience, the PUFA index to measure consequences of untreated caries, the CPITN to measure periodontal treatment need, erosion, trauma, and oral lesions. Data analysis was done using SPSS version 27. The results were as follows. The mean age was 25.5 years, which was similar to drug users globally and in South Africa. Literature states that the age 16 to 26 is an individual's critical decade. It is within this decade that one is prone to experimenting in the quest of finding themselves. 91% of the participants were male, which was similar to other studies. Men are prone to substance abuse due to societal pressures and roles that they expected to fulfill, such as being a breadwinner, protector, and displays of bravery, if not others. But when these become overwhelming, they may turn to substances as a coping mechanism. The majority were Black, and drug use is associated with social factors such as unemployment, poverty, and unstable family units. In the South African landscape, majority are plagued by those social ills, and 81% of the population is Black. 47% started using out of curiosity. 60% were introduced to the drugs by friends at school. Research corroborates that exposure to illicit drugs is influenced by social, familial, and individual factors. The most common use primary drug was DACA or cannabis with 59% of users. Cannabis is a gateway drug to hard drugs. It allows for the user to be more open to experimenting with more exciting drugs. The most common secondary drug used was crystal meth with a 29% use. Most of the users in this study used one, more than one drug as a secondary drug, and this is known as poly drug use. Just over half of the participants were not aware that drugs can damage their teeth. 87% had never received any form of oral health education, that being either basic oral hygiene practices, causes and presentations of oral diseases, nor the possible preventative and treatment measures that are available. Almost all had never received oral health education from a treatment center. 56% said that they brushed their teeth at least once daily, and 34% said that they brushed the recommended twice daily. Literature states that oral hygiene practices of drug users tend to be compromised to them due to the mental health effects that drugs have on users. It, is also, it also seems that they compartmentalize between oral health and general health. They have the perception that their teeth are an isolated entity from their bodies. The mean DMFT was 4.04, which is considered to be an acceptable level by the World Health Organization for adults over the age of 18. The mean DMFT scores observed in other studies were significantly higher, ranging from 7 to 13. In this study, the most commonly decayed teeth were the second molars across all quadrants, which is similar to other findings. That area can be a bit difficult to reach and hence it is expected. 
The highest DMFT recorded in this study was 10 in a user who had been using ROC as a primary drug. ROC is known to be associated with high caries experience. However, due to the poly drug use, it was not possible to correlate DMFT to a single drug. 42% of the users did not need any periodontal intervention. The remaining 58% presented with plaque, calculus, deep pockets, and minimal bleeding, gingival bleeding. Minimal bleeding is commonly observed amongst users who smoke their drugs as opposed to any other route. This may be attributed to the vasoconstrictive effect of heat. Contrary to these findings, similar studies reveal that deep pockets are a common finding amongst drug users. There was minimal erosion and trauma observed, whereas these clinical presentations are reported to be rather common amongst drug users. 1.5% presented with necrotizing gingivitis and 7.1% presented with herpes, bilateral linear alba, heavily coated tongue or pericoronitis. Contrary to the study, there are numerous oral lesions that have been associated with illicit drug use that were not observed. Lesions such as candidiasis, atypical white lesions that may be precancerous, oral papillomas, hyperpigmentation, ulcerations, erythematous lesions, and oral cancers. Our findings may be influenced by the fact that all oral lesions were differentially diagnosed by visual examination only, and this was based on definitive clinical features. Other confounding factors may be um, the patient's, the participant's socioeconomic status, if not their general health status. In conclusion, the participants' knowledge of oral health complications was minimal. They had poor oral hygiene practices. Their caries experience was lower than in other studies. There were also minimal oral lesions observed. The treatment centers did not offer any oral health education. It was thus recommended that health workers at rehabilitation centers be trained by an oral health professional in, in offering basic oral hygiene education, screenings, and the appropriate referral systems and procedures. These are some of the references we used. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nzakisi, for a very insightful presentation. Definitely, there's more that oral health can do in addressing the societal issues in our environment. Thank you very much for your contribution this afternoon. I now then invite Dr. Christy Davidson. Dr. Christy Davidson will be addressing us on the topic validation of Robert's method using root canal width patterns as a mandibular maturity marker in determining the 18-year-old threshold. Dr. Christy Davidson is a lecturer in the Department of Oral Pathology and Oral Biology, and she has to date published five papers in radiology, oral biology, and in forensic odontology. Over to you, Christy. Thank you very much, Professor Shangazi, for the introduction. Um, good afternoon, Professor De Yaga and faculty members. I would like to say thank you for allowing me to present a little bit about and information about the research that we published a little bit earlier this year in the International Journal of Legal Medicine. And it's the validation of Robert's method using root canal with patterns as a mandibular maturity marker in determining the 18-year threshold. Sorry, it's not allowing me to move. Okay, there we go. All right. In South Africa, the critical age of criminal responsibility is 18 years. Now, therefore, this age has specific legal and social implications. Now, in age estimation, it is therefore vital to determine whether a person is older or younger than 18 years. When aging living individuals, a sufficiently accurate and peer-reviewed method is required. Third molar development has been found to be a reliable method to determine the likelihood of being 18 years of age. The Marian stage age of development is accepted to indicate that an individual is above the 18-year threshold. Now, in the Marian stage age, the third molar's apical end of the distal root canal is completely closed and the periodontal ligament space should be a uniform width around the root and apex. 
Now, human biological growth markers are accepted indicators in age estimation. In 2016, Roberts investigated a new human biological growth marker, the relative widths of the distal root canals of the three lower left permanent molars. This growth marker was based on studies on two previous markers, that being the root pulp visibility and the periodontal ligament visibility, and was founded when the researchers observed a clear mesiodistal gradient in the diameter of the distal roots of the molars owing to the deposition of secondary dentine. So the objectives of this study were then firstly to validate Robert's method as a human biological growth marker in a South African population, and secondly, to determine the probability of being 18 years of age based on the root canal width pattern. So for our materials and methods, we looked retrospectively at digital panoramic radiographs of black and white South Africans of known age and sex. The radiographs were included if all three lower left molars were present, and if the third molar's distal root apices were in the Marian stage H. The radiographs were excluded if any of the three molars had a single root, or if the area of interest could not clearly be visualized on the radiograph. These radiographs were then separated according to ancestry and sex, and then divided into half-year age intervals between 16 and 24 years. Two investigators then independently assigned a root canal width pattern as described by Roberts. In root canal width pattern A, the mesiodistal width of the distal root canals of the first molar were narrower than that of the second molar, which in turn was narrower than the third molar. In root canal width B, the mesiodistal width of the distal root canal of the first molar was equal to that of the second molar, which in turn was narrower than the third molar. In root canal width pattern C, the mesiodistal width of the distal root canal of the first, second, and third molar were all equal. There were, however, radiographs that met the inclusion criteria, but then did not fall into one of the root canal width patterns of Roberts. They were all then placed into an additional category that we labeled RCWU. The investigators also recorded the root canal width pattern that was observed in each case in this scenario. So for our results, we had 945 individuals that were included in the study sample. This was comprised of 478 black South Africans and 467 white South Africans. Now, when looking at the same sexes, comparing the ancestries, the number of individuals was fairly similar for both sex groups. Once the root canal width patterns were assigned for the different ancestry and sex groups, the age distribution for each root canal width pattern was then determined. These histograms show the age distribution for the different ancestry and sex groups. Superimposed on this, you can see the root canal width patterns together with their minimum and maximum ages in relation to the 18 year threshold, indicated by the vertical line. Now, when considering the probability of being older than 18 years, it was found to be 100% for both ancestry and sex groups when root canal with C was considered. Also, for white males, the minimum age of root canal with pattern B was greater than 18, indicating that these individuals were older than 18 years. However, individuals falling within root canal with pattern A and U could be younger than 18 years for both ancestries and sex groups. Now, a large portion, about 36% of the individuals in the study could not be classified according to the patterns by Robert. And that was in the RCWU category. Additionally, half of the white males in the study population could not be assigned one of the root canal width patterns of Roberts. Now, in this root canal width U pattern, 61% of them presented with the root canal width pattern where the first molar was narrower than the second molar, but the second molar was equal to the third molar. 
So the findings in our study were in agreement with Roberts et al, who showed that individuals with stage H molars and the root canal with pattern C were indeed over the 18 year threshold. We also confirm that stage H lower left molars with root canal with pattern A for both ancestry and sex groups could in fact be younger than 18 years. Additionally, the large group of unclassified RCWU category um, that could not be classified according to Robert's patterns, root canal with patterns, and the fact that these individuals could be younger than 18 years of age suggested that an additional category should be considered when using this method. The inclusion of this pattern further improved discriminatory potential of this method. While we were conducting the research, there were a number of factors that were not considered in the initial research by Roberts, and these still require further consideration. These factors include the anatomical variations of roots and the root canal morphologies, the presence of dental anomalies like torodonticism, the presence of caries, non-vital teeth attrition and dental restorations, as well as factors in the panoramic radiograph acquisition, projection geometry and the focal trough of the third molars. Now, all these factors could affect the assignment of the root canal width pattern and increase the difficulty in using this method. So in conclusion, forensic dentists can now use the Marian stage H plus root canal width pattern C as a reliable indicator of having reached the 18 year threshold. However, considering the unresolved problematic factors when analyzing the radiographs, we suggest that when using the root canal width methods, this should not be used as a standalone technique, but rather as a battery of techniques when estimating age. This is the publication that came from this research. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christy, for that very informative uh, presentation that you gave us this afternoon and um, it is really going to help the oral health uh, 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 practitioners particularly the forensic odontology group going forward thank you very much colleagues may i remind you to please submit your questions on the ask a question tab just remember to do so so we can forward these questions to the presenters thank you christy next up is dr nadine Muller. Dr. Muller is a lecturer in the Department of Odontology, and she will be talking to us this afternoon on the cryogenic potential of natural sugar substitutes, xylitol, erythritol, and stevia. Over to you, Nadine. Thank you very much, Professor Shankazi. I just want to share my screen. Thank you, Professor Shangazi, and a good afternoon to all. Um, <clears throat> early childhood caries is a worldwide burden, and it has a negative screen, impact. We can't see can the screen. You, can you not see my screen? Uh, please share. Okay. Um, let me just see if I can fix the problem. Sorry, I have a, a technician on. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Shangati, and thanks for your patience. 
Um, early childhood caries is a worldwide burden that negatively impacts on children's well-being. It affects their aesthetics, their speech, mastication, and it can lead to a loss of space, which, which can cause problems that are difficult and expensive to treat in future. The International Association of Pediatric Dentistry stated that more than 600 million children worldwide are affected by early childhood caries. <clears throat> caries is a multifactorial disease and the frequent and excessive consumption of sucrose is considered as a major risk factor. The well-established link between dental caries and the development or, or between the development of dental caries and sucrose can be explained due to the fact that sucrose is fermented by microorganisms. Streptococcus mutans is the most prevalent organism in the presence, the onset, and the present and the um, development of dental decay. The objectives of this study. In a pursuit to find a less cariogenic, safe, natural alternative to sucrose, the study was conducted. Since there is limited research on the natural sugar substitutes, NSS, and their effect on the metabolism of microorganisms result, and their resulting oral pH levels, the cariogenic potential, NSS, um, for, of the NSS xylitol, erythritol, and stevia were compared to sucrose as positive control, and Ringer's lactate as negative control in the study. The colony forming units of Streptococcus mutants and the acidity or the pH of the media in the presence of these NSS were compared and measured at four different time intervals, six, 12, 18, and 24 hours. Ethical clearance was obtained before the study was conducted. Materials and methods. A diamond wafering blade was used and a low speed saw to cut 52 enamel blocks from sound buckle surfaces of extracted primary molar teeth. This was done to create a surface for biofilm formation. The blocks were sterilized and placed in four 96 well plates, one for each time interval at which the readings were done. Peptone cassian soy basal medium containing the different sweetness solutions and, control, and controls were then added to these blocks. The 5% sucrose solution and equal sweet sweetness solutions were made up using a modified technique by Fuffman. The preparation was based on weight by volume. The NSS for sucrose were precisely weighed, dissolved in sterile water, filtered and gradually added to the PCSB to the desired volume. Once all well trays were filled, they were placed in an incubator for one hour at 37 degrees Celsius to allow for pellicle formation. The wells were then inoculated with S. Mutant's standard strain ATCC 25175, and this was done at room temperature. The S. Mutant solution was adjusted to a 1% McFarlane standard one solution, and this was confirmed with the photospectrometer. Agar was prepared and set in 15 by 90 millimeters Petri dishes, and serial dilution and the spread plate technique adapted from Bauman were performed after 6, 12, 18, and 24 hours, and this was done in triplicate. After plating, the Petri dishes were incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. At each, each time interval, the colony forming units were assessed and compared in order to estimate the growth of viable, viable bacterial cells in each sample. A microelectrode pH meter was calibrate, calibrated and used to measure the pH of the media containing the respective NSS and controls at each time interval. This was also done in triplicate to avoid bias. The data was recorded, the CFU counts converted to log values, and then transferred to Excel spreadsheets. The data was statistically managed and analyzed using a two-way analysis of variance, with factors treatment, xylitol, erythritol, stevia, and sucrose, and time, which was 6, 12, 18, and 24 hours. The significance level was set at P less than 0.05. The data for CFU counts and pH, and pH values were respectively analyzed using the main factors treatment and time, inclusive of interaction between the factors. Results. The CFU count for each group indicated significant differences after 12 hours. The CFU for sucrose 
were statistically higher than that of stevia after 12 hours, with no significant difference between the CFU for sucrose and erythritol. The CFU for xylitol was statistically higher than those of all the other groups at 12 hours, yet it dropped after 18 and 24 hours. The CFU for stevia was statistically lower than those of all the other treatments at 12 hours and dropped significantly after 18 hours. The CFU for erythritol was statistically higher than that of the CFU for all the other treatments at 24 hours. Looking at the pH values, at six hours, the pH value for sucrose was statistically lower than that of xylitol. However, when compared to the pH values of the other treatments, there were no significant differences. At 12, 18, and 24 hours, the pH value for sucrose was statistically lower than those of xylitol, erythritol, and stevia. Although there was an initial drop in the pH values for all the NSS, there was no significant difference between the NSS for the 12 hour time interval. At 18 hours, the pH value for xylitol was statistically lower than those of erythritol and stevia with no significant difference between the values of stevia and erythritol. Although the pH value measured for xylitol was statistically lower than those of erythritol and stevia, at 24 hours, it stabilized and never dropped below the level of 5.5. Discussion. The acid production by bacteria in the mouth is rapid when carbohydrates are available. When the pH value drops to lower than 5.5, as was the case for sucrose throughout this experiment, the, the, there's disintegration of the organic compound of the enamel and dentine with subsequent demineralization and cavitation of tooth structure. This is why it's known as the critical pH level. All the sugar substitutes tested in this study caused an initial drop in pH, which then stabilized. And in the case of erythritol and stevia, the pH was elevated after a period. It's important to note that none of the NSS tested in this experiment produced a pH value of lower than 5.5. The results indicated that there's a, a direct correlation between the increase in the CFU and a decrease in the pH value for each treatment, respectively. This is indicative of S mutants thriving and multiplying while fermenting carbohydrates and producing acid. When the CFU stabilized or lowered, the pH stabilized or increased accordingly for all treatments. These results are substantiated by other studies where it was shown that individuals who tend to frequently and excessively ingest sucrose have elevated levels of S mutants in their saliva. The current study's findings were also in line with studies that proved how S mutants recognized xylitol as a form of nutrition. Similar to sucrose, xylitol is transported into the microbial metabolism by using enzymes as a transport mechanism to enter the bacterial cell after which they're expelled from the microbial cell as xylitol again, thus it's not being utilized as a form of nutrition. This futile energy consumption and the lack of metabolism by S mutants also leads to less acid production and a lowered rate of glycolysis in the presence of xylitol and other polyols. The exact mechanism of how stevia affects the metabolism of microorganisms has not yet been established. However, there's a study that evaluated the effect of stevia on intestinal flora and suggested that it possesses an inhibitory effect on the aerobic bacteria that negatively influences their proliferation. Considering these findings, there might be a link between the metabolism of the intestinal flora and oral bacteria with stevia. In conclusion, Although this was an in vitro study that not fully mimicking the in vivo environment of the oral cavity, the results are promising and indicative that the NSS tested might be considered as a healthier, less scariogenic alternative to sucrose and thereby aiding in lowering the incidence of early childhood caries. I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Nicolene Pothieter, and my mentors, Dr. Puerta and Professor Candice van Wyk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine, 
for sharing that important information that is going to lead us hopefully to a carers free generation in years to come. Thank you very much. Colleagues, before I invite the last speaker for this session, I would like to remind you that for CPD points, please remember to enter HSUP 737 in the CPD accreditation tab uh, so that we can be allocated your CPD points. Um, the last presenter in this session is Dr. Liam Robinson. He will be talking to us about the expression of mucins in salivary mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Dr. Liam Robinson is a senior registrar in the Department of Oral Pathology. He has to date published 28 articles in radiology, in head and neck pathology, and in forensic odontology. Dr. Robinson, over to you. Thank you, Professor Shangazi, for that kind introduction. Um, Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Diyacha, Deputy Deans, and uh, esteemed staff, thank you for this opportunity to present my research entitled Expression of Mucins in Salivary Gland Mucopitomy Carcinoma at this year's Faculty Day. You will note the co-researchers uh, on this intro slide, as well as a single researcher from the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. As an introduction, mucoepidermoid carcinoma is the most frequent primary salivary gland neoplasm seen in both adults and children. The WHO defines this entity as a salivary gland malignancy composed of three cell types, including mucinous, intermediate, and squamoid cells. Approximately 60% occur in the major salivary glands where the parotid is the most common subsite. In rare instances, these can occur within the facial skeleton where they are termed intraosseous or central mucoepidermoid carcinomas. Research has shown that approximately 80% of, of these tumors harbor fusions involving the CRTC, or 3 and MAMAL2 genes. These, are, these tests are achieved via fluorescent in situ hybridization, as well as polymerase chain reaction. Initially, research showed that the presence of a MAMAL2 fusion was indicative of a better prognosis However, this has subsequently, subsequently been refuted and further research is needed in this regard. These tumors are graded histologically via a multitude of grading systems, including the modified Healy and Katabi systems, which are qualitative systems, and the quantitative systems of the AFIP and Branvine et al. These two are the most commonly used today. Regardless of the system, the tumors are graded into three grades, namely low, intermediate, and high-grade tumors. Unfortunately, some significant grading disparities exist amongst pathologists, and these grades have a significant implication on the overall treatment and prognosis of the tumor. This slide indicates a uh, photo micrographs of representative grades. You will see on the left-hand side, a low-grade MEC characterized by predominantly cystic nature with abundant mucus cells and extensive extravasated mucin, but limited cytological atypia. In contrast, in the middle, an intermediate-grade mucoepidermal carcinoma still containing uh, mucus cells, but significantly more solid in nature with limited uh, cytological atypia. In contrast, on the right-hand side, we have a high-grade mucoepidermal carcinoma with extensive cytological atypia, limited mucus cells, areas of necrosis, and in instances may have perineural or lymphovascular invasion. Regarding epithelial mucins or MUCs, these are glycoproteins expressed by specialized cells. They have differing sequences repeated in tandem, which gives the MUC its characteristic subtype, namely transmembrane or secreted. Research has shown that MUC expression is altered in various carcinomas, including breast, lung, colorectal, and prostate. And these MUCs may serve as a predictor in terms of tumor recurrence, as well as prognosis. The aim of this study was therefore to investigate the expression of membrane-bound mucins, that is MUC1 and 4, and secreted mucins, that is MUC2 and 5AC, in mucoepidermoid carcinomas to determine a possible correlation with GRADE. 
This will help to establish a more uniform grading system, which is therefore predictive of the tumor behavior and overall prognosis. The materials and methods, major and minor salivary gland MECs were collected and graded into three groups as per the Brandvine et al. grading system. Fish analysis was performed for the mammal to rearrangement, following which immunohistochemistry was, was undertaken for the various mucks. This expression was evaluated in the neoplastic cells, mucous cells alone, and, the overall, and then in the overall tumor, and graded as negative, weak, moderate, or strong expression. Statistical analysis was then undertaken to determine if there are any significant variables. Results regarding the clinical pathological characteristics, a total of 50 cases were, was selected with a mean age of 50 years and an age range of 13 to 85 years, reflecting the variance of this uh, tumor. You can see from these graphs that the sex distribution was almost equal. With regards to tumor location, 65% of cases occurred in the minor salivary glands, where the palate was the most common site, and 35% in the major glands, where the parotid was the most common subsite. Regarding mammal 2 uh, analysis, this was performed successfully uh, via fish on 45 uh, tumors, 15 of each grade. 25 were positive for the mammal 2 rearrangement, and 20 were negative. You will note from this graph that high grade and intermediate grade mucoepidermal carcinomas showed mammal 2 rearrangements in approximately 60% and low grade in less than 50%. On the right hand side, this is a representative photo micrograph of the fish analysis. Via break apart, you can see individual signals, a green and a red, which indicates a positive rearrangement in this case. Regarding the immunohistochemistry for MAC1, high-grade tumors had the highest incidence of strong expression in both the neoplastic mucous cells alone and the overall tumor. These results were statistically significant in the mucous cells alone. This is a representative focal micrograph of MAC1 showing strong positivity in the neoplastic mucous cells alone on the left-hand side and in the overall tumor on the right-hand side in the case of a high-grade mucoepidermal carcinoma. Regarding MUC2 expression, only a single low-grade mucoepidermal carcinoma showed focal expression in the cytoplasm of mucous cells. And this is represented on this photo micrograph. Regarding MUC4, the neoplastic uh, cells showed a high incidence of mucous uh, cell expression alone and in the overall tumor. These results were statistically significant for the overall tumor alone. Again, a MUC4 photomicrograph uh, immunohistochemistry showing expression in the mucous cells alone on the left-hand side and the overall tumor on the right-hand side, in this case, a low-grade mucoepidermal carcinoma. Regarding MUC5AC, all tumors showed some degree of expression in the mucous cells alone and the overall tumor, regardless of the tumor grade. No statistically significant association existed. Again, a photomicrograph of MUC5AC showing strong expression in the neoplastic mucous cells with very focal expression in the overall tumor uh, in the case of an intermediate grade mucoepidermal carcinoma. So in conclusion, MAC1 overexpression may be a reliable marker of high-grade mucoepidermal carcinoma, whereas MAC4 is more indicative of low-grade tumors. MAC5AC expression is considered an unreliable marker in determining grade, and MAC2, since it was only expressed in a single case of mucoepidermal carcinoma, may therefore be considered a useful marker to exclude the diagnosis of a mucoepidermal carcinoma when dealing with a malignant salivary gland tumor. In summary, this study demonstrates that mucoepidermal carcinoma show an altered pattern, altered pattern of MUC expression that can be used for diagnostic purposes and aid in establishing a more accurate tumor grade. This is the article that emanated from the study published in Head and Neck Pathology. And this is the selected references. I thank you for your time and attention. 
Thank you, Liam, for a very insightful presentation. Uh, I'm really encouraged from seeing the presentations this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, I, I really do hope that from the audience perspective now, um, that everyone can find some inspiration from the presentations presented this afternoon and that there's room for multidisciplinary engagement, definitely within the school and within the faculty. Interconnectedness is definitely a possibility. Thank you to all the speakers that presented this afternoon and made this session a success that it has been. Over to you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Firstly, I want to say thank you very much for an interesting and insightful presentation. Thank you for the researchers. And the reason why I'm saying this is that as much as it was insightful, it also had this element of reprimanding me. I'm not talking about the others. I'm talking about me paying a lot of money on the medical aid, and yes, today I've heard that uh, your teeth is not uh, an entity standing on its own. So thank you very much for that. And I'm going, I'm taking going away with so much information because the only thing that I knew was that a good ten dentist never gets on your nerves, and lying through your teeth does not count for flossing. So our next uh, speaker now will be Dr. Brandt. Uh, and the session will be on innovation and teaching and learning research. Now, the suspension of classes and let students start online at home. This unprecedented policy provided a new space for online teaching, which helps learners through remote instruction. So though there are many advantages, for example, there are flexible ways of learning, the higher degree of freedom for the students and better retention of online learning, it also has its drawbacks. And, and it cannot be denied, especially in the two aspects, like autonomous learning and ability at home from students and the quality of, teach, of teaching online for the teachers. So, and this, that also asked from us to go back and creating new value, mainly refers to cultivating the creative thinking while reconciling tensions and dilemmas refers to the ability to apply the knowledge of both broad and specialist, specialized kinds to meet specific demands beyond just the acquisition of knowledge. It requires students to master a wide range of disciplinary and interdisciplinary knowledge and think and act in a more integrated uh, way to solve problems. Uh, in that saying, I'm handing over now to Professor Martin Brandt, who is the head of the HPB surgery at the Steve Pico Hospital. Uh, welcome and over to you, Prof.
Good afternoon. Uh, Professor Martin Brandt has unfortunately experienced some technical difficulties, so I've been parachuted in to help save the day. So, welcome to our fourth panel, uh, Innovation in Teaching and Learning Research. Uh, I'm Professor Van Kudir from the Department of Pharmacology. Uh, along me in this panel, we have Professor Liv Wolfart, uh, Dr. Sean Patrick, Dr. Mabel Kakana, Dr. Irene Libber, and Mizuki Chabalala. Now, to start off the panel, uh, one thing we need to understand is that education has been in the forefront. Uh, it's been a very difficult time for us all. And naturally, there's been a lot of research alongside it. So, speaking of that, Sean, you received a subtle grant last year to do research in public health. Uh, what did the students think of the online activities and assessments? Um, th th thank you very much, Werner. Um, so, just to place it into context, in May 2020, um, the School of Health Systems and Public Health launched the fully online postgraduate diploma in public health. So the scholarship of teaching and learning grant was really, we looked at understanding students' experiences of online learning, um, how they interacted with the module content and whether they appreciated the variation in the, um, the assessment strategies that we used. So with such large classes, we used to be very creative in the assessments and the online activities that we had to keep the students engaged with all the content. So thus far, we've surveyed about 130 students and we had at least completed two of the nine modules and about 90% of them strongly agreed that in all these, in the modules, there was a wide variety of online activities that kept them engaged and they appreciate that. Um, they also agreed with the variation of the assessments that we used, not just the traditional multiple choice questions, for example. There were different, um, there were different forms of assessment for different types of learners because all students learn the same way. Um, they also appreciated that we, um, we have um, quite a variety of technological tools. So um, over, over and above all in the online environment, they really, um, they really like the online activities and the assessment. But one limitation that we really found um, is that the students felt that there needs to be different modes of feedback. Because in these large classes, individual fee feedback isn't really possible. So Prof. Liz can elaborate more on that, but um, I think this also provides an ideal opportunity for us. Um, although we've planned the research, we do realize that the different types of feedback is really something that we need to start looking at. And that is really where um, I think uh, the, the students would need more support, especially now as most of our courses are in an online environment. Thanks, Sean. Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, so yes, it's just to put a bit of context, we currently have, uh, have over about 800 students uh, in, the, in the program and a class size can be up to 600 or over 600 as a matter of fact. So, so Sean has put his finger on an area of new research for us and that is feedback. So what do students perceive as feedback? When do they know it's feedback? Do they, can they identify as it's feedback? So we were very privileged in the sense that we could determine our research agenda at the start of the program and what we wanted to explore. But I wanted to highlight that by doing this and doing the research, it's uncovered new areas of research uh, because much of what we thought of at the beginning was a lot to do. Does it meet the students' need? Is it, does, uh, you know, are we building the competences that we require? But at the same time, we've had to make quite a number of quite hard decisions about the design of the program uh, and the assessment, for example. And so some of that feedback is going to be used in terms of justifying, for example, our programmatic approach to assessment, which is in the literature, von der Fleeten writes about it a lot, but now we are testing it and we can now say, does it work in our context or not? So just to wrap up from our perspective, yes, it was a, a privilege and a benefit to be able to design from the beginning, but as we're going along, a lot more questions are being thrown up by the feedback that we've been getting from students to date. So I think that's a, a good start from us. Thanks, Van, and back to you. Thank you very much. So one of the big things here was there was a pre-planned approach, but that's not always the case for everyone. So uh, Mabel, without a pre-planned research plan, how have you implemented research based on experience in the pandemic? Thank you, Prof, for the opportunity. Can you hear me? Yes. 
All right, thank you. Oh, yes, without a pre-planned plan. Yes, a lot of things are happening in teaching and learning. And some are exciting, some are challenging. And both of them need answers. So for us to do research, we need active involvement of both the lecturers and the students. This is what has been spoken about so much, collaboration. Time has passed when uh, people were designing research for some people. Now it is time for us to, to design that research with the participants. Let them be active, actively involved in this research. Let's identify the research problem, the research aim and the research question together. And in this way, we'll be able to gather that rich data that is much relevant to addressing the problems at hand. And we cannot forget the people from education innovation, because if we are designing all these online activities, we need them. So in conducting research for teaching and learning, we need collaboration of all parties. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love the fact that collaboration has come through so strongly within this research. And I think that's one of the nice things about being in education research is that it spans across disciplines and professions and becomes such a transdisciplinary approach uh, because we all have the same outcome in mind. Now, from my perspective, uh, I'm engaged in curriculum research. And one of the things that I've been very much focused on is pharmacology education. Now, the big question that I want to answer is, what do specific health professionals need from pharmacology to became, uh, become competent within their world of work? And the specific cohorts that I'm looking at are dietitians, are physiotherapists, and are nurses. Now, pharmacology is an incredibly broad and in-depth field. And the risk, of course, of this is that we overload our curricula and it becomes just a stagnant environment where proper learning can't really take place. Now, if the pandemic has shown us anything, it's that pharmacology is at the root of a lot of the discussion. Every couple of weeks, we have a new drug on the market that's either being discussed as being a risk for COVID or being the potential cure thereof. And in between, the vaccine is just all around. And the discussion from drug development to approval status has been everywhere. Now, the public is obviously very fearful of a lot of these concepts. And the problem is that as a healthcare practitioner, they are placed in an environment where they are the first filter. They are there to provide advice. I can imagine that so many of our healthcare providers have had that question about what should I do? Should I be taking ivermectin? Should I be taking hydroxychloroquine? Should I get the shot? So it's a very confusing time. Now the question is, should this not become a competency that we immediately talk about within pharmacology education? How to deal with the misinformation surrounding it? How to, properly, proper, um, sorry, how to properly interpret this information from a scholarly article so that they can make proper uh, decisions based on it? We also speak about all of our 21st century competencies, these attributes we require within our fourth industrial revolution. So we need to imbue our students with these types of skills so that they can actually achieve what they need to do within the world of work, where they can be competent, where they can critically think, problem solve, become health literate, digitally literate. Now, we have no idea what's going to be happening over the next couple of years. But by thinking ahead and building in these modern competencies and aligning it to what we need to do, ultimately, we are going to have a wonderful environment where we can have graduates with the specific competencies they require across the board. Um, my apologies if you can just bring up the panel questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, Zuki, uh, as the pandemic has continued, has there been a moment or teaching event during the last 12 months that has made you stop and say, wow? Um, um, <clears throat> thanks, um, Prof. Werner. Yeah, actually, a lot of them. And as I was listening to you, I was actually thinking of, you know, many more other ones. I think 
for me, the biggest wow would be that my students from the Bachelor of Clinical Medical Practice, so my clinical associate students across the board from first year to third year, they really, in my opinion, really stepped up to the plate. I mean, I remember when we um, first went online, we actually didn't have a set plan for them, but my senior students especially showed up. I mean, we had online classes for them and they showed up every single time. And this was actually even before um, the university said that they were going to give you know, students data. And as you can imagine, my students are all over the place. Some of them are, with, are within Gauteng and some of them are out in very rural areas. But despite that, I was actually amazed you know, by their dedication and the fact that they showed up for lessons and they showed up prepared. And then over and above that, one of the things that we've been able to actually move forward is that we now have family medicine consultants who show up and they assist with our third year um, online discussions, which has created an even you know, bigger and a wider and a more richer discussion for our students. With respect to the first year and the second year students, again, you know, um, our program is very, um, um, preaches self-regulation. And so it's up to the students to show up to online lessons and the students were showing up. And we've actually found anecdotally that in this year, especially our, um, our pass rate for our students and those that had to sit for supplementaries decreased massively. So for that, that really made me say, wow, because it just seems that, you know, and I really think it was the students themselves that made us as the facilitators want to give them more and, you know, and be present for them. I think from a facilitator standpoint, you know, it's been about, you know, um, getting in touch with education and innovation. And they've given us great ideas about how are we present, you know, when we're online. And that's really, um, the students respond to that. So those are some of the things that have really made me say, wow. And I was taught, and Mabel and I have been speaking about the fact that it's a pity because we didn't have, you know, a research plan when we started this, but imagine if we did, you know, what kind of information we would have been able to share with everybody. One of Back the to you, Brenna. Thank you very much. I think one of the wonderful things that comes through of that is that we often underestimate one another and we underestimate our students to a degree. Uh, we had the suspicion that a lot of them would not be able to cope with the new online teaching and learning environments. And as you've just said, it's surprising. Some can really come through and they can self-regulate. They can achieve these wonderful things that we did not expect. And having that ability to research is, is just one of the, the most beautiful things that you can do within health professions education research. Um, now, speaking about all of the opportunities within research, uh, Liz, what are the opportunities to publish recent research around teaching and learning innovation? Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, thanks, Van. I just want to comment on what Zuki has been talking about and Mabel has been talking about in the sense that although you didn't have the, the, the opportunity of, you know, of being able to predict what's going to happen and have a research plan in place, now that that wow has happened, now that you've seen and experienced, I think this, it's never too late. So I think one must be clear, it's never too late. And, and to start now to say, well, this has come up, this is not what we expected. We expected these students in rural areas to really struggle and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that is key. So it, key and from a research perspective, it's everything is worth examining. It's never too late to start. Uh, and then in terms of where to publish. So I always think, um, and perhaps before I go down that road, is just to thank the faculty for including this panel discussion in today's meeting or today's faculty day, uh, faculty day, simply because it gives us an opportunity to stand back from our technical areas of expertise and look at ourselves as scholars and as educators and say, but if I'm a scholar and I'm an educator, how do I then... Um, how do, how do I examine my own practice? Because how are we accountable to ourselves, to our peers, to our community of practice? And I'm going to ask Irene now to add something now about community of practice. That's her area of expertise. But also, um, it's really 
how do we how do we account because as zuki said we had to come up we had to step up we had to come to the party and we in some cases really had to make quite difficult decisions and so how does one plan for those difficult decisions from an instructional design perspective so irene can talk about that but just to close the your question i think the, the for me the logical starting point is to start research and then to look for local opportunities to share your findings so uh, like such such as a faculty day, such as a local conference, such as SAHI, which is the South African Association of Health Educationalists. And from there, you can build momentum, build networks, build research areas of interest, and you can progress up the ladder into publications. And you can perhaps talk about, about that later on, because I know you've curated a, a special issue on COVID-related um, things. But I think perhaps just we, I would like to ask Irene, if I can bounce your idea from me, from me back to, down the line to Irene around the sort of scholarship of teaching and learning, because I think that's key in this sort of public, having an area of interest to publish on. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Please go ahead. Sorry. Thanks. Um, I, I think this is one of our challenges as lecturers is where do we get these ideas, where do we select, how do we select the topic and where do we go from there. And I think from us as educa from education innovative side is the nice part is where we as consultants do the class visits. So we we sit in, in the classes, we whether it's virtual or in real person, and we listen to what is being done and said and we observe the teaching and then very often after the session like that we will sit with the lecturer and we soundboard and we discuss about the possible research topics that emerge from that session or from the things that they are doing and um the nice thing also is very often it's not coming from the consultant's part, but from the lecturer. So they self select, select topics and ideas that I want to do this wonderful thing or can this work? Is it something like this? And then we brainstorm and we discuss and we think about and work around this topic. And from our consultant point of view, we are more inclined to the pedagogy and the didactic. So we know the theoretical underpinnings and who's the key opinion leader. So we can bring those things together for the lecturer and then together Either we help them or they on their own write for the sort of grant applications where they then disseminate their research and they do the research. And I think part of this is that we search for opportunities to get funding to do educational research. Educational research is sometimes the stepchild and the Cinderella of um education or of research as such. So we where do we get funding for that? Where do we disseminate it? And how do we go about this? to disseminate these things. And then um, what we also find is in partnerships very often is that we from EI side partner with the lecturers. So we collaborate, we work together, and that gives us really a win-win. And I think Prof. Well, Prof. Diakon alluded to this this morning as well. Again, when he spoke about um, multi-intertransdisciplinary research, where we pull in people from different disciplines, but also from education innovative side, so that we can collaborate on research. And then, um, yeah, I think that is the main point of finding a research topic, unpacking it and making it available to the, and sharing it with our colleagues. Lambert, can I give back to you there? Uh, I'd like to touch on two points that was raised now by Liz and by Irene. I think the, the joy of it is that education innovation is there to support us across the board. And as Liz said, there's a variety of opportunities to publish health professions education research. Now, recently, the African Journal of Health Professions Education has also had a special focus edition on innovations in teaching and learning uh, during this time of COVID. Now, the nice thing about the special focus edition was that it was geared towards the dynamic nature of the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, not all of us were in a position to have a set research plan, to have gone through all of our research committees, to have the funding available for it, or a solidified idea based on scholarship of teaching and learning. Now, luckily, this edition catered for it in a bit of an innovative way. It allowed our authors to really showcase what they did in their classroom environments for teaching, learning and assessments in unique creative ways by showcasing it in videos. 
And later in this year, we'll have this edition available where we can actually showcase all of this. Now, luckily, the Faculty of Health Sciences contributed eight publications to this. And the nice thing is that many of these were first time publishers within health professions education, which also shows that opportunity to bridge into a new field of research. And just to put it out there, education innovation was associated with three of them. So it just once again shows the importance of their role in supporting academics with these endeavors. Now, apart from just scholarly publications, there's also a variety of other opportunities where we can generate networks in education, where we can bounce ideas off one another and eventually get tangible research projects where we can actually showcase that scholarship. We, we can showcase with proof the effect that it has had on teaching and education. Now, for example, we have our Durasana Plus program um, that encompasses quite a few national and international institutions. And using their blog system, we're able to showcase these wonderful things that our educators are doing across the board within education research. Now, what I would like to say as sort of a closure of this panel is that the importance of teaching and learning is just evident. Um, across the board, and this was mentioned earlier, we sometimes focus very much on our discipline-specific research, but we forget about the research that's available in our classrooms. And anything can become a project. Anything can become an important topic in your specific niche. And I'm quite excited going forward to see how health professions education research will evolve and create these tangible changes within our community. So I'd like to thank our panel members, um, Professor Liz Volfart, um, Dr. Sean Patrick, Dr. Mabel Kakana, Dr. Irene Liber, and Mizuki Chabalala. Uh, I really do appreciate this. And um, from Professor Brunt's side, I am sure that he is also very much appreciative to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Prof. Indeed. We've learned a lot, and I believe that the lessons learned during and about COVID will continue to be published, and many of these will eventually be assimilated into the mainstream pedagogies once things return to the new normal. Uh, I'm going to introduce to you now a video for the School of Medicine. My name is Michael Pepper, and I'm a research professor in the School of Medicine at the University of Pretoria. I specialize in cellular and molecular medicine, and I often look at my research and wonder how we can best use it to change the future of healthcare, particularly in South Africa. South Africa is an ideal setting in which to do cutting edge research, and being surrounded by some of the best young minds inspires me to seek answers to questions that have not been resolved. The quality of teaching and learning at UP School of Medicine continually produces top-class researchers and medical practitioners. Many of our graduates become top doctors and researchers in the country, highly sought after because of their skill set. We blend clinical training with modern cutting-edge teaching and learning practices. We house exceptional lecturers with a passion for their work. A specially tailored curriculum allows our students to join the ranks among international players. We cover a comprehensive scope of study comprising 29 departments. Our cutting edge technologies and advanced facilities enable us to undertake teaching and research aimed at optimizing healthcare with molecular targeted imaging and therapies. Our students go beyond their call of duty to overcome mediocrity and rise to excellence as they benefit from theory in classrooms to practical experience in community hospitals and clinics. Fighting poverty-related diseases, promoting good health and well-being, we prevent loss of life. The School of Medicine at UP's Faculty of Health Sciences, leaving an impact and changing lives. This session sh showcases research highlights 
from the School of Medicine in the Faculty of Health Sciences. There are five separate presentations from the ICMM, Institute of Secular and Molecular Medicine, and then the SEMLI, Sport, Exercise, Medicine and Lifestyle Institute. And then the Community Orientated Primary Care Research Center for Maternal, Fetal, Newborn and Child Healthcare Strategy. The moderator for this session is Prof. Tahir Palai from the Department of Chemical Pathology and National Health Laboratory Service. Over to you, Prof. Palai. Uh, thank you, Program Director. Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for uh, staying for this session. Uh, you've seen the video of the uh, School of Medicine. So uh, I'm going to be the moderator of the session. We essentially have, um, we've got uh, five uh, different uh, presentations from five different units. And the first, as mentioned by the Program Director, the first one will be uh, from the Institute for uh, Cellular and Molecular Medicine. Uh, I would like to ask the speakers to keep to time. Otherwise, Stevie is going to be upset because Stevie is coming on at 4.30. So you don't want to upset Stevie, but hopefully he's a friendly robot. So the first uh, presenter, uh, first presentation is from the ICMM, the Institute of Cellular and Molecular Medicine, led by Professor Michael Pepper. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Pillay, and, and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for being part of this. Uh, we have structured our presentation over the next 15 minutes uh, in the following way. I will do a very brief introduction. Uh, this will be followed by Dr. Melvin, uh, sorry, this will be followed by Jean van Rensburg, who is the project manager uh, for a, a project called NESHI which uh, in colloquial terms is birth asphyxia. Uh, this will be followed by Melvin, Dr. Melvin Amberley, who will speak about his work on obesity, and Dr. Krishna Durant, who will speak about her work on HIV and hematopoiesis. So as an introduction, let me just say um, that the ICMM was formally launched in 2015. Uh, so we, this is our sixth year of existence. Uh, we have at the moment about 50, 5 zero, 50 people in the ICMM uh, that are involved in a variety of projects. Um, and the main research topics in the ICMM are shown here. Um, so the next presentation will be by Jean on NESHI, which is neonatal encephalopathy uh, with suspected hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. So this is essentially birth asphyxia which is a major problem in South Africa and is one of the major contributors to uh, medical legal matters in the country and severely uh, depletes our health budgets as a consequence. Um, obesity and the formation of fat cells uh, called adipogenesis, and that project is run by uh, Dr. Melvin Amberley. Um, topoetic stem and, and progenitor cells uh, and hematopoiesis, and in particular HIV, that's run by Dr. Krishni Durant. Uh, we have several projects which have evolved over the years on mesenchymal stromal cells, uh, also sometimes referred to as mesenchymal stem cells, MSCs. Uh, I, I'm responsible for this. Melvin is again responsible for a program on cancer. And um, then there are three other entities, pharmacogenetics, uh, for which I am responsible, uh, the genetics of disease susceptibility and severity, which includes things like COVID-19 um, and um, cystic fibrosis and others. And then finally, we have one on the ethical, legal and social implications of all of the above. So I'm going to stop there and hand over now to Jean, who will uh, continue with the presentation on the NESHI study. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I will be presenting on behalf of the NESHI Working Group. So as introduced by Professor Pepper, NESHI itself is a condition in which a baby will experience lack of oxygen at birth. 
And the reason why this is so important is because in South Africa, we see an incidence as high as 13.3 cases per thousand live births. This in itself is in contrast to the one to two cases per thousand live births in global populations. So the second main reason why we're looking at this is because the pathogenesis for this particular condition is not very well understood at all. As Michael has mentioned, we have huge medical legal implications for those who are diagnosed as with CP, cerebral palsy, which is a condition that can be diagnosed following an exposure to a lack of oxygen at birth, such as is observed with Neshi. So in terms of the aims of the study, what are we actually trying to achieve? Well, we're trying to understand what our moderate to severely affected Neshi cases look like in South Africa. We're also trying to understand whether or not we can identify biomarkers for disease. And finally, we're trying to understand whether or not the genetic factors that can be associated with dis diseases, as we know, are a factor that can be considered for Neshi. So in terms of how we're actually going about achieving this, well, our three arms now, three aims include collection of clinical data, which includes information from both the babies and the moms, placental histology and follow-up information. We're looking at our second aim, which includes biomarker identification, which includes pathomicrobiomic, transcriptomic, metabolomic and MRI investigations. Of those, you will see that we are collecting an array of samples, which include placental tissue samples, <coughs> cord blood samples, dry blood spot samples at two different time points, and recently the formal introduction of an MRI component using both traditional and brand new technology, which I had the privilege of being a part of in the next month. So the final aim includes a genomic analysis, which includes looking at blood samples we collect from our patients. To date, where are we with our aims? Well, we have screened just over 600 patients. We've enrolled nearly 250. We will be introducing a low field mic um, magnetic resonance imaging equipment by the end of September this year. So this will be a global first in terms of looking at brain uh, images with a low field MRI. Um, we are validating our data on an ongoing basis and are planning our preliminary investigations and analyses by the end of this year. We will be introducing control cohorts and mildly affected Neshi cases, preferably by the end of the first quarter of next year. In terms of our second aim, we have collected an array of samples, which includes approximately 40 transcriptomic, 220 metabolomic and 50 pathomicrobiomic samples. And again, over here, we will be aiming to introduce control cohorts before the end of Q1 of 2022. In terms of our third aim, we have currently collected approximately 180 neonatal samples. We are currently busy preparing our first 100 samples for whole genome sequencing using an Illumina-based platform. And we have partnered with a local bioinformatics company to assist us with the data analysis on this. Clearly, from what I've shown you, that this is not a small project. It involves many different people. So I would like to um, just thank our collaborators at the University of Cape Town, VITS, our fellow colleagues at UP, the Stellenbosch University team as well. I would also like to thank the National Health Laboratory Services and Lancet representatives that have helped us with the placental pathology. Um, in terms of our uh, colleagues outside of the academic sphere, CLS, Separations and Carbobiotech, Bixbio and sapien bioanalytics that are assisting us with our sample analyses. So in terms of our funding agencies, just a very big thank you to the SAMRC, who are our main funders and recent funders um, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you. OK, I'm going to continue from looking at uh, obesity research at the Institute for Cellular and Molecular Medicine. So basically, in investigating obesity, we make use of uh, adipogenesis, which is basically the process of fat cell formation. So we can be able to isolate uh, pre-adipocytes from the adipose tissues of humans and able to differentiate them in vitro to form fat cells. So this serves as an excellent cellular model to investigate fat cell formation. And this could also help us identify key elements that could regulate fat cell formation, thereby combating obesity. So in dealing with this, we first start by looking at other molecules that have been reported to influence this process, starting with reactive oxygen species, which we showed that uh, ROS actually enhances adipogenesis. And if you use ROS scavengers, such as Trollox and uh, apocyanine, it actually suppresses this process. 
We also looked at uh, one genetic uh, marker, which is an expression of PREF1, preadipocyte factor one, which if it's expressed in preadipocytes, it actually prevents these cells from uh, differentiating to form mature fat cells. So we showed that the effect of the expression of this PREF1 on adipogenesis is actually cell type dependent. So in other words, uh, it's, not, it's not a one size fit all. And also that the expression of PREF1 alone in pre-adipocyte may not be sufficient to suppress adipogenesis. So this brings us to a whole lot of limitations which uh, comes with picking uh, molecules from literature and trying to investigate them in terms of fat cell formation. So we decided to employ our own approach by looking at a genome-wide transcriptomic analysis of uh, pre-adipocytes from humans. So we studied this and what we did was we identified a whole lot of uh, markers that were differentially expressed, be it genes and transcription factors, some of which are novel and have never been reported in this process before. So we decided to go with our own novel markers to investigate them in terms of uh, adipose tissue function and also in terms of uh, obesity development. So the first question that we want to ask in uh, investigating this marker is, uh, does sex matter? Because when you talk about diet-induced obesity in animal models, most, most of the times the research preferred using male uh, animals for certain reasons, but uh, we want to find out why this preference and should we be focusing on our research if we want it to be translational, the bias on the sex. So what we show is that sex actually do matter when you talk about uh, when you want to do metabolic research. So the table, the figure you see, it's basically categorized. These are male mice that have been fed on high fat diet and they develop diet induced obesity significantly more than the females that are on high fat diet. And this also reflects in the adipose tissue mass. So this is actually from the inguinal subcutaneous adipose tissue where you see the male on high fat diet actually develops significantly more adipose tissue than the female on high fat diet. So this was also corresponding to other uh, adipose tissue depot. And again, what we see when it comes to your inflammatory profile is that when you see on the left is actually interleukin-6, which is known to be highly uh, expressed in obese individual. But what this picture actually showed is that the baseline of interleukin-6 is higher in male than female. And during early period of uh, obesity development, it's actually significant for female than male, same as also you see in interleukin-10. So basically what this tells us is that the inflammatory profile in terms of obesity development, it's not the same for male and female. And in this case, uh, interleukin-6, which is known as a pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine marker, can also function as an anti-inflammatory cytokine marker by uh, regulating interleukin-10, which we see in this case for female mice only. And this may also contribute to their lower weight gain and a lower infl inflammatory profile. And again, so we decided to investigate our novel marker, which we identified using our transcriptome analysis. And we go with the solute carrier family seven. So when you knock out this marker, in mice, we see that they develop significantly less weight than the wild type mice, which are also on high fat diet. But there was no difference between the knockout mice and the control mice on normal diet. And this was actually corresponded with an increase in type mice that were significantly reduced in the mice that we have this gene knocked out and then both in the subcutaneous, perigonadal, mesenteric, brown, and even in the liver. And we could see that the picture on the left shows the wild type mice, and the picture in the middle shows the wild type, which is on high fat diet, that you see lipid accumulation in the liver, liver stetosis, uh, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease that can lead to insulin resistance, and also the development of type 2 diabetes, which is actually a comorbidity that's associated with uh, obesity. But if you knock out this gene, which you see on the far left, you see that this condition of lipid accumulation in the liver is significantly reduced. So we did not only observe this with the liver, but with also multiple organs. So what we're trying to say here is that by deleting this novel gene, which we've identified significantly attenuate adipocyte hypertrophy and also decrease lipid accumulation in many organs, and this may help mitigate the impact of diet in obesity. 
So that brings us to the next part of our discussion, which is on HIV and hematopoiesis. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to give a very broad overview of our research focus, um, namely HIV and hematopoiesis. Um, and the aim, so the, the aim of this investigation is to, to understand better how HIV impact on the broader hemopoietic system, because we often observe, and one of the most common hematological or common abnormalities of complications associated with, with HIV is also hematological abnormalities. As you can see from the Venn diagram here, which is like a pilot study, which, which was done in collaboration with Dr. Uh, with Prof. Teresa Rousseau, um, which shows the various cytopenias observed in a cohort of 117 treatment naive HIV positive patients. Next slide, please, Melvin. So we don't actually know what the mechanisms are um, of that of the HIV associated, the mechanisms associated with HIV associated cytopenias. And both direct and indirect mechanisms have been um, implicated. The direct mechanism, mechanism suggests that HCs or hemopoietic stem cells can be directly infected with um, HIV. Hemopoietic stem cells are, gives rise to all the blood cells. Um, all, all the blood cell lineages and resides in the bone marrow. It's a very heterogeneous population. Um, it consists of true early hemopoietic stem cells and uh, multiple of progenitor cells. And it's not clear which of these cells are prone to HIV infection, if they are indeed. Um, and, and I need to mention that my, this research is um, mainly based, or this finding of hypothesis is mainly based on in vitro research, so more ex vivo or in vivo research is necessary to prove or disprove this hypothesis. There's also the indirect mechanisms which um, suggest that it's not due to direct infection of the hemopoietic stem cells, but due to the dysregulation of the cytokine milieu or cytokine signaling pathways in the bone marrow niche. Um, that results in impaired hemopoiesis or impaired hemopoietic stem cell function. Now, why do we want to do this research? Um, we hope to, bro if we broaden our research to the broader hemopoietic system and not only fo focus on the immune system, that we will identify new treatment targets and or disease management st strategies, and we also want to improve our understanding of the impact of HIV exposure on hemopoietic stem cells. And this is especially important if we want to optimize our gene therapy approaches or develop new gene therapy approaches. And if we want to understand if umbilical cord blood derived hemopoietic stem cells of infants that were born from HIV positive mothers, which are well controlled, can be used in hemopoietic stem cell transplants. We have currently, we have four projects. Um, the, Dr. Candice Hendricks, a PhD student, is investigating or characterizing the umbilical cord blood derived hemopoietic stem cells um, using both molecular and cellular approaches. Candice Hurt, which is also a PhD student in the group, are looking into transduction or approaches to transduce primary hemopoietic stem cells. And we'll also investigate if these transductions will have an impact on the function of the hemopoietic stem cells. So now I'm watching Gay say as uh, an MSc student in the group, and she or she's investigating the methodological profile of a treatment naive HIV positive cohort, and she's focusing primarily on immature circulating cells in this cohort, and obviously we'll have control group there. And then Priyan Mystery, um, also an MSc student, will investigate the direct infection of ex vivo bone marrow derived and peripheral blood derived hemopathic stem cells. All of these projects are in the emphasis stage, so we don't have really a lot of data to show at the moment. We are to show very exciting data in the near future. 
But this research cannot be done in isolation. And I want to thank our collaborators. We collaborated currently with um, the Falker Makato Health Sciences University, um, also with Kalisha at Dr. George Bukhari Academic Hospital, and with the NHLS laboratories, both at DGMIH and at, um, yeah, at Swan Academic Division. And then we also hope to, in the near future, uh, in the near future, um, collaborate with the Department of Orthopedics at Steve Speaker Hospital. Just a brief overview of data currently obtained is that our data would suggest or confirm that HIV negatively impact on hemopoietic stem cells as we detect a significantly less proportion of circulating hemopoietic stem cells in the blood of the HIV positive treatment treatment naive patients compared to the control group. And our data also want to suggest that the HIV exposure impact on the next slide, please, Melvin, um, impact on the function of the immobilitive stem cells displayed in this histogram where we, when we see it and we saw it, we isolate pure um, immobilitive stem cells and put 100%, 100 cells in a well, and we can see they don't differentiate as well as the hemopoietic stem cells isolated or sorted from a control group. It's very clear um, from, from our very preliminary um, findings that we will need to make use of high dimensional data in the future. And, and this will be created or generated using single cell gene expression um, approaches as well as multicolor flow cytometry approaches as that will more accurately and more clearly demonstrate or show up the differences between um, the HIV, between the two cohorts, the HIV positive cohort versus the HIV negative um, patients. As you can see from traditionally, we will show two-dimensional data and flow cytometry as shown on the left hand side, while the blue and the red on the right hand side are high dimensional display of flow cytometry data using only about eight markers, but already clearly demonstrate and clearly visualize the differences between the HIV positive and the HIV negative group. And then I just want to end off by thank our sponsors. Our current projects are sponsored by the MRC, by the NRF and by the PRE. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that fascinating overview of the ICMM. You probably don't have, you probably need several hours for this, but we, uh, we're we short of time. Without further ado, we'll go to the next uh, presentation, which is a video from Semley, the Sport, Exercise, Medicine and Lifestyle Institute. And I think it's going to be run by Dr. Borison, Jill Borison. And if you have any questions, please. Assembly exists with the main purpose of providing the scientific and medical background to providing exercise in a safe way to all people. interventions to reduce the global burden of non-chemical diseases. However, the delivery has time and resource constraints. Social media networks such as Facebook have widened access to workplace health interventions, but their research is limited. Hence, we study the financial sector with three aims. Determining the prevalence of lifestyle risk factors, determining if a repeat annual health risk assessment with interventions improve lifestyle risk factors. Developing and determining the effectiveness of a social media-based lifestyle intervention. Our study results found a high prevalence of lifestyle risk factors among financial sector employees. Repeat annual health risk assessments did not significantly reduce most lifestyle risk factors, but only improved hypercholesteremia. This highlights the need to find novel interventions to improve lifestyle risk factors. 
by implementing a 12-month social media-based lifestyle intervention with online support of a dietitian and a biokineticist, numerous risk factors were improved. Given the barriers associated with face-to-face -face workplace health interventions, a social media-based lifestyle intervention may be successfully implemented to improve certain lifestyle risk factors. Hello, my name is Dr. Bert Sely and I'm a Belgian senior researcher at Assembly and I'll try to explain you a bit more about our health health study. As you can see, there are a lot of collaborations for this project across the faculty. Now, uh, the background of this project is the fact that it has been described in literature that the health behavior of healthcare professionals is actually crucial in their referral and counseling practices and determines the health behavior as well of their patients. Such has been shown that medical doctors that have a proper diet and are physically active will prescribe more of these programs to their patients. And it is thus crucial to ask how healthy the lifestyle is of future healthcare professionals here at UP. Now, whether they have risk factors or not uh, to develop further NCD. Now, the behavioral risk factors uh, have been inquired via online questionnaires while the metabolic risk factors were assessed at one live moment in 2019. Now, the first results of this study showed that uh, low physical activity and low to moderate diet quali quality was uh, prevalent or most prevalent among first year medical students as a behavioral risk factor. Uh, more than 60% had low physical activity levels self-reported or had a low to moderate diet quality. For metabolic risk factors, it became clear that uh, hypertension and overweight or obesity in particular were a problem in this cohort with a significant difference between males and females, as you can see, for hypertension stage 1 and 2. Uh, in line of the self-reported physical inactivity, it became clear that especially cardiorespiratory fitness was quite low in this cohort of first-year medical students. Good morning everyone, I'm Dr. Mikusu from Sembu. The study I'm presenting is titled Symptoms Associated with Prolonged Return to Play in Symptomatic Athletes with Acute Respiratory Illness, Including COVID-19, a cross-sectional study, AWARE Study 1. The methodologies employed were using a survey using REDCAP. Athletes were over 18 years. They all had a previous diagnosis of an acute respiratory illness, including COVID-19, within six months prior. The athletes were asked to report the symptom type, duration, severity, as well as their days to return to play. Results, 78 athletes were included in the return to play data, and the median return to play was 20 days. There were eight symptoms associated with the decreased chance of return to play. As you can see, they varied in magnitude, with excessive fatigue having the largest effect on prolonged return to play. In conclusion, the average return to play was 20 days for all athletes, and sport and exercise medicine physicians need to consider both the 20-day average return to play as well as the symptom cluster when assessing a patient, as this could determine how long it would take a patient to return to play. A larger sample is needed to further investigate the effects of COVID-19 specifically on athletes and their return to play. Hello, I'm Kelly Muller, presenting a paper titled The Effects of Acute Respiratory Illness on Exercise and Sports Performance Outcomes in Athletes. This is a systematic review by a subgroup of the International Olympic Committee Consensus Group on this topic. So it's a collaborative paper between SEMLI as well as international colleagues. Acute respiratory infections are common in athletes, but their effects on exercise and sports performance remain unclear. So this systematic review aimed to determine what the effects on performance are. Short-term effects included acute decrements in sports performance outcomes and pulmonary function, but no effect on cardiorespiratory endurance. And more long-term effects included a decrease in training mileage and training load, as well as a decrease in sports performance dependent points. The severity of an acute respiratory infection may affect the extent to which performance is affected. There was significant methodological heterogeneity between studies. However, there is a trend towards impairment in acute and longer term exercise and sports performance outcomes after an acute respiratory infection in athletes. 
I'm Karelet Snyder, a sports physician at Semli, and we conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis on acute respiratory illness and return turn to sport in athletes. Three databases were searched for articles published in English on athletes or military recruits with either symptoms or a diagnosis of an acute respiratory illness, reporting on either the days until the return to, turn to sport after this illness the frequency of those acute respiratory illnesses resulting in time loss of more than one day or full symptom duration of the acute respiratory illness. More than 31,000 athletes were included in the combined studies. The main findings of our study were that approximately 20% of acute respiratory illnesses resulted in time loss of more than one day and the mean duration of symptoms was seven days. These outcomes were not influenced by either the pathological or anatomical classifications of acute respiratory illnesses or by the various methods of diagnosis. COVID-19 pandemic commenced mainly outside the time framework of our study and thus not included in the findings. We do, re do recognize the major role it can play though in the respiratory health of athletes. We therefore suggest future studies to obtain detailed clinical, laboratory and pathogen specific data on acute respiratory infections included COVID-19 in order to customize return to sport guidelines for our athletes. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, video from Assembly. We now go on to the next uh, presentation from COPC, that's the Community Oriented Primary Care Research Unit, and it's Dr. Michelle Janssen van Rensburg. Dr. Janssen van Rensburg. Thank you so much. Good day. Thank you for this opportunity to present about the development of the COSAP client functioning tool. My name is Michelle Janssen van Rensburg and I'm a senior researcher at the Community Oriented Primary Care Research Unit. I would also like to mention my co-author, Dalian Kastelein, who has assisted with the validation of the tool. COSOP is the Community Oriented Substance Use Program, a partnership between the City of Twani and the University of Pretoria COPC Research Unit and other stakeholders. COSOP is built on a harm reduction philosophy, which aims to reduce harm related to substance use, particularly the heroin-based drug called Neope. COSUP services include opioid substitution therapy, needle and syringe exchange, um, counseling, skills development, and group therapy. There are currently 17 community-based COSUP sites across Twani, and each site's team is made up of a clinical associate, social worker, peer educator, community health worker, and data capturer, with a family physician doing weekly site visits. Some sites include psychology interns and community engagement activities by undergraduate occupational therapy students and JCP students from the EBIT faculty. While much research occurs about substance use in Swanee and about COSAP and its services, the city of Swanee requested information regarding the quality of life of COSAP clients. Quality of life measures do exist, but they are not necessarily contextually relevant nor specific to substance users. After consulting various experts and the COSAP team members, we decided to develop a questionnaire based on the World Health Organization's International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health as a tool to monitor the well-being and functioning of COSAP clients. It is a codable measure and thus useful to determine clients' improvement in functioning over time. The ICF considers the whole person existing and functioning within a complex context. Functioning is an umbrella term for body functions, body structures, activities and participation. And it is the interaction between an individual and that individual's context, which includes environmental and personal factors that is of interest. 
Thus, apart from the biomedical psychosocial considerations of substance use, this person-centered framework combines these and an understanding of which can ultimately um, improve care that is responsive to clients' needs. A pilot questionnaire was compiled and tested at one COSAP site, and the first version of the tool was rolled out at the end of 2019 at all the COSAP sites. The questionnaire included demographic information, structured questions regarding clients' perceptions about their recent well-being and functioning, and open-ended questions pertaining to COSAP services. 128 responses were received from 11 sites. Descriptive analysis was done of the demographics and structured aspects, and thematic analysis was conducted for the open-ended information. Most respondents stated that they did not have enough money to meet their needs and that they often worry about money. The lack of opportunities for leisure was a concern and where they cope best was in their ability to carry out their daily activities. Structured questions, question responses were averaged and showed that in general, the sample's well-being ranged between adequate to poor well-being. Some of the positive results that the them thematic analysis of the open-ended responses revealed were that COSAP has helped service users to reduce or even stop the use of drugs. Respondents experienced a general improvement in their lives, a sense of hope, um, and improvement in relationships with family and the community. For some, the benefits of no longer being homeless was important. These positive changes resulted in being able to achieve certain goals, as well as look for and find work. The second version of the tool was rolled out at all COSAP sites in mid-2020. 23 structured questionnaires about well-being or functioning again with a Likert scale of about five options, was implemented. 280 responses were received from 11 sites, of which 266 could be analysed. The second round results showed that there was an overall decline in wellbeing, which was most likely due to the fact that the second round was conducted during levels five and four of the COVID-19 national lockdown. The high score was again not having enough money to meet needs, but the average score was higher than in round one, which means that poor wellbeing in this regard had increased. Other factors that impeded well-being with a lack of opportunity for leisure, an inadequate sense of quality of life and not feeling safe. Positive factors influencing functioning with the ability to carry out daily activities and the contribution of COSAP in clients' lives. In order to determine the validity and accuracy of the tool, the RASH measurement model was applied. The model has a set of requirements that a measuring tool should comply to before it can be claimed to be accurate and a number of tests are done to determine the accuracy and validity of the tool. Round two data were captured and analyzed to see how accurately the questionnaire tests functioning and well-being in the population of 20-based COSAP clients who were 18 years or older. The first rush analysis indicated that there was a significant overall difference between the COSAP questionnaire results and the rush model requirements, which was concerning. One of the problems identified was that the score categories of the questionnaire did not work well. On this graph, you can see that only four questions worked well with five categories. The colors on this graph aren't important here, and all the items with two asterisks shows that the five categories in the scale were too many and needed fixing. After collapsing unnecessary categories and combining categories in the questions that did not work well, the scoring structure became acceptable. Again, don't worry about the colors, but this graph shows how many categories worked for each question. For example, the questions about physical pain and sleep only needed two categories, a yes or a no. The question about quality of life kept five categories. Handling stress worked better with four categories, while opportunities to acquire new skills now had three categories. This means that the option selected is more likely to answer the question. Other problems with the questionnaire were identified, such as redundant or overlapping questions, which were rectified. After fixing the categories, the person item distribution shows that the questions fit the sample reasonably well. The red bars show the particip participants' distribution of scores and the blue bars at the bottom show which categories of the scales were used. This gives support um, that the questionnaire has reasonable accuracy for the specific population being investigated. There were other subtests to run, but since changes were made, we were first required to collect new data with the changes and then run the threshold maps, item fit correlations, and person item distribution again. The third rollout has been completed and data has been inputted on Qualtrics. Um, the rush analysis is currently being performed and in addition, tests for other properties such as unidimensionality and differential item functioning will be done. Associations between opioid substitution therapy and the accessibility, frequency and quality of other COSAP services and clients' well-being and functioning were added to the third version of the tool and these will also be tested for accuracy. 
The COSAP client function in question tool has provided a picture of the circumstances in which COSAP clients function, how they function in their day-to-day -day lives, what their concerns are, and how things have changed for them since joining COSAP. While the finalization of the COSAP client functioning tool is still in process, I have, and I have only reported on aspects thereof, I would like to emphasize that the process of determining accuracy and validity is crucial for tools used in community settings with marginalized communities. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. So from COPSI, we move to um, the UP Research Center for Maternal, Fetal, Newborn and Child Healthcare Strategies. Uh, might be difficult to put into an acronym, I can see. Our presenters are Dr. Valerie Fanafel, uh, Sakane Shlongwan and Helen Mulal. Uh, over to you. Good day. We are from the University of Pretoria's Research Centre for Maternal, Fetal, Newborn and Child Healthcare Strategies. Today we are presenting some of the important research we are doing at the centre regarding Ambiflow studies. So firstly, two million babies are, are still born every year around the world. The majority of these, 98%, occurs in low and middle income countries. Unfortunately, the number of unexplained stillbirths remains very high, the stillbirths for whom we don't have an explanation. The majority of the mothers of these stillborn babies are considered to be healthy. Now, from literature, we know that of these unexplained stillbirths, up to half could be due to undiagnosed fetal growth restriction, or FGR. FGR has been defined as a fetus that does not reach its genetic growth potential. Now, what is Ambiflow? Ambiflow is a continuous wave Doppler ultrasound device. It is low cost, it is portable, and it is connected to a laptop or tablet or even to a smartphone. All healthcare workers, including nurses, doctors, midwives, can be trained on its use. On these pictures in the left upper corner, you see a midwife operating the Ambiflow device on the mother's pregnant tummy. You see a laptop that shows on the left bottom picture, you see a laptop that shows a wave pattern. This is the waveform of the umbilical artery and that shows us how much blood is actually flow, flowing <clears throat> excuse me, from the placenta to the baby. So basically reflect, reflecting how much nutrition and oxygen the baby is getting. On the right, in the right bottom corner, you see a graph that plots the results and the values. We look at the RI or the resistance index of these umbilical artery waveforms. A green result is a good result. A yellow or red result is a result above the 75th centile for that baby's gestational age, would be flagged as abnormal and this mother is referred to obstetricians for further care. One of the first big studies that was done on the use of Ambiflow is the South African Ambi-9 study. In this study, low-risk, healthy pregnant women underwent a single Doppler screening between 28 and 34 weeks gestation. If they had abnormal results, they were referred to the hospital and their pregnancy outcomes were collected. This study also had a control group, so a group of pregnant women who did not undergo such Ambiflow screening and their pregnancy outcomes were compared. The study was done in nine sites, hence the name Ambi-9, in eight provinces in South Africa and had more than 7,000 women recruited. What we found is that 13% of women had an abnormal Doppler result and 1.2% of women had what we call AEDF or absent end diastolic flow, which reflects end-stage placental disease and an extremely high risk of stillbirth. What is striking is that this prevalence of abnormal Doppler is 10 times higher than what has previously been reported in high-income countries. When we compared this group of screened mothers to the group of women who, who did not undergo Ambiflow screening, they found a 47% reduction in stillbirths. Coming to the Ambi International study, this was a WHO-sponsored prevalence study of looking at abnormal Doppler in five low- and middle-income countries, including India, Ghana, Kenya, Rwanda, and South Africa. In this study, the pregnancy and birth outcomes were also collected, but there was no um, control group of women who were not screened. 
The study also included over 7,000 women and found the prevalence of nearly 7% of abnormal Doppler with a lower prevalence of end-stage placental disease. <clears throat> However, what the Amiflo International study showed was a detection of fetal growth restriction. When we plotted all the birth weights of these babies according to their birth weight centiles, we found that the group of babies with abnormal Dopplers had significantly lower birth weights across all birth weight centiles when compared to the babies um, with normal Dopplers. This graph shows us that, that Ambiflow actually has the potential to detect this truly growth restricted baby. What you see, this is a birth weight centile graph or an estimated fetal weight centile graph. The purple line with the black dots shows a baby that is growing on the 10th percentile. This would be picked up by conventional imaging ultrasound um, as a growth restricted baby. However, this baby keep, keeps growing on the same percentile and is actually healthy. This is a constitutionally small fetus that just has a smaller genetic growth potential. This baby is healthy. However, the baby in the green dots is a truly growth restricted babies, a baby, a baby that was genetically destined to be on a bigger, um, to have a bigger birth weight, but dropping percentiles as it grows um, in, in utero and as the pregnancy progresses. But this baby would not be flagged by conventional ultrasound as growth restricted, but would be picked up by Doppler as we are looking at the placental function. A follow up from the AMBI International study is the AMBI baby study where 91 mother infant pairs were recruited and they were followed up at eight time points over two years. In these babies we compared their growth and their body composition between the babies that had a normal Doppler in, in pregnancy and those who had an abnormal Doppler in pregnancy. These are some of the results from the Umbi baby study, which have recently been published. And the, this was for term infants. And here you can see that the infants with an abnormal Doppler had a lower fat-free mass than those who had the normal Doppler. And just to um, emphasize that most of these abnormal Doppler babies were not small at birth. So referring back to the the graph in the previous slide where we saw those infants that had an abnormal Doppler may cross those birth centiles but may not be picked up as small at birth. So in conclusion, the Umbiflow screening reduces stillbirths and detects fetal growth restriction. Some implications for further research are in implementation research, exploring the barriers to implementation of the Umbiflow device, research into the etiology, in other words, what is causing these abnormal Dopplers, and research into nutritional care antenatally and postnatally to prevent and, and or treat the growth restriction. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation. And so we go to the final, possibly the hottest part of the um, the presentations because we're going to get a bit radioactive and um, we move to nuclear medicine the nuclear medicine uh, research infrastructure they've also got a very catchy acronym as well numeri and so uh, i'd like uh, it's going to be presented by professor mike uh, satehe uh, prof satehe over to you Thank you so kindly, uh, Prof. Tahi, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, it, it's important that the uh, UP has to see what uh, nuclear medicine research infrastructure can offer to them. Th this is uh, a national entity that is actually uh, set out as part and parcel of the South African Research Roadmap by the Department of Science and Innovation. The idea there is that all various sectors that has to try and make sure that there is skilling, there is workforce that is uh, going to change our uh, our input is done. So we specifically, in Numerai, we're looking at the drug development and clinical researches that are there that can happen. This uh, entity, especially at UP, it will have two cyclotrons, a GMP lab and various uh, imaging modalities and a preclinical facility. It will therefore provide us with the, the means of really uh, making sure that innovation is not from outside, but from within South Africa. 
Of course, uh, uh, just to give the background as well, is that uh, this is actually governed by University of Pretoria, Steve Biko Academic Hospital. It is also governed by the DSI itself and the NEXA. So we have the fortune of having won the 300 million out of the 450 that is allocated to Numara. The other sectors are out of uh, this entity. So specifically for nuclear medicine, what we intend to do here is that we want to look at um, how can we change regulations that are really difficult for research to happen? How can we ensure that uh, we do make radiopharmaceutical to be accessible? How can we make sure that we train people that can actually work across the globe, but work with other disciplines as well. We also have to really try and influence the reinvestment that is going to be there. So this advocacy is important, and hence this faculty day, by virtue of giving us this opportunity, it can lend us itself to that. So how can we do this? This uh, national entity will be divided uh, into five smaller sections, which is the preclinical imaging facility, the basic and trans translational uh, research, which is the BTR, and then the imaging facility, which is the one that is for human use. And then, of course, uh, the node for infection, which is down in the Cape, and uh, the lab, which we can actually sell and, and actually uh, get the world-class uh, products. This will focus on what is important, and that's going to change the, the landscape, specifically in targeted radionuclide therapy and the targeted radionuclide uh, imaging probes and with infection as an emphasis, and I'll show the examples thereof. And then of course, uh, we also have to therefore change the curriculum of how we work by virtue of doing this. For example, the BTR does look at COVID-related research, but it will look at in vitro and in vivo imaging that can come from, say, chemistry, from other engineers that we as at Numara can therefore turn into probes that we can then image and they will therefore be targeted. This is an example of such working with us on prostate cancer. So it, 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 it takes the entire cascade of what we are doing. So the preclinical imaging that I spoke about is already in existence, but it's at the moment hovered at NEXA. It, it has got all this equipment that I'm showing here, the hotel for the animal, various small uh, images that we, uh, uh, imaging equipment that we can utilize, including autoradiography. And we do have uh, the BCL uh, tray lab that is important, and I'm sure it will be in need for some of the uh, researchers that are at UP. So all of this, it, it, it's essential for us to actually utilize. So by virtue of having that uh, preclinical facility, we do uh, focus on several probes that we can do. We can also take, uh, say, the industry wants us to do some other research. We can actually undertake that, and then we can do it. But for, at the moment, we're focusing on uh, neuroimaging, oncology, and infection. And there are various isotopes that one will go in, not, not go into the technical part of it, but we tell the researchers at UP that there are avenues that we can speak about, especially if colleagues can identify some other probes that we can speak to, then we can actually take it to, 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 to be a reality. We obviously want to change the, uh, uh, we, we have to influence the socioeconomic scale of, of the country. And this is an example of such that, of course, we have various projects. This preclinical facility has got already 26 projects ongoing. The clinical facility has got several papers that are really coming out. Several awards are coming out of this uh, facility. And then, of course, the, 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 our uh, uh, other satellite in Cape Town is also looking at various interesting uh, TB images. Of course, at the Steve Beacon itself, we have installed a very excellent uh, PET CT camera, the state of the art, arguably the best in the continent, and very, very sensitive. And we can utilize it uh, very well to actually look at various uh, possibilities. But then showing some of the examples. Before I do that, I mean, one has to actually uh, uh, speak to the researchers and make the reality that, in fact, that we do have lots of failures and challenges. For instance, uh, the building that is supposed to be for Numera, it's a three-story building consisting of the first, second, and third preclinical GMP and the clinical, but it's a bit delayed because of the rezoning. The Steve Biko Academic Hospital is zoned as a residential and not as a hospital. So we are caught up in that and really it's delaying us, but we are about to resolve that. And But although the building has started slowly. And then of course we have several uh, uh, projects that have failed and it's important to know that as we do that, this research has some projects fail, but we learn from that and we make the, the, the next projects uh, a bit better. We do have a problem of, of course, uh, uh, the costs that are really exorbitant 
exorbitant, but we are trying to get that. And in having those costs exorbitant, we try to get some other awards. And, and, and it's important, again, to encourage researchers that we fail dismally in some of them. And, and, and that is a part of it. So it's not unusual. We have several letters of failures, and that is happening. And then, of course, uh, uh, the rejections of the manuscript, it's also happening uh, clearly. I mean, but uh, um, uh, of course, uh, those get to be uh, improved for the other journals and sometimes even better. Some of the examples then is that, as you know, nuclear medicine, it's, 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 it's supposed to be imaging from head to toe, various organs, several organs, looking at the function and physiology thereof. And in so doing, we can actually, as I have said, look at the targets that will actually go to specific organs and diseases, and in some instances, even convert by replacing the imaging isotope by the by, by the targeted uh, treatment isotope and even treat. And these are examples of such, as you can see, the imaging, the targeting that is there, and then the red molecules or the red colored uh, isotopes are for therapy, but they would have been preceded by the imaging one, which are in black, for instance. Of course, to do that, uh, some of the examples that one want to show is that we have influenced a lot of what happens in tuberculosis in the country, and we are going and, and we are continuing to do so. We're looking at pathogen-specific molecules, microenvironment molecules, for instance, to see how the TB can be influenced and other infections as well. To this effect, showing an example with tuberculosis, we can see that we are able to look at those that can respond early and those that can respond late, and this will help to actually go into the drug development that is there for tuberculosis, which have not changed for a number of years. And also, as you know, TB is heterogeneous to actually really study it and know what is happening. This is an ideal uh, uh, facility to do so. An example of some of our uh, probes that have uh, actually been produced in South Africa and in our facilities that of uh, technetium UBI. We could see it's an infection-specific tracer, but it also can go to tuberculosis, and it's actually doing well. Of course, unfortunately, um, uh, sometimes the lesion to background is not always uh, what we want it to be. It's an example of what, again, we can do in TB, for instance, if people have got problems of determining what is fibrotic and non-fibrotic, we can look at it with a simple gallium uh, citrate, which is there in the department, and it's working, and these are some of the projects. And then in the head, of course, if we have tuberculomas, the conventional PET-CT tracer, which is F FDG might not be able to actually utilize and see, and see that uh, that is happening. This is very novel. Of course, it's one of the PhDs that is happening looking at tuberculosis and hypoxia. As you know that if it's hypoxic, it's going to be much more resistant and you might have issues with that. And we are actually making grounds and there's good work that is going to be published soon in uh, this space. Another uh, novel, uh, novelty is that of trying to look at the M2 macrophages with tuberculosis. That will speak to, again, how aggressive the lesions are. It's a very difficult tracer to work with, but again, as one has said, these are some of the other things that we are speaking about, and they are coming, and they are going to yield excellent results. One, one of the other things we have in South Africa is that cervical cancer is still a problem, unlike with the other countries outside of uh, Africa. And of course, one of the other things that is important is to know who's, a, who's a hypoxic there and, and, and who's not, and who's where best uh, situated to actually do that research. We are doing that. It's one of our good PhDs that is oncoming, and the results thereof will probably and maybe they will influence how uh, a guy in oncology is run in terms of cervical cancer. Um, we have seen that HIV still continues to be a problem, and we know that the inflammation of the arteries is an issue. So we, we have done work that have shown that we can have a molecule that is actually initially destined for cancer imaging, CXCR4, but we can actually see that it's actually very well checked in HIV patients and it can show the inflammation. Therefore, you can prognosticate what is happening and take uh, 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 those, those patients as well. That was a PhD that has already gone and happened. And we, we also are now also looking into some of uh, um, the prospective work also at the master's level, uh, trying to see how can we influence cardiac imaging uh, that can uh, uh, be uh, mapped up to uh, this regulation of cal calcium homeost homeostasis, which is an important thing to demonstrate that whilst we are looking at uh, uh, some work at, at master's level, we also can actually have work that is actually happening and that is a, a new and, and, and novel. So one of the important things, as I have said, is therapy. In that space, we have seen that uh, we have actually made an impact. For instance, the conventional way of looking at bone imaging or CT imaging for prostate cancer, it's something that seriously um, um, 
underestimates the state of the staging of the patient, as we can see with this patient with image A showing almost near no disease, but when you actually image him properly with another a tracer called PSMA, you can see how extensive that disease is, and that is really happening and changing management in a, a, almost half of the patient that gets referred. Breast imaging remains something that is important, but we are, of course, looking at the biology thereof and trying to look at newer targets. And there's work that we are doing with fibroblast activating protein to try and, again, look at improving into what we have done before to look at how can we actually look at the microenvironment that can influence the management of breast cancers as well. And then of what we are saying is that there are windows of opportunities in terms of diagnostics, meaning that to see it and to treat it as well. And of course, we are looking at novel uh, imaging therapies, but also the, the, the targeted therapies. And clearly, that will be patient-specific. They will improve the outcome. And that is uh, something that uh, we want uh, people to work with us. An example of, the, of such is that we have actually had a, a first concept globally of how to utilize bismuth PSMA into treating prostate cancer. Of course, there are logistic and difficulties with it, but we have since modified and went on and actually treated with other different isotopes. And this is an example of such that demonstrate the images on top. It's three separate images, but if you look at the bottom, it's really excellent to show the pre and post therapy that is there. And these are something that cannot be easily achievable with uh, the conventional chemotherapies. As we know, chemo is excellent. It works well in other cancers, but in prostate, there isn't much ground that is won. And, and this is the space that the research and the, the work that we are doing, it's, it's going to actually try and, in, 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 and be the mainstream of what is happening. This is also happening globally, but we are looking looking at how to dose things and how to use different isotopes and optimize this prostate cancer therapy. Second last slide, Chair, is that again, whilst doing that, you also, as South Africa, have to take care of people that are sitting in the sun and, and enjoying themselves. They can happen to have uh, basal uh, cell cancers, and we can treat with a non-invasive uh, modality, and that is going to work well, as you can see, painless. You just sit for an hour, and then we paint you, and then we don't even touch the skin and boom, the, the legends are gone. So you can see the two examples of such. This is really excellent. But similarly, uh, uh, in, in patients that have got keloids, as we know, keloids, they keep coming back when you treat them. We can try and break the cycle with a, a radioisotope, and that's something, again, that's great. And I think at the moment, nobody has got the methodologies of how to do it using targeted and nuclear therapies, and we are looking at that, and that's something exciting. And then, of course, Chair, to, to end, and we are saying that Numerai, uh, it, it's an opportunity that is there, but uh, clearly we have ample op opportunities, as, as I have seen with the five sectors that we are there, we can and, and we will make the things to be affordable, uh, available, appropriate, and accessible. And then of course, the reason why I'm uh, representing my group, the whole group, it's a, a spectrum of various universities that we work with, including some industry and various heads of some sections that are there, and one will not uh, try to name uh, uh, one of them because there are various people that we work with. And, and of course, I would invite you to, to visit our, our website of Numerai and, 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 and the department at, at UP. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation, uh, Professor Tehne. Uh, and we've actually done very well for time. We've come for the, to the end of the session. I'm sure if you have any burning questions, uh, we can, you can contact uh, the various speakers. And so with that, uh, I'd like to end the session and pass over to the next uh, session. Thank you very much, Program Di Director. Over to you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Pillay. To conclude School of Medicine research display, we like to introduce to you Stevie, the robot. As Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Pretoria, I'm thrilled about the arrival of the new ICU robot at Steve Biko Academic Hospital. And what it's going to do is it's going to put into touch the team in, uh, in Germany together with the ICU team in South Africa. This collaboration comes at the right time when we are faced with the pandemic. Uh, this is where um, telemedicine and uh, new technology that can be used to, um, to promote health but also to close 
the existing gap to create more equity in health access. Who would have thought in those early days that we would now have machines that could help people to identify diseases in intensive care. I'm absolutely amazed that the technology has grown to that level. In my experience, it was a, a huge advantage for um, every doctor at every hospital that um, had been part of this telemedical network. We can um, shorten thousands of kilometers and we can talk to each other. I would like to thank our German partners, the staff at Steve Biko Academic Hospital and the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Pretoria for their efforts to get this new technology up and running during a critical period with the COVID pandemic. And that was Stevie, just another reason for us to always choose up because we at the University of Pretoria are just at another level. So on a lighter note, I want you to sit back and relax because I would like to show the talent of some of the health sciences students, their rap video. Thank you.
During the Dean's opening address, he talked about the importance of growing our own timber, that is exposing our students, especially the, the younger, the undergraduate ones to research. And uh, if you remember in the previous research days, we had something called the soapbox, where undergrad students were given an opportunity to showcase their research uh, during the research day. Now, Dr. Astrid Turner has been in the forefront of that project of engaging students in research activities. In the next panel discussion, the TEX Undergraduate Research Forum, uh, Dr. Astrid Turner will be having a discussion with some of the students about some of the research activities. The TEX Undergraduate Research Forum at the Faculty of Health Sciences was created to support and enhance the research experience of undergraduate students who would like more research exposure as an extracurricular activity. TERF is currently supported by the Office of the Deputy Dean, Research and Postgraduate Studies, and an amazing team of academic staff from all four schools and some undergraduate students. Its slogan is connect, expand, innovate. And there are approximately 15 active research projects that undergraduate students are involved in currently. The session will be chaired by Dr. Astrid Turner, who is a public health medicine specialist from the School of Health Systems and Public Health and an academic lead of TERF. I will hand over the reins to Dr. Astrid Turner. Great, so thank you so much for that introduction. So I'm here today, I'm joined um, by two students. So the one is Itumaleng Bhuti. Um, she's a final year medical student. And the other one is Michael Stark, who is a third year BSc student and is the student lead of TERF. Um, and we'll also just be joined virtually by some of the other students who are involved in um, undergraduate research and have been phenomenal. So just to add as well that there's an amazing team behind TERF, so academic representatives from all, the, um, from all four schools as well as students as well. Um, so I think we'll start off with Itu Maling. Um, so Itu Maling, what do you think of the research landscape at UP and health sciences in general? Do you think it's accessible to you as an undergrad student? Um, well, research in the university in total is wonderful. There's a lot of, there's a high uh, research output of high quality. But with specifically in undergraduate research, I don't think it's, a, it's, it's that accessible to an ordinary student. There isn't a lot of visibility. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on clinical and curative medicine and not so much on research. So as it would appeal to a niche, a specific niche of students where students would have to go searching for um, opportunities to get involved in research. So it's not ex exactly accessible to any student. You'd have to go looking specifically for that research, for opportunities such as that. So Itum, um, Itum just to flesh out a bit more, because you were involved in an environmental health project with one of our professors at the School of Health Systems and Public Health. So what drove you to do research as an undergrad, you know, amidst studying for MBCHB? Um, I had some exposure in with research while well, with my IB uh, program, but it was specifically my interest in research. I've always been interested in why specific policies are the way they are or why things are done in a specific way. So that just goes to show that you have to be persistent. Perhaps you need to have a drive, which not every person might have in medical school. So more than just not wanting my brain cells to waste away during COVID, I specifically wanted to be involved in producing research, producing knowledge, producing um, strategies that could help enhance the, the practice of medicine. Right. And then just on to Michael now. So Michael, like I mentioned, you are third year BSc mm -hmm. and the student lead, um, lead of TERF and doing amazing things as well. So at the moment you're working with the Department of Physiology. Mm -hmm. So again, what drove you to do research and to what extent do you think students should be part, undergrad students should be part of the conversation of changing the research landscape at UP? Well, I've started my career in research, obviously in 2019 in my first year, 
And research was always a part of my life. I was always questioning things since I was a little boy. I was always like, why is the sky blue? Why does the sea make waves and things like that? So I always feel like it's a fundamental in terms of research to always ask questions. And ever since I was a little boy, I also always wanted to be a cancer doctor. I wanted to be an oncologist and I wanted to treat cancer and try to create cures and things like that. So I think that's what uh, sparked my research interest is that I believe that I could possibly contribute to that particular oncology field. Um, and in my first year, I came up with my own research project uh, and through TURF, I was able to actually complete it and start it. And that was absolutely amazing. And I thank TURF so much for what they've done for me. Um, and I have two amazing supervisors, Professor Yobe and Dr. Michelle Fasahi, who have really helped me and empowered me to be a better researcher. Um, in terms of the students, I think at, at the end of the day, it really comes down to the students 100%. You need to have a love for research and an interest in research. And I feel like in terms of the students to reimagining research and empowering other students to get involved in research, we really need to try and help each other. And we need to show students that their ideas are relevant and their ideas are important. Because at the end of the day, yes, we don't have qualifications, but we are all powerful beyond measure. And we all can have amazing ideas that can make a world a better place. And I feel like it, we need to really, really, really grasp onto that and help other students and motivate them and show them, for example, like me, I did research, I'm conducting research, even though I'm an undergraduate. And I feel like it's really important that we show undergraduate students that even though I, if I can do it, why can't you? And I feel like when we do do that, we're gonna get a lot more students on board and to actually see that their ideas are relevant and their ideas can make a difference and they can add something to the scientific community. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks so much. Um, I'm not sure if, so Emily, if Emily is online, um, so, Emily, you are involved with an evidence synthesis research project, Scoping Review, that was driven by Prof. Mushamba Thompson. Um, so, to get undergrads involved as screeners, can you perhaps talk a little bit of what you've been doing, but also what more can be done at, um, at UP or the faculty, and the Faculty of Health Sciences to encourage students to do research? I know that was a long question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dr. Zinn, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, apologies, I'm having some issues. Uh, I think the system isn't allowing me to. I'm having some issues turning it on. It was working earlier. Uh, but I can just answer with our camera, um, if that's all right. So I'm involved in a, in a screening view with uh, Kukula Moliloke. And it's been a really amazing experience because I, I started this knowing absolutely nothing about research. And I was just eager to get involved and to learn and to develop skills. And TERF has been absolutely fabulous. And Dr. Turner specifically has been, in, has been an incredible resource to me in doing this. I just reached out to her and said, I know nothing about research, um, but I'd like to get involved. What can I do? And I had quite a few personal meetings with her and through uh, her efforts and the efforts of Michael, got linked up with Kukula and this scoping review. And got trained on what is the reviewing process, what is screening, what is the importance of this, and got to get my foot in the door in the world of research and, and, and develop skills, which I feel a lot more confident now um, trying to enter into my own project and, and stepping um, out with my own initiative. Uh, I, I agree a lot with what's been said so far about the the state of undergraduate research at Tux. Um, TERF is a fantastic resource and it's a fantastic organization, uh, but it is something that you have to quite actively reach out to um, and that students seem to pursue themselves. And I think if there was one thing that I'd like to see going forward in the undergraduate landscape is that research would be something that the majority of students consider, um, not just a minority who seek out this organization and who seek out opportunity. I'd, I'd love to see the opportunities going more to the students. Um, but I'm incredibly grateful to TIFF and I've loved this experience and I can already see the doors that it's opened for me moving forward and the projects that I'm going to be involved on now that this one's ending. Okay, thanks so much, Emily, for that. Um, Benito, um, if you are there as well, you are working at the moment with a peer in the Faculty of Law. Um, and with Prof Cordia as well on, um, on a very specific project. But again, what motivated you to get involved in the project and what do you think, um, what more do you think can, can we do not at TERF? Yeah, perhaps at TERF, yeah, to get undergrads um, doing extracurricular research. 
So um, I initially, I became aware of this project during, um, I was always curious and very much interested in research, but as I, I would also agree with everything that has been said in the sense of um, it's been a process or you have to actively go look and search out uh, the, seek out the opportunities to participate in research. Um, but it is a great opportunity and in any case it adds to your um, to you and your curriculum and all of that, because as clinicians or as future clinicians, we are required to practice evidence-based medicine. And so it is an opportunity to um, acquaint yourself with the research methodology and understand it better. So I would definitely um, advocate or tell students to become involved with it, even as an undergrad, because it does have value. But I became aware of this project um, actually last year during my rotation. So for urology, and we were talking about sexual and gender minority health, and eventually um, I approached some staff members and we just were discussing about um, sexual and gender minority health care in the curriculum and so forth. And there's definitely a need for it to be included. And so my research uh, together with Professor Kudir and uh, my colleague in the Faculty of Health Sciences, Lelandi Niemand, um, she who's also um, busy with completing her undergrad or LLB degree. Um, she, this is sort of, we, we try to take a human rights approach um, to our project as well. And we do intend on discussing it as well. So that was sort of the root of origin uh, for our project. Um, but definitely, I think there's a place in the curriculum for research itself and the methodologies to be more involved. And it's not to say that it isn't, but I think it's definitely it can play a more integral part to the curriculum. I don't know if I've answered or addressed all of your um, questions, Dr. Turner. Yes, um, definitely, Benito. And I think you and maybe other students would also be happy to hear. We are in the process of revising the MBCHB curriculum. So research will be more conceptualized as a thread, you know, also just recognizing mm. um, that there's, um, that we aren't doing, I think, as good a job as what we could be doing, I think, at, for your basic, for your average medical student. Um, then I just wanted to find out from Gabrielle. So Gabrielle is also quite exceptional. So she's not in the Faculty of Health Sciences. She's a publishing student, BIS Publishing but she's involved in a health research project. So supporting us in an online journal that we hope to be, um, that we hope will be out, um, I think early 2022. So Gabrielle is looking at what the impact evaluation of that journal could be. Um, so Gabrielle, for you to come from a, you know, faculty outside of health sciences to get involved in research, um, what do you, what do you think of the research culture at um, UP and the Faculty of Health Sciences? I think that um, the research is like ever evolving and uh, the people who participate in it um, also need to evolve with it. So. At this stage, like reimagining research is important to me because it means that if I'm able to contribute to research at an undergraduate level, then I could do a lot more in my postgraduate studies. Um, and I'm glad that I'm able to actually contribute, even though it's turf is for health sciences students. I'm glad that they are also opening up to, you know, other courses and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Gabrielle. And then um, Kathleen. So Kathleen, you were one of, um, you were, I think when TEDx UP um, started, you were actually one of the, um, the, the panelists or the, the presenters on TEDx UP because of um, a research project that you still did at a soapbox at an earlier faculty of um, health sciences research day. So you also working as a research assistant in the office. So what is your perception of research? What do you think should be changed as well? If do you think it should be changed um, and specifically in your areas of interest? Um, I think how it needs to be changed is 
the example I can give is this morning in my rotation, none of the fourth years knew that today was faculty day. And this is arguably one of the most important days for research at UP. Um, so, you know, the School of Medicine just sort of gives the impression that, you know, research isn't important. You know, we need to do the clinical things first. And then right at the end, if you've got time, then you can maybe do a research thing. Um, we, we also have research incorporated at the moment is um, SMO projects where you basically have to do it sort of like a literature review. Um, but you never have feedback on that. You never have discussions. It doesn't really count credits or contribute your marks. It's just sort of something that's there. So that keeps reinforcing this idea that research is not important for doctors. And I believe that's a very dangerous thing. Is um, something that a lot of people, strange enough, have been asking me is, Kathleen, we see all these artificial intelligence um, programs and these robots being created that can perform surgery and can make diagnoses. Do you think they will be able to replace you as a doctor in the next decade? And quite honestly, I think if we don't teach um, the doctors of tomorrow how to think critically, how to appraise research, how to innovate, then quite frankly, yes, a robot would be able to do our jobs. So I think research needs to be incorporated a lot more radically into the curriculum, not just because you say, oh, every doctor must be a researcher, but because those skills are so needed just for thinking and just for being a good doctor thing. So yes, that's my take. Yes, that's um, thanks, Kathleen, for touching on sort of evidence-based practice and actually why research should be important, you know, in terms of the problem solving and the critical appraisal skills apart from the others as well. Um, I think just to ask Itumaling, so you will be graduating as a medical doctor at the end of this year. What role do you think research should or could also play in your, in your pathway, in your, in your careers? Um, I think if you, are, you have some insight into research, you sort of have those skills of, of how to interpret uh, data, how to read uh, literature reviews, how to read um, actual evidence that's out there. So you're more able to, you, can, you have critical thinking skills, you're more a, you're aware of what's out there. So it improves your, your decisions as a doctor it, it, so that you practice more clinical based education and it's not just consumption of information and then you just regurgitate the information. You're a much more informed doctor I think that that would probably do best for me as a, as a practicing clinician next year. Um, okay, and then Michael, just so with the work that you've done, the research that you've done, you've had an opportunity now to, um, to have a poster presentation at Faculty Day, but also in terms of the collaboration as well within the department. How do you think research has broadened your, um, your networking? You know what I mean, in terms of those collaborations and in terms of your, maybe your interpersonal skills as well? Well, well I would say an awful lot. Um, obviously I've been, just through TERF, I've been exposed to multiple leading scientists in pharmacology, oncology, human physiology, public health, and I can go on. And even from, for example, through Professor Mashamba Thompson, I was exposed and introduced to uh, scientists from Yale University. So through TERF and through my research, I have definitely met and networked with multiple scientists. And in terms of what I've gained through this research, I've so many things. I've, just for example, I do this thing called cell culture, where I grow cells and I test my different types of treatments on these cells. And what's really amazing about just the skills I've learned and the basic laboratory skills that I've learned, I can use them throughout my life, depending if it's biology, microbiology, uh, biotechnology doesn't really matter because now I've got those basic laboratory skills to look after cells, no matter if it's a plant cell, a mammalian cell or a bacteria. I now know the basic knowledge in terms of how to look after these things and how to make sure that my results are accurate and you know reliable. So the skills I've learned are so amazing and I really hope that majority, many students in the university will be exposed to the same things as I was. Perfect. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I think that's all from us. You know, thank you to um, to Itumaling and to Michael as well, and again to the turf team working in the background, um, Prof. Mashamba Thompson's office, and um, and the academics. You know, Prof. Cordia um, and Prof. Sykes as well, and Dr. Fasahi. So thank you so much as well. And if you are interested, we will share more information on the research site as well. Um, so thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Astrid Turner, for all this wonderful work that you are doing with the students. It is so exciting to really hear how enthusiastic our students are and how engaged they are with research activities. And uh, as I indicated before, um, various speakers have spoken, including our dean, about growing our team, but including um, improving our research capacity. And I can gladly say that uh, without fear of uh, contradiction that I think uh, the future of our research, especially in our faculty, is in good hands with these uh, young minds that are really raring to go with their research. Um, I'm going to give a chance now uh, to our Deputy Dean for Research and Postgraduate Studies, uh, Professor Tivani Machamba Thompson, um, and before I give a platform, I think it's only fair that uh, I really commend her and her team for pulling this all together. I mean, this has been an unusual time, uh, to say the least. Um, you know, we didn't have an idea of um, what format and if at all this research day would succeed in the first place. And you can be a judge for yourselves. Um, I am really happy and I'm actually surprised at how smooth this has been. And really congrats uh, Professor Mashamba Thompson for really together with your team putting this all together. And I'd also like to thank my uh, co-presenter, uh, Dr. Mousseline Duplessis uh, for really helping me uh, to steer this ship. Professor Mashamba Thompson, without much ado, I would like to give you the platform to give the closing remarks. steering committee and the production team. Our keynote speaker, Professor Maragalala, for his dedication and quick response to our invitation. Thank you for our, you know, to our program directors, pan panel discussion chairs and panelists uh, for, this in for the insightful discussion that you offered us. A big thank you to our students and staff for attending all our sessions. We also like to thank our stakeholders and our prospective students who joined us today. Um, on behalf of our steering committee for this faculty day, I would like to express our sincere gratitude again to Professor Mike Setehe, who reviewed more than 65 posters to showcase the research work that is done by postgraduate students in the School of Medicine in our faculty. I don't think our panel, um, you know, our, our, our you know, planning committee completely appreciated what a spectacular event we were creating. 
I know that I, I echo everyone's um, you know, sentiment that it's been an inspirational day and we had a motivational uh, you know, discussions and, and topics that were discussed. A warm um, welcome was provided to us in, by, 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 our de by our dean and he provided us an, a context for the, for the day today and the base for reimagining research in our faculty. Insightful keynote address and panel discussions were offered to us. Excellently uh, presented videos and uh, which were showcasing fantastic uh, world-class state-of-the-art research and entities um, and also our own e-health robot, Stevie. We also, have info we also had informative presentations from our postgraduate students, early researchers, early career researchers, emerging and established researchers. They were also showcasing from our four, showcasing research from our four schools. We had outstanding posters from postgraduate students and you know, showcasing their research projects. The sessions today were packed full of insightful you know, guidance on how to reimagine and reposition research in the health sciences. Thank you, Prof. Marakalala, for educating us on TB-related pathological damages and the work that you are doing with your team and in helping to develop the TB treatment. And it's great also to hear that you're collaborating with one of our great research um, you know, entities that is still being developed, the Numeri research entity. So our final, uh, so, so today, um, our first panel discussion reminded us of how we, we need to leverage the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and develop strategies to optimize our global partnership and to strengthen our international profile as a faculty. Other panelists have also highlighted the impact of COVID-19 on our physical and psychological health. Um, you know, this is very, it's a very serious concern and it's, you know, to our state of our non-communicable diseases. They also highlighted the need for us to increase the awareness and the use of telemedicine technology to help improve access to healthcare. The, the need for research transformation, and in this session for research transformation, we're reminded that you know we need to include um, the underrepresented groups in the, in our research, and not only as participants in research, also in the research leadership. They also highlighted the you know the contrasting research pool against the technology push. They highlighted the need to move research the, our research tables to our target population in the community in order for us to transform and collaborate effectively. We also had a great deal of, you know, uh, we had a great deal about innovation and also innovation in teaching and learning, innovation in terms of research and, um, you know, so also the need for collaborative research that so that we can reimagine, um, you know, research not only from one discipline, but from a multidisciplinary um, perspective. Thank you to all um, our interdisciplinary undergraduate research group, TEF, uh, for also emphasizing the, you know, the need for multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary research. We know that our future is safe with you. Um, would like, I, you know, I know that you will all agree with me that you know, um, it, it, it would not be appropriate to conclude today's event, the event that is um, you know, held during a, the, the Women's Month. It won't be appropriate, appropriate for us to close this or conclude this without hearing from our phenomenal women, the, you know, the women that are contributing to research excellence in our faculty. So let's hear from our queens in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Pretoria. Good afternoon. When reimagining research in health systems, I think it's important to explore the potential for change and transformation in health and health systems. We are often challenged by change and disruption, and the COVID pandemic has clearly demonstrated this, both globally and in South Africa. Our research should therefore focus on current challenges 
and solutions facing the health of the people of our country. In terms of maternal health, we need to ensure that our healthcare system is resilient in order to maintain essential services during pandemics. Good afternoon, I'm Professor Mariki Fenter. I'm the head of the Zoonotic Arbor and Respiratory Virus Research Program in the Department of Medical Virology and Center for Viral Zoonosis. So how do I see health sciences or medical research be reimagined in this time? I think that um, the pandemic of the past two years has really uh, emphasizes to us again how important it is to have multidisciplinary teams that consist of both laboratory people, virologists, um, epidemiologists, uh, clinicians, uh, pharmacologists, but also veterinarians and um, ecologists that can work closely together to solve global health problems um, that has both local and international relevance. I think for us to have um, uh, relevance uh, uh, globally, it's also important that we have um, collaborations that goes through um, South Africa and Africa, but also internationally. This is also the best way for us to be able to get funding um, and to have high impact publications that will really make a difference in health. Um, and is relevant globally. Thank you. My name is Umarani Mavis Marauzi. I imagine conducting health research that is based on fundamental principles of Ubuntu, where cohesiveness and solidarity are used to ensure that we conduct transdisciplinary research as a team where different colleagues from different backgrounds and from different faculties are included. We also become inclusive in a way that we will also include traditional health practitioners and the communities that we serve so that they can be part of the core investigators of the type of research that we are doing. Yes, we also need a sense of belonging where we will be able to in incorporate all the lecturers that will be in the healthcare sciences in different research entities that we have in the faculty. Of course, we will need values such as mutual respect, relational, responsibility and reciprocity so that we can be able to hold hands and together we can do more. Thank you. Research is conducted because of a problem that has been identified. In this COVID-19 era, people are confused and looking for answers. They are looking everywhere, including the internet. Social media is used extensively for sharing information, most of which is neither scientific nor verified. As we reimagine health sciences research, let us be reminded of the situations at end that need urgent answers or interventions. Collaborating with members of the community and involving them as active partners in research will help both parties to have deeper understanding of the problems at hand. In so doing, we'll be contributing to the Sustainable Development Goals, goals number three and 17. Remember not to shy away from taking the lead in these collaborations. Thank you. In answer to how health science research should be reimagined, I have the following to say. The Faculty of Health Sciences will need to ensure that all research we undertake today makes a difference tomorrow. There is the need for a more creative impact agenda, one that does not simply translate research to practice, but that transforms practice through research. In order to do so, a space to foster this must be available for both emerging scholars as well as established researchers to participate in projects. Extensive partnerships and collaboration activities will be required to make achievements possible. The COVID-19 crisis has been a precipitating factor an event that has created momentum for change and an opportunity for us to unleash our latent potential. It has indicated the need to become resilient, responsive, connected and equitable. 
The fourth industrial revolution has led to the accelerated implementation and absorption of new technology, which has, among other, been employed in at-distance care and diagnoses. By revisiting pre-existing challenges, discovering new opportunities and applying new technological innovation, health science research can be reimagined. Thank you. So we all on the same track in, the, in this view that the purpose of research and health um, service delivery training are aligned and synergic. Our health problems today are so complex that we need an army of multidisciplinary researchers to work together to collaborate in order to address this. We are now living in a very profitable um, era and that, that this, era, this era, in fact, um, requires that we, we, we transform and uh, that our research spaces um, you know, adjust in, in ways that meet our students and our societal needs. Transformation has to be in, ev in every layer um, of the tools that we use to conduct our research. Yes, transformation is easily said than done. We, we, we will need to continue learning and learning and relearning in order to transform our research spaces and conduct the transformative research that can help us influence the policy and influence positive change in our communities. This also requires us to collaborate with our community members. Now, let us listen to our community-based researchers. This is about rethinking and challenging our existing mindsets on research building on the basics of public health to prevent people from getting sick, working together in multidisciplinary teams, allow us to move beyond discipline-specific confines to create new translational solutions. Engaging citizen scientists built on the collective strength of communities and as information agents, they collect data, help to interpret results and to formulate potential solutions. Furthermore, transdisciplinary research allows students to make their own connections, to understand their own significant roles, and to transfer information to real-world applications. How to interpret findings at the level appropriate for patients, policymakers, and practice are fundamental skills our students should learn in health science research. Thank you. So now in the Faculty of Health Sciences, we're continually optimizing research resources to support our researchers and also to support our research ambitions. We have augmented capacity building to enhance awareness on transformative and emerging research methods and approaches that uh, can help us um, enhance research success for staff and our students. In line with the UP's vision to be the leading research intensive university in Africa, we are putting research in the forefront of what we do. Our faculty offers a safe and inclusive environment for students and staff of diverse backgrounds to develop big ideas, to conduct research that matters and contribute to addressing Africa's health problems. There have, there's been never a better time to join the Faculty of Health Sciences as a donor or as an academic or as a postgraduate student. We are committed to nurturing and producing well-rounded future health care you know, um, practitioners, the health care research leaders who are intellectually aware and can compete in any leading institution locally and internationally. So, how do we stay engaged after this faculty day? This is our first virtual uh, faculty day in, in the Faculty of um, Health Sciences. So, we really want to stay engaged with you. And we want to request that you please fill in the post-faculty day evaluation form, which can be accessed via our Take a Survey link that you can see uh, here.
Your responses will really help us improve future virtual events similar to this. I would like to invite all, the, to, all of you to register and attend our upcoming conference, the Arua 20, 2021 Biannual Conference, which will be, host, will be hosted here at Future Africa. And this also will be virtual, and um, we, we, we hope to, to improve this through your, your, your responses on our survey. This conference will bring together experts from universities and research institutes, government, industry, civil society, international organizations to discuss different steps that Africa, the African economy need to take in order to effectively face the global public health challenges. And last but not least, please um, keep following the COVID-19 protective measures. Most importantly, Ladies and gentlemen, and our students, and everybody who's listening, please look after yourself. Self-care is more important now more than ever. Na kensa. Ebuha. Thank you. And bye, donkey. At the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Health Sciences, we like to focus on potential the potential of our students to make a positive difference to the world around them, the potential to produce research that shifts boundaries, the potential to heal, to relieve, to recover and restore. Discover your potential and join the movement. Follow the University of Pretoria's Faculty of Health Sciences on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube and LinkedIn to be a life changer.